Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Gorelick. I'm chair of the Pacific Council, and I'm pleased to call to order the 268th meeting of the Pacific Fishery Management Council here in lovely Boise, Idaho. This meeting is open to the public and copies of the meeting agenda and other documents used by the council during this meeting are available on the council's website. We encourage members of the public to testify and provide the council with comments on issues before the council at this meeting. Please note that the webinar chat feature should be used for technical issues only and not to make public comment. To comment on an agenda item, you must sign up on our electronic public comment portal available on the September Council meeting webpage. After public comment has begun on an item, no more names will be taken to testify. Each person has one opportunity to testify on each agenda item. Testimony on behalf of another person not in attendance will only be allowed within the period allowed for the person in attendance. Generally, I will limit individual testimony to five minutes for individuals and 10 minutes for groups or individuals representing organizations. We have a visual countdown timer that shows your remaining time allotment. Anyone wishing to include written electronic comments in support of your verbal testimony, please submit them in electronic format to the electronic portal when you sign up for testimony. Written comments must relate directly to your oral testimony to be accepted at this stage. After you speak to the agenda item, the comments will, will be posted and made part of the official record of this meeting. This meeting is being recorded and live streamed over the internet. Copies of the recordings will be available by contacting the Consul Office, or you may purchase audio recording copies from the meeting recorder, Mr. Craig Hess. Let me remind Council members and others to speak directly into your microphones so that all can hear. And of course, be sure to turn the microphone on before you speak. Lastly, I ask that all Council members and members of the audience turn off the sound ringers on their cell phones and mute your connection while the council meeting is in session. At this time, I would like to make some introductions to uh, new folks around the table here. Uh, Ms. Kelly Ames has rejoined council staff and will take over uh, as deputy executive director with uh, Mike Berner's well-earned retirement. Uh, Mr. John North is now here, a designee from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, from California, we have a new designee, uh, Caroline McKnight of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And while I don't see him here, we have a new designee, uh, Mr. Doug Vincent Lang, uh, Commissioner of Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And we now, I'll now ask Mr. Merrick Burden to call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will call the roll for the September 2022 meeting of the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Phil Anderson. Present. Michael Clark. Present. Robert Dooley. Present. Brett Edinger. Present. Mark Gorelnik. Present. Heather Hall. Here. Dave Hansen is not present. Pete Hassemer. Present. David Hogan is not present. Virgil Moore. Here. John North. Present. Joseph Oatman. Here. Brad Pettinger. Here. Corey Writings. Here. Butch Smith. Present. Krista Svensson. Present. Doug Vincent Lang. I believe he is attempting to connect and is having some difficulties. Frank Lockhart. Here. Marcy Yaremko. Here. 
That concludes the roll, Mr. Chairman, and you do have a quorum. All right, thank you very much, Executive Director Burden. Um, so uh, before we can get started with an agenda, we need to approve an agenda. Uh, the detailed September agenda has in the, in the briefing book and is before you. I'd like to see now if there are any uh, changes uh, suggested to the agenda. If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So Virgil Moore. Moved. Are you you're moving to approve the agenda so second by Bob Dooley? Okay. All, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. All right. Um, we have an agenda and uh, before I turn to the ED report, I think Butch, you had a comment you wanted to make for the benefit of the council. Yeah, um, the other day I had the honor of chairing a meeting with Senator Cantwell, but also um, in El Waco, great metropolitan area of El Waco, we had uh, uh, the privilege of having the new Admiral Commandant of the Coast Guard, um, which is um, historical in, in, in a couple ways, but one is his first woman of the United States Coast Guard to be the, the Admiral of the whole whole thing. And uh, uh, Admiral Fagan is a very down to earth and, and, and great person. And, and I know the Coast Guard will certainly be in good hands. And we never had uh, more brass in that room than a, than a church organ. I mean, it was uh, a lot of people there. It was a very, very good meeting. And so anyway, I just wanted to welcome her posthumously and, and uh, I know she'll do a, a great job. So thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to say that. All right, thank you, Butch. Uh, we'll now turn to Executive Director Merrick Burden for the ED report. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a few matters uh, I'd like to brief you all on in regards to uh, the meeting this week and uh, some updates that have occurred since our last meeting and a few things that are be coming forward uh, following this meeting. Uh, first is the matter of uh, the ongoing COVID situation. So just a quick reminder, uh, we do have protocols for you all that are in the general information section of the briefing book. And, and there is, um, should you unfortunately have the situation of contracting COVID at the meeting, there is guidance in there about how to uh, change travel schedules and hotel arrangements and things of that nature. So I refer you to that uh, if you do have questions. Second is in regards to uh, masking policy. Uh, as I indicated in an email earlier, uh, several days ago, uh, we did empower our advisory bodies that are here with determining for themselves whether they would prefer to have a masking policy in their advisory body room. The groundfish management team has elected to uh, request that everyone visiting that their chambers um, uh, wear masks. Uh, I'm not aware of any other advisory bodies that have that same policy. Uh, let's see, moving on, we do have some alternates this week, um, filling in for several folks on our advisory bodies. I will summarize those very quickly. So one, we have um, Alan Lovewell uh, sitting in place of Melissa Honey on the California EAS seat. I'm going to butcher a few last names. I apologize to those I offend. We have Chad uh, Shepholtz sitting in for Scott Hartzell on the Washington Charter seat in the Gap. Also on the gap, we have Paul Morant uh, sitting in for Steve Westrick on the on Washington charter seat. On the HMSAS, we have Clayton Wraith sitting in for Wayne Heikela on the commercial troll seat. Also on the HMSAS, we have David Howarth sitting in for Dave Rudy on a processor south seat. On the gap, we have Brent Payne sitting in for Ruth Christensen on the trawl at large seat. On the groundfish management team, we have James Phillips sitting in for Carolyn McKnight on the CDFW seat. On the ad hoc ecosystem work group, we have Christian Heath sitting in for Jessica Watson on an ODFW seat. On the HMSMT, we have Christian Heath sitting in for Jessica Watson on the ODFW seat. And on the groundfish advisory panel, we have Wayne Kotow sitting in for Louis Zim on the sport at large seat. Again, I apologize if I butchered any last names. I'm sure I did. Uh, let's see. I would also refer you to uh, informational reports that are in uh, your briefing book packet. Uh, we have 
One is a range of uh, gear switching alternatives that have been adopted for analysis. That's there uh, for your informational purposes and, um, and, and you're thinking ahead to November and, and possibly beyond uh, action regarding uh, gear switching. We also have a draft analytical document uh, of the groundfish specs preferred alternative that you all adopted earlier this year. We have a status of 2022 salmon fisheries and we have an obituary for uh, Mr. David Jenks. Uh, it seems this community has lost many good people this year, including Mr. David Jenks. Let's see, shifting gears a little bit, uh, thinking about the, the uh, council coordinating committee. Um, one, uh, over the last several months, we have been working to develop some model uh, harassment policies uh, in consultation with uh, NIMS, uh, some NIMS leadership. Um, Earlier this summer, we had a uh, CCC closed session meeting uh, to discuss those model policies and heard from uh, various council leadership on them. Um, those are being refined and we will be bringing those back for you to review and uh, for possible inclusion into our operating procedures at a later date. We are also working toward our October CCC meeting. We do have a, an agenda firmed up and planning underway uh, that will be taking place in uh, Washington, D.C. in um, October. And also related, uh, the executive directors, we are all meeting in November after our November council meeting, and there are several items that we are all putting our heads together um, that we are all struggling with. One of those is inflation. Uh, second one is budget issues that are related to inflation and a few other matters uh, that should help this body with some things that we are dealing with at the moment, in addition to some of the other councils. Let's see, some staffing updates. Uh, as Mr. Gorelnik indicated, uh, welcome Kelly. Uh, I'm thrilled to have Kelly on board. Um, I am also uh, very anxious about the fact that it's Mike's last meeting. Thank you, Mike, for all of your support and your support of me and the council for the last 20 years. So thank you. Uh, let's see, we are also <clears throat> in the process of um, filling John DeVore's uh, large shoes. John will be retiring at the end of the year, as I think everyone knows. Uh, we have had some excellent candidates apply for that position. Um, I also am anxious about John's departure. Uh, we do have some good people. We are in the process now of uh, interviewing, so stay tuned on that one. Couple of other uh, matters then, uh, in terms of your trays, uh, if you don't want uh, paper, please put the green card in your tray. Just a quick reminder there. And a reminder about microphones. I think we're all getting pretty good at this, but hit the button when you wanna speak, hit it again to turn it off. Uh, and then last, we do have a chair's reception this evening. Uh, there are several people that we have not been able to honor uh, that have, um, either stepped off of an advisory body after many years or have left the council after many years and we were not able to honor because of the COVID situation. So we'll plan to say a few words about those people uh, at this uh, chair's reception this evening. So happy to take any questions, Mr. Chairman, but otherwise that concludes my executive director's report. All right, thank you. Are there any questions? All right. Thank you very much. Well, that uh, concludes this agenda item. It takes us to open public comment, and it is my privilege and honor to pass the gavel to Vice Chair Pete Hassemer for this agenda item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome all to Boise here for this meeting. Before we get started, I'll just do a quick summary of what we have before us in the briefing book um, materials, the early submissions, there were two reports. One of those was labeled as a NIMS report. That's incorrect. That should be a National Ocean Service report, a letter received from the o Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And then there was another uh, staff report, a letter written by the executive director in response to that. Um, after the advanced briefing book on our online portal, um, if you've looked at that, two comments were received there. So I'll just direct you there to read those. And um, 
before we get to the public signups, then we have some management entity reports. So first of all, I will turn to Frank Lockhart for a brief update from NIMS. Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, and um, my update is very short. It's just to kind of close the loop on the standardized bycatch reporting methodology effort that the council went through for two years on July 8th. Um, this uh, in between the June council meeting and this one, uh, NIMS announced the approval of three FMP amendments, uh, one for the coastal pelagic species FMP, one for the highly migratory species uh, FMP, and the other for Pacific Coast salmon. And as you'll recall earlier, we noted that the ground fish plan did not need any uh, changes. So this does close our efforts on the standardized bycatch reporting methodology um, uh, requirement uh, that we had, and that means we have uh, five more years. Uh, in, in another five years, we'll have to do it again. But I just wanted to let everybody know that we did approve those FMP amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Any questions for Frank? Looking around, I see none. So thank you. Our next item here is um, we do have in the in the materials a presentation from the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Mr. Bill Doris is, um, I believe he was with us online to give that presentation. Is that correct? Getting a... I don't see him signed in. All right, well, we will pause that then and move on to the signups. And um, if Bill does join or sign in, we will take that up then after our public comment. So looking at the signups then, uh, I see right now five signups. We will start with Mike Leonard and then Louis Zim will follow up after that. So Mike Leonard, are you online? I am, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Mike Leonard. I'm Vice President of Government Affairs for the American Sport Fishing Association, which is a trade association representing the recreational fishing industry. Hopefully this is my first time uh, speaking to the council. So I appreciate the opportunity. We've had other staff, um, uh, attend many council meetings over the years, but uh, I'm, I'm pinch hitting at this moment in time. Um, I, I guess I would have appreciated hearing the presentation that we're having to skip over because that's what I wanted to just briefly comment on. Um, so the two letters in the B1A agenda topic dealing with fisheries management regulations in the Chumash uh, Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. Um, so from the sport fishing community standpoint, you know, ASA had submitted a letter in support of the uh, Chumash Sanctuary that was really contingent upon language in the nomination report for the sanctuary, uh, which stated that the proposed sanctuary shall have no impact on treaty fishing rights and impose no future regulations upon commercial or recreational fishing. Um, so that pretty explicit language uh, was, again, what predicated our support for sanctuary um, nomination moving forward. So. There, there's a little bit of confusion, at least on my end, as far as this back and forth between uh, uh, NOAA sanctuaries and the council on whether the, the council wishes to consider fishing regulations within the proposed sanctuary. I'm not sure if this is just a procedural step in the process, um, but um, or if there's something more uh, timeline or um, uh, anything else that might be driving this. But, um, you know, again, from our standpoint, we're supportive of this on the condition that fisheries management authority is retained by existing management bodies, namely the council. Uh, we really don't see a need for additional above and beyond fishing regulations in this area. Um, should that need arise for whatever reason in the future, uh, we believe the regulation should be developed by the council. So um, again, support the overall concept and uh, certainly support the council and sanctuaries continuing this dialogue um, on the, this initial step as far as uh, uh, fisheries regulations within the sanctuary, but want to make sure that the council keeps that authority 
There's no need to transfer or give additional authority to the sanctuary itself because um, fisheries regulations should retain uh, under Magnuson and under the council where we've got this good, robust process and uh, good management and conservation is already being done. So um, again, we just encourage the council and sanctuaries to continue this back and forth, but in a way that ultimately uh, gets to that result of uh, of no uh, change in management authority going forward. So with that, I'm happy to yield back the remaining seven plus minutes of my time, um, but I'm also happy to, for any questions. Okay, thank you, Mike. Any questions for Mike? Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mike Leonard, for your, for your comments. I just wanna just clarify, you're not objecting to additional fishery regulations provided they're deemed necessary and handled by the council. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that is correct, uh, Mr. Chair. It is, we are not saying never in the future shall there ever be a reason to enact any sort of regulations in this area. It's, again, it's a special area. It's a really important sport fishing uh, area. Um, and if additional conservation management needs are needed, we absolutely would encourage exploration of additional regulations to address those. But as you all know, we have a system in place to do that, namely through the council uh, that has proven itself to be successful in addressing conservation needs. Um, so we believe the current process should remain intact. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, Virgil? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mike, good morning, it's Virgil Moore here. Hope you're doing well. Um, have you had any direct communication with NOAA on the issue? Uh, and what was their feedback, if you've had any? Uh, no, we have not. I mean, other than as this was being developed with the National uh, Office at Sanctuaries, um, communication with them about our mutual understanding that um, that fishing regulations would be retained under existing authorities. And again, reinforcing that line within the, the nomination report that the proposed sanctuary shall have no impact on, uh, on commercial or recreational fishing or treaty fishing rights. So we've not had any follow-up dialogue, especially as to what's prompting this current back and forth, where again, it's unclear to me, there's maybe others at, at your all's meeting that have a better clarity, but as to what's prompting this back and forth at this time, again, I don't know if this is just a procedural step or if there's something else going on, but um, we, we certainly would like to see those questions answered. Thank you. Any further questions? I'm not seeing any, so thanks very much, Mike, for those comments. And before we move on with uh, the, the signups, uh, Louie, if we can uh, have you stand down for a moment, we have Mr. Bill Doris on the line now. And so we will go back to the management entity reports in his presentation. So Bill, if you're ready, you can just uh, proceed with your presentation. Are you able to hear me? Now we can Check hear. To make sure. Okay, great. Um, sorry about that. I was told to get on at 8.15 and, and there I was, but I, it seems like you guys uh, may have been a little sooner. I'm really sorry for not having been on sooner. Um, thanks for the opportunity to, to make this presentation and to clear up some of the questions that are out there. Um, Mr. Leonard touched on a few things that um, are obvious and understandable questions. And I'll, through a, a couple of slides on a PowerPoint presentation, maybe cover those. Um, so I, I, whoever's advancing it, uh, Carrie or Sandra, if you could go to the next slide. So um, section 304A5 is a particular part of the National Marine Sanctuaries Act that focuses on what NOAA will do. NOAA is the agency implementing the Sanctuaries Act. What we will do if there's uh, determined to be a need for fishing regulations. And in general, NOAA will give the relevant fishery management councils the first opportunity to address the fishing issues um, and the need for regulations in a sanctuary. That's um, a procedure we've been working from for quite some time. And um, there was even about 15 years ago, uh, you know, a real uh, concerted effort between National Marine Fisheries Service and National Ocean Service where the sanctuary program is in to, um, 
refined then and come up with some pr- procedures. And we've all been operating from those for quite some time. And, uh, you know, that historical process is one where if we um, in the sanctuary program feel a fishing regulation is needed in, in federal waters under the jurisdiction of the Fishery Management Council or in state waters by a state, we will bring that to the Fishery Management Council um, and I'll even flag a few examples. And that also has meant we first talked with the fishing community about it, um, about the need, what we think the need is, the purpose, what potential solutions are. And then we brought that to the council, and we do bring that to the council when we've got um, an issue. That part of the process has not changed. Uh, however, we've done a, a, a more tight review of the language of the uh, 304A5 and Noah has recently in, interpreted that to also believe it's proper, required, in fact, for us at the start of a sanctuary designation to come to the council to see if the council itself feels fishing regulations are necessary for the proposed designation. And that's what this step is. So, again, we're not changing that past practice. Uh, Mr. Leonard laid out his view on that my view is exactly the same as his the council's been a very effective partner with us on the west coast on a whole host of ecosystem based conservation measures some that involve fishing some that don't Um, and that's not changing rather this is just an additional early touch just to find out as we produce the uh, documents necessary for the in this case the proposed chumash heritage sanctuary designation to see if the council thinks a fishing regulation is needed uh, next slide. Um, sorry, this is a little small, but I wanted to put at least on one slide the text of 304A5. And the key um, to note is that this is in the section of the Sanctuaries Act that talks about new designations and then specifically on fishing regulations. If you look at that first sentence, it says the secretary shall provide the appropriate fishery management council with the opportunity to prepare draft regulations for fishing within the EEZ as the council may deem necessary to implement the proposed designation. And so that, in that section, our sense is that is relevant to where we're at right now with Chumash. Even though at this time we in, in the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries um, don't feel fishing regulations are needed. And in fact, if we did, we would have already come to the council with those. We feel like this step is a, is a requirement to check in um, to see if the council thinks fishing regulations are needed. The next slide, please. Um, This is regulations that implement 304A5. It's pretty similar, but it also includes a timeline of within 120 days of the request. Um, If it's deemed necessary, um, then we would want to get feedback from the council within that time. It, It could come today, as far as we're concerned, or it could come at a future meeting, but the goal is to have that feedback within 120 days. And again, I'm not going to go through all of the stipulations in the regulations. These were both included in the letter I sent uh, to Merrick Burden in mid-August. So if you've got that in the package, you can also see the same language. Uh, Next slide. Uh, So this lays out what we believe the options are for the council, uh, whether it's today or maybe at a subsequent meeting. The first option is to uh, not adopt or not recommend any fishing regulations with regard to the proposed sanctuary. Sort of, you know, period, end of discussion. The second is that you may determine that you think some fishing regulations are warranted um, for this sanctuary. And and for that, we recognize you can't complete the regulatory process within 120 days if you thought they were needed. But if we're in option two here and you felt these were needed, then we would like to know within roughly 120 days what you think those are, what might be the scale or scope of those, if there's something you think we should be addressing in our um, draft management plan and environmental review process, or if it's something that, that could be handled through the council process, you know, and we recognize that may be a year or two um, to get that accomplished. The third is that um, we think you have the option to defer any action at this time and wait and um, see what we release as in terms of a proposed rule, what would be regulated in this sanctuary, 
the draft management plan and the, the NEPA review, the environmental draft environmental impact statement, and any other materials, you know, boundary options and things like that. Um, we anticipate that end of the year, maybe the start of 2023, we will have those on the streets, but that's an option you could simply defer and wait until that time to review those materials. And then there's a fourth option too, and we've included this because it's very similar to number one, but you could decline to adopt fishing regulations as part of the designation, um, but remain open to consider new information from the public, the sanctuary, others, should the sanctuary be designated. And we've included this because um, for us, the National Marine Sanctuaries here on the West Coast, we have embraced this and felt like the council has embraced this spirit of number four for decades now in, in working together. And in fact, Mr. Leonard even laid that out. And there's a question to him about, um, you know, a view on, on would that be, you know, something that could happen in the future? Is there an openness to hearing new ideas? So it's different than number one. And then number one could send the message, it's done, no fishing regulations are needed. We don't ever want to talk about it again. Number four says, well, we don't think they're um, needed now, but we, we remain open to those should the sanctuary get designated and, and NOAA or someone else could bring that back to the council in the future. So these, uh, we think, are by and large the four options that exist uh, for the council. Next slide. Uh, and I, this, I, I just wanted to touch on, um, it was suggested it might be useful to identify for the Fishery Management Council um, where we've we and sanctuaries have brought issues to the council um, related to fishing and fishing regulations. And the first one was around 1994. Um, we're not sure the precise date, we haven't dug it up, but it's around then where NOAA brought to the council a request that it, the council adopt prohibitions on chumming for white sharks um, unrelated to fishing. And the council declined and said, you guys go do that under the Sanctuaries Act. And so we did for Monterey Bay Sanctuary. Um, and then there were three um, broad actions that in effect came about as part of the first EFH designation process. Um, one was uh, an EFH conservation area and, and a prohibition on fishing below 3,000 feet at Davidson Seamount, um, something that uh, the council adopted. Um, Additional protections at Cordell Bank, a ban on bottom contact gear in 2006, and then the Channel Island Sanctuary um, worked um, on a network of uh, fishing um, MPAs, you know, MPAs related to fishing for marine reserves and marine conservation areas with the state of California. Um, and, and, and let me say, too, that I, I'm not sure about number one, but I am sure that two, three, four, five, and six all were developed in collaboration with the fishing industry. We talked with them about these issues um, at length. Um, there was also something proposed in maybe around 2006, was finally adopted in 2009. Um, our original proposal was to ban the harvest of krill in West Coast sanctuaries and to the council's credit, the council took that a step further and made it a West Coast wide ban um, on the harvest of krill. Um, and then last, some EFH adjustments um, in Monterey Bay, Greater Fairlands, Cordell Bank Sanctuary during the five-year review finalized a couple of years ago. And so all of these are examples where we've come to the council, not because we wanted a fishing regulation that we would adopt, but rather working consistent within the council process. This is, these are you know, the six or so activities, you know, over the last 30, 40 years um, since sanctuaries have existed on the West Coast where we've come to the council for action. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then lastly, just a few slides to, um, you know, highlight what we're talking about. The, the green is the area for the proposed Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. The goals up for this sanctuary are to protect the nationally significant natural, cultural, historical resources in this area, as well as the uses that depend on them. Um, and, that, and that would include fishing. Um, research, reach, uh, recreation, tourism, uh, a whole host of human uses depend on a healthy, vibrant ecosystem. Um, the sanctuary, one other goal would be to guide comprehensive ecosystem-based management for a whole host of threats to these resources. And then third, to recognize and aid public awareness of indigenous tribal heritage and tribal cultures in the area. So those are broadly the goals for the sanctuary. And 
And again, much of this is going to be laid out, much more detail for all of this will be laid out uh, by the end of this year, or early next year, when we um, put the draft documents on the street for public review. Next slide. Yeah, so, so this is simply to show the existing spatial related um, state MPA, EFH conservation areas within that proposed sanctuary. There's seven state MPAs within the, the formal proposed project, um, a couple other nearby um, down the Gaviota Coast in, in Morro Bay Estuary. And there's four, um, you know, three of which are pretty large uh, ground fish uh, conservation areas um, that exist and have already been designated by the council in the sanctuary. And, and I'm showing this just as, as a way of saying, look, there's, it's, well, it's a big area. There's uh, been a lot of um, fisheries related, habitat conservation related actions that the council's taken, that the state of California has taken, and we're well aware of that. And, and you, know, it, you know, it's an important part of the background. Um, next slide. Yeah, I think this is the last main one. I just wanted to show the council where we were at in the process. Um, we had the public scoping phase from November to the end of January, and um, we've been working through all the various uh, issues that came up at that time, and, and we're, again, producing three core documents, um, a management plan, which will have about 10 to 12 action plans in it. Um, if folks are unfamiliar with what those are, you could look at Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, completed about a year ago, a revision to its management plan. Channel Islands is in the process. These are two sanctuaries that border Chumash Heritage. They're in the process of revising their management plan. Now, those are management plans for existing sanctuaries that have been around 30, 40 years. So the Chumash Heritage management plan won't be as detailed because it's just beginning. But that gives you a sense of what we're talking about. There'll be regulations. Um, and again, it's, I can't get into a whole lot of details about where we're at on that, but I can certainly say one could look at the Monterey Bay and the Channel Islands regulations and get a pretty darn good idea um, of, you know, minus the marine reserves element of the Channel Islands sanctuary of what could be coming. Um, and then there's an environmental impact statement that looks at the impacts of designating the sanctuary and alternatives to boundaries, you know, for that, some that may be slightly bigger as required underneath us, some that might be slightly smaller. So um, that end of this year, maybe it'll be early 23 when we get those on the street. And I'm happy to come back to the council at that time and provide you a briefing um, on it. There'll be a 60 to 90 day public comment period at that time. And, um, you know, that's when there'll be a, you know, a real chance to, for folks to see, okay, are we confident or comfortable that there's not regulations or there are regulations affecting fishing? I think that'll be more clear. But I'll stop there and just recap once again that this is a procedure, what is here in front of you today is a procedural step to see if by chance there's an interest in, by the council alone, not because we in the National Sanctuary Program seek fishing regulations, but to see if you feel fishing regulations might be warranted and something we should be considering at this time in the Chumash Heritage designation. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Are there any questions for Bill? Uh, Virgil and then Marcy. Bill, uh, it's Virgil Moore here. And I guess my question is, will the council continue to have authority to set rules, make plans that might differ from the designation documents as we gain information about the fishery management in this area? Or do these documents lock the council in? Yeah, so uh, Mr. Moore, we, um, if I understand your question right, we've not um, released any documents yet. So we haven't, um, put anything sort of out there to say, here's what we're thinking. I think if you look at the existing sanctuaries that are on the West Coast, um, they uh, ex exist and coexist with the diverse array of federal fishery regulations and closures and openings that you all put forward um, all the time. And so we've, you know, for many years and many of the sanctuaries, there's a harmonious relationship between the sanctuaries and the council 
you know, if we're typically doing things like limiting, you know, oil and gas development, and, you know, there's obviously a lot of concern about wind farm development. And so that's what we're working through right now. Um, and, you know, as, as I said to the council in March, when I made a presentation, just a standard check-in, that if we have a need for fishing regulation, we will come to the council with you. I can't say finally, because that's not final until we release it, but we haven't come to the council yet. It's now September, um, and we've been working for nine, ten months on the, um, this package. So you can get a pretty strong indication of which way we're going on fishing issues. Thank you. Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Bill. Good morning. Um, I'm looking over the, the words <laughs> on the screen. Um, that describe the four options that you're providing to us here today. And I'm reading the words, but I think I'm, I'm losing the distinction between a few of these alternatives. Um, yeah. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on how these alternatives are different, um, particularly one in four. Um, I'm just, I'm struggling a little yeah. bit. And yeah. also wanting to know if they can, if we can select more than one of these alternatives or if we're limited to one. That last part is an interesting question, Marcy. So if someone could run the slides that, what I'm looking at is the next to last slide. If someone could go back three or four slides to that, that'd be great. Um, Cause I wanna make sure we're all looking at the same thing. Yeah, so here, so, um, Again, I'll, I'll see if I can elaborate and, and get some more clarity for you, Marcy. So on the first one, um, if you look at what the regulations in the 30485 process is, it's a, this is a question now today at the time of the initiation of the Chumash Heritage designation, they ask the council, do you believe fishing regulations are needed at this time? Um, and if so, what do you think those are? and What might be your schedule to get those adopted or do you want us to adopt them? So that's sort of the baseline question for the council. The answer could be no. We do not believe fishing regulations are necessary with regard to the proposed sanctuary, period. And, and let me jump to number four, um, because it's a similar first part of the answer. But some could interpret the period, that's it, for the first question to feel like we don't want to talk about this again. Number four has the same beginning. We, the council, do not believe fishing regulations are necessary as part of this designation process. But the signal to those that, you know, because we got a lot of comments in the scoping phase that we should regulate fishing, that we should have closures, that we should have this, we should have that, as well as we heard from many that said, no, you don't need to do that. Um, that four says what I believe is the, for the last 10, 15 years, been the position that the council's taken, which is, look, we are open. If some issue comes up down the road um, that could come from the public, from the sanctuary, from a scientist, an NGO, whomever, do you think that there's a need for the change in fishing regulations to better protect the sanctuary and, and maybe not harm fishing? We're open to hearing that. So that's how four differs from one. And it's really sort of what signal does the council want to send? That, that, and this is just my experience, Marcy, is that folks can interpret things in a way unintended. Number two is, is that the council thinks the answer to that question is yes, we believe a fishing regulation is needed or a change to an existing regulation is needed for the proposed sanctuary. And third is to say, look, we're not sure we want, number three on this list is we're not sure we wanna take any action at this time. We'd rather see what NOAA's proposing for boundaries, what NOAA's proposing for regulations in the draft management plan those are the materials that I said are coming out later this year. So you could decline at this time or defer, and I think we would grant your deferral. In essence, it would mean you don't think they're needed right now, but you really want to see what we put on the street and put out for public review. Does that help clarify what those choices are? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Bill. That helps. I'm, I'm getting closer, um, if I may, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, just 
two follow-ups on uh, the testimony that Bill just provided us. Um, if I'm understanding your description of the distinction between one and four, um, one is not just about the designation process. One is about fishing regulations uh, related to the sanctuary, both for purposes of designating the sanctuary and then beyond into the future. Um, because I note number four is pretty clear that you, you answer no to question one, but then provides this ability into the future to consider new information. Yep. Is that correct? That's the difference. That's correct. And, Great. and again, my, this is, you know, maybe too many years of experience, but my experience is if it's just number one, you may not mean it to mean that you won't consider new information. But my worry would be someone will in the future wave around some action that was taken in the fall of 2022 and say, the council never wants to deal with this issue. It doesn't think fishing regulations are needed for the sanctuary ever. That has not been my experience about how the council has conveyed um, its attitude on these issues. You all, I want to give you credit, have conveyed an openness to that. If that's the case, then I, that's where number four feels like it's trying to lay out an option that is most consistent with the a message the council has been trying to convey. It's the second part of that. Because 304A5 does have, as I said, two elements now. We used to only see it as one element. If no thought or regulation was needed, we would bring it to the council. There's now this first early check-in that we're talking about today at the time of a designation. Does the council think a fishing reg is needed? So it's keeping alive the reality that that second half of 304A5 is still viable. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Bill. Um, on to option three. Um, I'm just curious about the 120 day clock. Um, I don't think we expect the release of the proposed rule, NEPA documents, et cetera, um, if anytime soon. And so I believe we're understanding that the 120 day clock has started. So I just want to understand um, if we select option three, does that, how is that timeline ad addressed? Yeah. So the 120 days um, is there. And if you read it, 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 it maybe Sandra, you could go, um, I think it's up one slide. And that, that's the one about the, yeah, this implementing regulation. If you look at this, this is the one that refers to the 120 days. Um, what it says is that, you know, you'll have 120 days from the date of the notification, which was mid-August, to make recommendations, right? And so those recommendations are what we just talked about. No, we don't think regulations are needed. Yes, we think regulations are needed. Right. Um, and if appropriate, which would mean you thought they were needed, prepare draft fishery regulations and submit them to the secretary to, you know, to know to National Fishery Service. And then there's a sentence in here about what you should use for standards. And then fisheries activities not proposed for regulation of the 304A5 of the Act may be listed in the draft sanctuary designation document as potentially subject to regulation. And, and, and look, that's where we admit that third sentence where we, it now blurs what's been historically the process. NOAA brings an issue to the council and says, we'd like you to adopt a fishing regulation. The implication of this third sentence is that's the context in which we're in. But that's not the case. We have not brought to the council fishing regulations. So everyone's got to stay a little flexible on this. I, I, what I can tell you is that what we're not seeking to do is um, to create some sort of a scenario where the council elects not to draft fishing regulations, and that then becomes our justification to draft fishing regulations. 
right? Because you declined to take action. Okay, so we will. That's not what we're doing here, right? We, we've been very upfront with the council for 20 years. If, you fee, if we feel efficient regulation is needed, we'll be very upfront. You'll see it. We'll talk to you about it. We'll talk to fishermen about it. And so that's not going to happen. So I'm just trying to reassure anyone that thinks we're trying to fuzz this. We're just trying to give you practical options um, in, in terms of what you could do. If, if you feel like, well, we're just uneasy. If we defer, it goes beyond 120 days. You're then going to use that to um, take over fishing remanagement. I can promise you we're not going to do that. But if that's your concern, then just decline any fishing regulations if that's what you want. Or propose them if that's what you want. Is that good? Th thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you very much, Bill. Appreciate the extra yeah. detail. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mark Gorelnik. Uh, Bill, thanks again for coming to speak to us. I really appreciate it. It provides a lot of a lot of clarity. Uh, and and so if if we defer at this point or take one of the options where we're not going to pr propose any regulations at this time um and down the road some folks uh, perhaps even the sanctuary itself believes that some regulations uh, would be appropriate and let's say they bring them to the council and the council disagrees I is that the last word on whether such regulations would ever be imposed yeah um Mr. Grell, look, that, that gets asked all the time when we have this discussion. So I appreciate your bringing it up. Um, luckily, we've not been in that circumstance, or we were like in the case of that 1994 request regarding um, white sharks. And in that case, the council said, no, we decline, but you guys go ahead and do it, right? So, so that's why the decline could have different you know, sort of nuances. One, we decline might be because either we lack authority, and, and that came up a little bit on the Channel Islands Marine Reserves, that ultimately um, the council and the fishery management plants could only go so far, and so we set it up so that as far as the council action goes, it goes, and then the Sanctuaries Act comes into play after that. So, so that's another nuance where your authority has some limitations, and the sanctuary can then perhaps close that gap. In the case of the white shark, you just didn't want to tackle it. You didn't feel like it was appropriate. So, but asked us to do it. And I, I suppose there could be a third scenario where we're adamant something's needed and the council's adamant, no way it's not. Um, and, you know, there is a procedure laid out for how does that get elevated within NOAA? Because then you have a scenario where the National Fisheries Service and the sanctuary program may be on different sides, but we have a common boss in terms of the Dr. Rick Spinrad now who runs NOAA. And so that, that's how it would get elevated. I don't, again, think we've ever been there. In fact, I was even trying to check. I think all those actions I listed on the other page were all unanimous by the council. Um, so we've been in, in a good place. And, you know, in theory, I grant you it could happen. But I think those nuances that I mentioned matter too. And then this you know, third scenario where there's just strong disagreement and it gets elevated and, and then someone high up gets to decide, look, is this needed or not? And that is envisioned in this language, but, you know, we've really never had to go there, in, not in a conflict way. And uh, Thanks, Bill. And just a quick follow-up. I, I note that the, this was mentioned by an earlier uh, public comment, that the nomination a document for this uh, sanctuary states, and, and I'll quote, the proposed sanctuary shall impose no future regulations upon commercial or recreational fishing. And how does that statement square with the theoretical possibility of the sanctuary imposing restrictions on fishing? Yeah, um, well, we, um obviously are very well aware of that and um, we haven't yet brought to you any fishing regulations right and, and again that's where I have to play this you know, sort of vague dance here with you because I can't say for sure for sure for sure until it's released I'm not allowed to do that and you've them staff and attorneys and council staff have been in that situation too in the midst of a rulemaking but I can point out the facts up until now that we haven't brought a fishing regulation 
forward to the council, to the state of California for it to consider. So we're aware of that. It's very important what's proposed, right? But it's not binding in, in that, let's assume that nomination had said, we think fishing regulations are needed. I, I think the council fishermen might say, wait, time out. We want you to not do what the nomination says. So it ultimately is in NOAA's court. It's our responsibility to review things like the boundaries that are proposed, the activities they think should be regulated, the things that they think should not be regulated. That's what all the public process has been about up until now, the 27,000 comments we got on the scoping phase, and we've had you know, multiple workshops on various issues. You know, we haven't had a public workshop on fisheries issues and the need for fishing regulations. Again, that provides a pretty clear indication which direction we may be going. Um, and so it's very important what's in that nomination, but it's not binding in that we've got a duty to consider all factors and other users and everyone else who's proposed, um, you know, who, who, who may be affected by what's proposed by the nominators. Does that make sense? Is that? Yeah, I, I appreciate uh, that frankness. It's, it's just that there's certain organizations I know have supported the sanctuary relying upon the representations in the nomination form. And, and if those, those representations um, were not accurate for any reason, um, I think that some folks would, uh, yeah. would be uh, not very happy. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I am well aware of that. My team is well aware of that. We take that very seriously um, in terms of what's gone on and, and some of it there's I'm just asking for a little sort of trust and, and look at what's happened and, and and just, I guess, some appreciation for the fact that while we're in the middle of a rulemaking process, we can only say so much. Thank you. Butch Smith. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you for your uh, presentation and and I, I, I might be a little slow in, in figuring this out, but um, I, I don't understand, you know, if this is a non, um, perhaps having fishing going on, um, sanctuary, why, you know, the same old way we manage fish where California fish and game would make a note of whatever stock in need needs, you know, some protection or not to be fished on or a regulation. And uh, then this council would act on that, um, like we do, you know, from the border of Mexico to the tip of Washington. I, I'm just not getting the understanding why that you would have to have that fishing regulation part in, in this sanctuary language if uh, we are already doing that and would be already prepared to do that and are bound by law to do that under the Magnuson Act and and so I you know I just um, just having a hard time wrapping my hands around that part of it and um, I appreciate you know the hard work and I appreciate all the all the stuff that went into this presentation but I I, I just uh, not getting that part. Yeah, no, no, no problem. Um, l let me um, try to add a little more clarity. So um, before you today, uh, all of us here, we here in, from NOAA Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, we are not proposing today to change any of that. So that's not the, and any of what you laid out, that states, fishery management obligations, the federal government's fishery management obligations, we're not proposing to change any of that. Um, rather, um, what, when our attorneys did a, uh, a close look at 304A5, this section of existing federal law, they felt, you know, we haven't done new designations in a while. We, let's look at this first sentence more closely. And it seems pretty clear that there's an expectation or at least let's be safe at the initiation of the designation and see if the Pacific Fishery Management Council feels, believes that a fishery regulation of any kind might be needed to help 
with the designation of Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. Um, and, and that's the question. So it's not we and sanctuaries coming to the council, saying to the council, to the fishing community, we think something needs to change. That, that's not today. Rather, it's to say we're embarking on this sanctuary designation. We haven't brought you any fishing regulations, but maybe we're missing something that you think needs to change. Any regulation, a different EFH boundary, uh, I don't know what. Right? I'm just sort of giving examples of the kind of things we've talked to the council about over the last 30, 40 years. So it, it's your chance to say, we think something's needed or we don't think anything's needed. Or it's premature for us to make a decision. We're, we'd rather see what you guys put on the street or, or whatever. I mean, there could be, as I laid out, those four options. So that's what we're looking for today. And again, um, we are not um, proposing today that we change any of the current construct in this area of state and federal fishery management laws. That's not what we're proposing. Does, does, that, does that help? Does that give a little more? Uh, thank you. Okay. Frank Lockhart. Um, thanks, Bill. Um, I just want to confirm something. I, um, in the, the timeline at the end, you talk about release draft designation documents uh, um, occurring in December, late December to early 2023. Those documents, are those, these the same three documents that you're talking about in those that options slide, which is the uh, proposed rule, draft management plan, and draft NEPA document? Is, is those three that you're talking about when you talk about uh, documents in that timeline? Uh, yes, Frank, that's correct. Those are, the, those are what would be released. For public review and comment. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Right. Any further comments? Looking around the table, and I'm not seeing any. So, thank you, Bill. Thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, present to us today. And thank you. Thank you for considering this. Okay. So with that, we'll move back to our other public comment and we'll pause a few seconds. There we have on the screen, um, Louis Zim is up next, uh, followed by Jeff Shester. So Louis, if you're with us, please go ahead. I am. Pick me up there, Chair, Vice Chair Hassemer. Absolutely, please proceed. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just uh, keying up my, uh... okay, here we go. Uh, good morning, Mr. Vice Chair Hassemer and members of the council. My name is Louis Zim and I am representing the 120 members of the San Diego Yacht Club Anglers Group. Today, I would like to speak to you about using a go fish underwater camera to observe ground fish. For the last two years, I have been using this $200 pressure resistant camera to make videos of ground fish off Point Loma, California. And, and I attached this tube like camera, which is the size of a good Cuban cigar to my fishing line. And I put a plastic squid like lure, a rubber squid, without any hooks and a 12 ounce weight suspended below it. I then use the controls of my power catamaran, Shearwater, similar to the way that I used to on the research boats, to hover over likely structure and lower the camera toward the substrate while viewing my 1,000 watt fish finder. I could actually see the camera descending down toward the substrate and see reactions of the fish to the camera. And I might add, I also have added a light because the camera has a pretty weak LED on it. Um, I have successfully taken videos to 100 fathoms with this apparatus. The real excitement comes, however, when I download the videos to my computer and I never know what to expect. So over the past three months, I've been concentrating on habitat from 25 to 45 fathoms. And I'd like to show you, with your permission, a few outtakes 
from this work, and I believe Chris can key that up for us. Thank you very much for that, Chris. And um, I, I have an offer that you probably can't refuse. If uh, if anybody on the council can uh, identify that funny looking brown and white rockfish, uh, I offer to uh, bring donuts to the November council meeting. And also, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thanks, Louie. Any questions for Louie? Looking around the table, I'm not seeing any, so thank you very much. Um, next, we'll have Jeff Shester, and Jeff will be followed by Wayne Koto. Jeff, are you there? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the council. Uh, this is Jeff Shester representing Oceana. Um, first, uh, we wanted to um, discuss the letter uh, on an open comment that Oceana submitted in the briefing book on this agenda item. We wanted to thank council, the management team, the CPS management team, and the CPS AS for its work over many years to develop an updated management framework for the central subpopulation of northern anchovy that had broad support from stakeholders and scientists. Uh, this framework includes a biennial review of recent biomass. For anchovy, um, new specific biomass thresholds uh, below which the ABC would be reduced, and formulas for setting the OFL. Uh, Jeff, we've lost you there. Uh, Jeff, we're not hearing you if you're still. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I I, um, I think I may, must have cut out there. Um, we were glad to see a new stock assessment for anchovy, and we look forward to seeing a new proposed rule by NIFS uh, this fall for uh, setting the new harvest specifications for the upcoming season. Um, anchovy are critically important forage species for uh, larger fish, birds, and mammals. Their population fluctuates widely, and recent science, uh, including the council-adopted stock assessment, shows that the stock is prone to collapse to very low levels, 
and a responsive uh, management regime using annual surveys is critical to preventing overfishing and protecting the forage base for the California current ecosystem. We really believe that this is a pillar of, of climate change readiness and ecosystem-based management. Um, and we, we acknowledge that the council chose to put this initially, the new framework, in the council operating procedures. Uh, and we have stated that the CPS fishery management plan is a more appropriate place. Uh, we were encouraged in council discussion to hear various council members agree that ultimately the fishery management plan is the appropriate place for the framework, uh, but uh, understand that, that several uh, council members ra raised the idea that they want to see how uh, the, the framework works uh, in practice. Um, so at this point, we, we would ask the council to add to the scope of the upcoming CPS FMP amendment that's beginning in November, uh, the, this new anchovy framework. We think this is an opportunity now that it has that the council has gone through this to uh, ultimately put it in the FMP uh, where this belongs. Um, and, and if not, uh, we, we would hope that the council would schedule a, uh, a review of the new management framework at the conclusion of the next management cycle, uh, which, which we believe would be important and consistent with the council's intent. Um, under the, the, the fishery management, uh, under the, under the Magnuson Stevens Act, we, we believe that clearly the fishery management plan is where uh, the framework belongs. Um, so we do look forward to uh, continuing the progress on anchovy management uh, with the council. Um, we hope to see the framework ultimately in the fishery management plan. Uh, we also, uh, uh, as, as, as mentioned by the SSC, uh, that it is important to continue to update the um, EMSY or X, X, MSY exploitation rate for anchovy uh, as new science becomes available and we have a longer time series. And also, uh, we do believe it, it, the council should consider uh, developing a harvest guideline with a cutoff for anchovy, uh, similar to uh, the harvest guideline for Pacific sardine and Pacific mackerel. So uh, together, we believe this, um, this approach will help ensure strong protections for one of the most important forage species in the California current marine ecosystem. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to comment and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions for Jeff? Yes, Corey. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thanks, Jeff, for being here. Um, I agree that the framework should at some point be added to the FMP. Um, responsiveness to any future downturns or collapse is important and appreciate that the framework was developed through a robust council process with input from a wide range of folks. Uh, I think it's a good example of if-then management that is important for climate change. Uh, my question for you is the council has discussed moving it to the FMP at some point in the near future. Is there a reason why it should be added to an FMP amendment scoping at this meeting? Do you see a reason why the current placement in the COPs poses a concern for conservation or management at this point? Thanks. Um, great, thank you, uh, Ms. Ridings, uh, for the question, um, and uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, uh, yeah, we we ultimately uh, do believe that um, the Magnuson Stevens Act does require fishery management plans to describe the uh, acceptable biological catch uh, control rules, uh, specify um, the mechanism for setting uh, ACLs and, 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 and the specifications process. And our concern is that the current fishery management plan really does not describe the the frequency of management or the use of annual biomass in setting uh, annual catch limits. So it really does not describe the method that for setting ACLs or the, the method that the council intends to take in managing the fishery. Um, so, you know, the, the COPs are, I think, a, an appropriate place to describe schedules, but um, this is really sort of an exception to the way that, um, that, that you know, the, the, the council manages all other species where the, the specifications formulas and process. Uh, it, this is the only place where that is actually in the COPs rather than the FMP. So, and we think that present does present some um, potentially some legal weaknesses for the council and, and inconsistencies with other species and the and the Magnuson Act. So basically the the, the the council is already planning to undertake some workload to amend the, the CPS FMP beginning in November and deal with you know and address some kind of long-standing issues that have been raised by the management team. And, and we believe that 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 that, that would make the most sense now that the council has actually gone through this and, and it does seem to, to have worked without any glitches. Um, now we, we believe is, is an opportunity to kind of address that and ultimately put it in the FMP where it belongs. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jeff. Further questions? I'm not seeing any hands here, so thank you, Jeff, for that. Um, we'll next move to Wayne Cotto, and Wayne will be followed by Jamie Diamond. Wayne, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman, Vice Chairs, Council Members, and Staff. Wayne Cotto, Executive Director with Coastal Conservation Association of California, representing the recreational anglers. We believe in what the National Marine Sanctuary designation can do for protection of coastline, cultural, and environmental resources, connecting all the individuals with our natural resources, primarily those who have historically lacked access and opportunities to experience the outdoors is the most effective method to increase awareness of, generate support for, and effective consider, uh, conservation efforts. Fishing provides Californians with opportunities to connect with the ocean and wildlife and develop a deeper understanding of and appreciation for the link between professional science-based management actions that result in healthy habitats, abundant fish and wildlife, thriving sport fishing opportunities, and in, an increased gratitude toward the resources our, our ecosystems can provide. As stated in the May 27, 2020 meeting, Mr. Doro said the area supports, uh, supports present, present and potential economic uses, such as tourism, commercial and recreational fishing, subsistence and traditional uses, diving and other recreational uses that depend on the conservation and management of the areas and resources. I also want to reiterate the point that uh, the additional no fishing regulations were part of this nomination. We look forward to, uh, to the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries working with the California Ocean Protection Council, the California Natural Resource Agency, to get their national marine sanctuaries in California qualified to be included as part of their 30 by 30 efforts to preserving 30% of the ocean waters of California. That being said, we don't believe that there are any new fishing regulations that have been shown to be needed and appreciate Mr. Darrell's recognizing that if issues may arise in the future, that it would be brought to the attention of PFMC, the California Fish and Game Commission, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, for scientific review, assessment, and possibly management if deemed necessary. We hope the National Marine Sanctuaries did not try to trump this process. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Any questions? Looking around the table, I'm not seeing any first, so thanks very much for that. And finally, uh, Jamie Diamond, welcome. There we go. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, and Council Members. Uh, I am Jamie Diamond. I own Stardust Sport Fishing out of Santa Barbara, California, as well as Santa Barbara Landing. We have two sport fishing vessels. Um, and we are ocean access for fishing to this proposed area, to part of it, um, the section that goes from Gaviota through Point Conception to Point Arguello. Uh, there's also numerous fishing communities all along the strip of this proposed area. Uh, Cambria, Avila, Morro Bay, San Luis Obispo, Pismo, Lompoc, and then again down to Gaviota. Um, Many of the communities here that were out, that were there was outreach opportunities, were hinging any support upon the fact that their goal nine within this proposal stated there would be no um, imposition on fishing. They want, they didn't want to impose on fishing whatsoever. It says specifically, it's already been read a few times, but the proposed sanctuary shall have no impact on treaty fishing rights and impose no future regulations upon commercial or recreational fishing. I know this has been stated numerous times, but it's incredibly important to understand that the support of this was hinging on that fact. Um, fisheries management needs to be managed by the managers and you are those people. Um, and it's very concerning to hear the comments that were made. I had a statement that I already submitted, but I'm changing it because based off of what we heard in the presentation, it's very concerning the, to hear the gentleman say, well, you know, we would bring it to you, but then if you decided you didn't want to act on it, we could still kind of do it. Being in this specific area um, where the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary is, where they already imposed additional MPAs in addition to the federal MPAs, the thought of having even more closed areas is um, is terrifying. <laughs> um, we are already under such scrutiny and so much management in that area that the thought of adding it is is it, it 
it's very unnerving. Um, I believe that I, I, I believe in the idea of the Chumash heritage site. I get the honor and privilege of living in this area where the indigenous people, the Chumash tribes lived long before I ever came here. And so I believe that we need to preserve, um, the architect, the, archaeological findings that have been found there. I believe there is a need for that and don't want to dismiss that. However, I do believe fishing access is incredibly important to this area um, and and that it should be done by you, the, the people who have been charged with managing fisheries um, between the state and the federal government, between the department and you, um, and that's where it needs to stay. I ask that you would not adopt or recommend any special regulations for this project now, um, defer any action until after the designation is finalized, and finally continue to manage this area as it is already being managed without any additional regulation. It needs to be very, very clear that the council gets final say in the fisheries management of these waters. We cannot afford any more MPAs in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Any questions? For Jamie, Butch, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Diamond, for your testimony. And and that's kind of what I was getting at. I, I think I hear support for the reserve, um, but I but I'm myself having a hard time with. Oh, by the way, but if we see an issue, we're going to come to you, um, or or make recommendations and. And so um, I have those same fears being from a fishing community that was, you know, proposed by us. And so anyway, I appreciate you clarifying that and, and, and um, the gentleman before you, I, I, I think that um, I'm hearing what you're saying and, and, and I'm agreeing with what you're saying. And I think we have enough checks and balances already uh, for fishing regulations that, um, that, that, that language is kind of, troublesome to me also. So thank you for your coming up and testifying today. Thank you. Okay. Further questions? <clears throat> All right, I'm not seeing any, so thank you very much, Jamie. That concludes our public comment and should take us to council discussion on the comments and just a note, we had quite a bit of uh, discussion and interchange on the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. Um, so if there's any discussion around that, we, we can do that. Um, if there's specific action regarding uh, future council work on that, that would be more appropriate for our workload planning. But uh, at this time, I'll open the floor to discussion on any of the items we've heard. Looking for any hands, Mark. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, you know, I do think this is something that we need to return to in a more fulsome, noticed way. Um, hopefully, for the November Council meeting, um, I think there's some interesting topics raised here and some issues flagged. But um, I think it's more appropriate for a noticed agenda item. All right. Thank you. Further discussion. I'm not seeing any, so, oh, excuse me, Virgil Moore. Mr. Chairman, that suggestion for a noticed agenda item, does that get us within their 120 days to get comments in? Thank you. Um, I'm going to look to our executive director for response. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. So we received the original letter from uh, Mr. Bill Duros in early August. And uh, if I do the math correctly, I believe that November meeting does get us within the 120 day period. Okay, thank you. Further questions? Not seeing any hands. So I believe that concludes this agenda item and we will close that and move on to C1. I'm not, is there any desire to take a brief break here? Yes, there is. So we will break for 10 minutes.
One minute, one minute warning. <laughs> Council members can take their seats and we'll be ready to proceed. All right, thank you. Let's go ahead and get started on administrative item C1, research and data needs, and I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. John DeVore to introduce this to us. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. Agenda item C1 uh, pertains to uh, research and data needs. And um, what we're uh, trying to do here is uh, get some uh, guidance before uh, next year's process to um, update uh, the new database that has research and data needs projects listed with their priorities and other information uh, for each of those projects. So um, the last time uh, you um, received a briefing on the development of the research and data needs database was in April of 2021. And in the situation summary, you'll see a hyperlink to uh, the briefing document that was provided at that meeting. Um, and at that meeting, um, the council did provide guidance, uh, one, to include a habitat category to the research focus field in the database, uh, two, capture all future advisory body priority recommendations in the database, and three, use the priority ranking system recommended by the SSC and specifically the uh, ranking categories that they recommend, recommended and that have been uh, implemented in the new database were uh, listing those projects that are high urgent, high, and then all others unranked. <clears throat> so um, there's, as, as you see in the situation summary, most of those structural changes have been made and I have an update to uh, the information uh, in the situation summary, and that is um, uh, the, the change to uh, create fields for all advisory bodies, including our advisory, advisory subpanels to offer their priority recommendations directly through the database. Um, we have had subsequent discussions with the contractor hired by the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission to uh, develop this database in concert with the development team and um, they've already begun implementing that structural change. And so I'm, I'm not sure if it's available yet, but they, they said that it will be uh, certainly available by the end of the year, if not um, sooner. Um, in uh, preparation for uh, this meeting, um, Ms. Misha Key, who is under contract with the council has produced a video that explains the structure of the database and um, how to navigate the database and, and, and and, uh, and in that video, um, she addressed um, an alternative to creating a habitat category to the research focus field, um, e explaining that, you know, there, there are keywords and other ways where you can easily sort out the habitat projects. Um, I hope everybody has uh, viewed that video, but and certainly if there are further questions, uh, Ms. Misha Key is available online uh, to answer those questions. And, uh, and and provide a, a deeper understanding of uh, what uh, how the database is uh, used and how it's structured currently. Um, we are uh, recommending uh, one bit of guidance uh, today um, to help us uh, uh, 
uh, prepare for next year's uh, process of uh, bringing new projects into the debate database and starting the prioritization process, which we've talked about a lot in the past and certainly able to, uh, uh, to do. And that is um, how new projects are uh, brought into the database. Uh, the, the recommendation that was brought into this meeting is, is that uh, as curators of the database, the, um, all projects should be uh, referred to the SSC and, um, and they can um, uh, input those projects into the database. And, and the reason that we want uh, the SSC to have that sort of uh, initial control is one of the issues that uh, Ms. Key highlighted in her video is there are a number of records that are apparent duplicates um, in, in the database. And um, as you'll see in the SSC report, uh, they are willing to go in there and reconcile those duplicates uh, one way or the other. And I won't go into the details there. That's more appropriate to ask the SSC when they provide their report. And they also um, are recommending a process uh, for receiving new projects next year to um, uh, be considered for the database. And so we're, we're asking for that uh, bit of control with the SSC to avoid uh, duplicate records um, going forward, just because that can be confusing when you're trying to prioritize uh, individual projects. So, um, so that's really the, the one bit of uh, guidance that we're seeking here from the council is, is whether the SSC's uh, uh, recommended process for receiving new projects is amenable to the council. And, um, and then any other last minute details that uh, you would like uh, to see in the database in preparation for next year's process of uh, determining priorities for uh, new and existing research and data needs. Um, so uh, with that, we, we do have uh, a few supplemental reports. Uh, I mentioned already that the SSC has a supplemental report with their recommendations here. Uh, in addition, we have um, a report from the salmon technical team, one from the Gro ground fish advisory sub panel, and another one from the habitat committee. And let me just double check my records to make sure none, uh, no other new ones have come in uh, since I uh, last queried. I believe those are the, the four supplemental reports that are available for your uh, uh, consideration. And um, I might uh, recommend that uh, before we go to advisory body reports, um, that this could be an opportunity for, uh, for you to either now or when you get into the council guidance um, uh, part of the um, this agenda item, uh, opportunity to ask Ms. Misha Key uh, um, questions about the database and how to navigate it. And um, I'm presuming that you all did your homework and saw the video. So we're, we're, we're um, anticipating there may be some further questions that Ms. Key could uh, answer. So um, if there are, um, now's an opportunity. And if questions come up later, certainly you'll have that opportunity um, when you get to council guidance. All right, thank you, John. So as we proceed here, as John mentioned, the uh, video was in the, uh, the link to the video in the situation summary. And um, I don't know if others did, I did a little searching and paused the video and I saw the web address that Ms. Key was using. And so I typed that in and you can go in and experiment with the database yourself a little bit and uh, and test run that if you want. So um, with John's suggestion there, maybe initially since uh, Ms. Misha Key is, is online with us, if there are any questions about the database, the presentation she had, let's cover those first before going to our advisory body report. So any, any questions for Misha and not seeing any hands right now. There may be some that come up later. So we will proceed then first with the SSC report and we have Dan Holland online giving that report. Dan, are you out there? I am, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Dan Holland, Chairman of the SSC. Um, I'd like to read into the record uh, 
agenda item C1A, Supplemental SSC Report 1, Science and Stati Scientific and Statistical Committee Report on Research and Data Needs. The SSC was updated by uh, Ms. Misha Key the, of Key Coaching and Development on the ongoing construction of the Research and Data Needs Database. The SSC appreciates the hard work of, Mrs. of Ms. Key and the development team. This database offers many improvements over the current report. Some of the key tasks for the SSC at this stage are one, to determine processes for adding projects and setting the SSC ranking, two, establishing definitions for the ranking categories, three, dealing with duplicates and overlapping projects, uh, and the SSC intends to finish these tasks before the plan 2023 update to the list of research and data needs. The SSC proposes that a JOT form or a similar interface with fields that mirror the format of the database be developed for interested parties to submit project proposals to the Council and SSC. Future discussions can determine how these submissions are reviewed. A process for ranking projects needs to be developed and discussion of this likely needs to be had at both the SSC and SSC subcommittee level. The SSC notes that the ranking of high priority and or high urgent priority quickly becomes watered down if it's overused. The SSC will consider the ranking system used by the North Pacific Fishery Management Council and develop suggested definitions or guidelines for SSC ranking. High and or urgent rankings were noted by many SSC members as being helpful for procuring funding for new and ongoing projects and the SSC considers it important to explore ways to communicate which ongoing projects are critical for fisheries management in addition to encouraging needed new projects. Ms. Key has cataloged current research and data needs projects that appear to be duplicates or are closely related to other entries. The SSC agrees that the appropriate SSC subcommittees could review these related projects before the end of the year and either combine duplicates uh, into one entry or add explanations to differentiate between the apparently similar or overlapping projects. That concludes the SSC statement. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Dan. Any questions for Dan on the SSC report? Looking around the table, I'm not seeing any questions. So we will move on then to the STT report one. And Mike, I believe we have Mike O'Farrell online giving that report. Yes, I'm here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll be referring to agenda item C1A, supplemental STT report one. Uh, the STT was briefed on the research and data needs topic at their September 7th meeting. The STT supports changing the structure of the database to a new design that will help improve navigation and help identify and prioritize projects. The STT supports maintaining the status quo of every five years for review frequency with the understanding that the Council Operating Procedure 12 does allow for out-of-cycle reviews if needed. Workload concerns and multi-agency coordination, including timing and schedules, are two challenges that may hinder multi-party collaboration if reviews were required to occur more frequently. The STT supports a process for determining priorities that is informed by the advisory bodies and management teams for their specific fishery management plans, as well as the scientific and statistical committee. The advisory bodies and management teams should be allowed to access the database so they can provide input on workflow and prioritization of topics. And that concludes our statement. Okay, thank you, Mike. Any questions for Mike on that report? Not seeing any hands on that, so thank you, Mike. And we will move on to the GAP report, and we have Merritt McRae here to give that report. Merritt, welcome. Good morning, Vice Chair Hassamer, Council Members. I'm Merritt McRae for the Groundfish Advisory Subpanel. And I'll be re uh, reading from agenda item C1A, Supplemental GAP Report 1, on the, the Groundfish Advisory Panel Report on Research and Data Needs. The Groundfish Advisory Subpanel reviewed the Scientific and Statistical Committee's report and other documents under this agenda item and offers the following comments and recommendations. 
In general, the GAP supports the effort to revise the protocols for research and data pri prioritization, as well as the effort to update the database to make it more efficient and user-friendly. The GAP also supports specific prior fisheries management council guidance to one, include a habitat category to the research, research focus field in the database, two, capture all future advisory body priority recommendations in the database, and three, use the priority ranking system recommended by the SSC. Prioritizing key research and data needs that can inform, can inform better management choices is critical for the continued evolution of profitable and sustainable fisheries on the West Coast. With regard to the SSC recommendations, the GAP agrees that developing a simple, excuse me, a simple way for interested parties to submit projected project proposals to the council and SSC would be an important improvement. The GAP also supports SSC efforts to develop an efficient and informative, informative ranking system. The GAP supports this effort to make the research and data needs of the council and fisheries managers more accessible to the broader research community so that they might be able to include these council priorities as supporting rationale for project proposals. It could serve as a fundamental guide to their selection of research topics. And that concludes our GAP report and I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Merritt. Uh, questions for Merritt? Not seeing any, so thanks again. Thank you. And that takes us to the last advisory body report. There's a habitat committee report, and I believe Corey Green is giving that um, online. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Members of the council, I'll be reading agenda item C1A, supplemental habitat committee report one. The habitat committee commends the effort involved in creating this very helpful and organized database. Is it exciting to see this tool available to document and guide research priorities? The HC recommends scheduling a yearly review of this document. The HC appreciates the effort to incorporate our concerns to date. After review of the database, we have the following suggestions to improve clarity for accessing habitat research priorities and data needs. There should be a separate habitat topic under the research focus category. If not a separate category, the topic under research focus could be called habitat and ecosystem, since there is a lot of overlap between these topics. The HC considers all the habitat issues that are currently under council action to be research topics and should be placed under the research focus heading. For example, the role of deep sea coral and sponges as habitat for managed species is a research topic, not a council action. This would be important so that external researchers looking to understand council's priorities for habitat research would be able to easily find these topics. We note that searches on habitat under different categories turn up different counts of unique records. By putting a habitat topic under the research focus heading, the full suite of habitat topics would be included. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Any questions for Corey? And not seeing any hands, that concludes our advisory body reports. And we will move to public comment. And I see we have no public comment, uh, no signups for public comment. So that will take us to council action here. On the screen before you, you see uh, our council action items, approve a new format for the database. Uh, that uh, the format was changed following uh, direction given by the council in April 2021, and that's been accomplished, and then approve a process for updating the database and communicating priorities. So I will open the floor at this time for a council discussion on this topic. And Looking for a hand to start that discussion. Frank. I think this is a question for John, or and and, it, and it's getting kind of at um, one of the um, statements in the the very first part of the sit sum. You know that these are areas of research that are necessary for management purposes. 
and, and looking at the fields of the database, I think this is important, by the way. I mean, trying to identify where these research areas are going to help us manage uh, better. And, and, and it seems to me that column in the database, I, sorry, I just turned to another document so I don't have it in front of me, but basically says like council action, is that where it will be kind of specified how it will be used and why it's important? Uh, through the through the vice chair, um, uh, Frank. Yes, the related council action is the field, and and that's that's the intended place to e explain how the results from a, a research project uh, could inform a council action. Frank. Yes, and just kind of a follow up to that. So that discussion seems to me very important. Is that is that something that the SSC kind of reviews and kind of. Or is it just kind of go in there and and then it goes this the ranking of I'm, I'm sorry I've already forgotten the rankings the high important ultra important whatever they are it, it is is that where that discussion continues on how important this research is to council management John. Uh, I anticipate the project to work, um, assuming that you agree with the SSC's recommendation on how to get new projects into the database using a JOT form or a similar application, that that would be one of the fields that would be in that JOT form. And so the proponent um, would offer how uh, research results of a proposed project could inform council action. But, you know, I, I, I also... Um, anticipate a process where the SSC reviews all of that and if there's some sort of dispute about whether that's really the correct counts related council action or whatnot I, I, I suppose they could um, make that change in the database and and you know clearly if this becomes an issue this is something that could get resolved when the council meets in session on research and data needs because you know, at some point, um, I don't know if it'll be one or more meetings next year, but, um, you know, to get the council's priorities after everybody has put their priority recommendations in there, um, if there's some uncertainty about the related council action or any other um, uh, bit of metadata that's in that uh, database, that could get resolved then. Okay, thanks. Further discussion? or thoughts on the database. I think we're looking for a council action though and, and preferably through motion to adopt the structure that's been presented to us through the video, the structure of the database. Unless people feel we're not ready to do that. Heather. Oh, Heather, thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I just want to, maybe this is a question for Misha but, Misha, but I just want to acknowledge the comments from the GAP and the Habitat Committee for creating a habitat category to the research focus field and wonder if that's an option or how to provide guidance on that or maybe hear more about that. Uh, thank you, John. I'll go to you first. Yeah, and, and in fact, um, uh, Misha's video explains uh, a workaround for um, easily selecting the, the habitat projects that are there. Um, she's uh, um, uh, put in some keywords for each research project so that that can easily be returned, uh, you know, so that when you query the database using the search uh, feature, um, all of the habitat projects come up. And in fact, if you want a further explanation, it probably would be uh, useful to uh, have Misha explain that. But, um, you know, her video, she, she does have a portion of the video where she speaks directly to that. You know, clearly we could add a habitat um, into the research focus field, but, um, you know, according to the video and the search features there, um, it, it's not necessarily, uh, it's not necessary. You can, you can easily search the database for habitat related projects, but if the council feels differently, we can make that structural change. Thank you. And I, I do appreciate that. I was, um, looking specifically at the habitat committee's report and comment that, you know, rather than searching for habitat items, it might be worth 
having a category. So that was just where I was headed. Thanks. John? It, it may be helpful to hear from Misha on that. Um, I, I did uh, send her the Habitat Committee report, and um, and so I know she's done some thinking about it, and she's certainly the most knowledgeable about the database. Thank you. Misha, if you're online, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. All right. I had to find my mute button. Um, first, just a little background. I just want to say that, you know, we we did have a discussion about how habitat is included in ecosystem, just like we, for the research focus, we had social sciences. We didn't separate it into economics and other social sciences. We just combined it into social sciences. The research focus tab was originally the intent was to show where in which chapter of the document that the task came from. So habitat is in the ecosystem, um, but if you do just search in the top right corner habitat, all the habitat records come up, no matter which FMP it actually came from. And I did a little bit of research prior to this call reading their um, <clears throat> their statement. And quite honestly, if you um, do look up um, ecosystem in the research focus, there's only one habitat item in that ecosystem project. There's a lot of overlap with the other um, FMPs, the salmon, the CPS, the groundfish. Groundfish actually had the most habitat related. So um, in my experience in working with the database, all of the habitat stuff comes up if you search habitat. If you just put in that one word, uh, there's 29 records. They come up of habitat issues or habitat related topics. Okay, thank you, Misha. Heather, does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Thank you, Misha. I appreciate you looking into that specifically um, with regard to the habitat committee's report. Thank you. You're welcome, Heather, thanks. Any further <coughs> discussion or recommendations on to move forward, Bob? Thank you, Pete. This might be a pretty low quality uh, question, but is there a link, a direct link in our in the website to connect to that that I can easily find so that it appears and I can manipulate it, so to speak? But uh, I. I I get it through your video or through the links that are in the in the briefing book, but in the future, where do I find it in the website? Thank you. John, I'll turn to you. Um, thank you uh, through the vice chair, um, Bob. You know, not currently, there's not uh, a link on our website, but we do anticipate very soon putting a link on the website so that people can go in and start exploring. In fact, I, I don't really see a reason that we couldn't do that sooner rather than later, even though some of the structural changes like getting all the advisory body fields in there um, have yet to be made or they're being implemented now. Um, however, if folks just want to go in and, and, you know, kind of explore the database and check it out and um, they're not going to be able to make entries yet. Um, I, I personally don't see a reason why that couldn't be done. And as uh, Mr. Hassemer pointed out when he reviewed the video, there is a, a link in the video to the database. So there's a workaround there, but if you wanna make it more transparent, you know, assuming that uh, Executive Director Burden and, and, uh, and folks that uh, sign my paychecks agree with that, um, I don't see a reason why we couldn't put that link in sooner. Thank you. I, mean, I think it would be worthwhile just to be able to navigate it and get some familiarity with it. So when it does come to bear in our, in our discussions, we can readily access it and see what people are referring to and how it might relate. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Further discussion or action? John North. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, I, I had uh, similar questions to the previous discussion about the uh, recommendation to have a research field and 
and and that discussion was helpful. I was just curious how how hard would it be to make that change structurally um, in the database? Because I think two of the reports spoke to that as an improvement. But, uh, John. Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, Mr. North. I, I, I don't believe it's that hard a, a structural change to make to add that. Um, the bigger bit of work would be, um, you know, asking someone, presumably um, Ms. Misha Key, to um, link all of the habitat projects to, you know, that research focus um, item. Um, and you know, I don't know what the budget realities are in, in that regard, but um, you know, I, I think we, it could be done if if that's considered a, a useful adjunct. If the uh, uh, the queries uh, feature that's in the database now is 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 not uh, the preferred way to search out habitat projects, you know, we could certainly do it that way. Thanks, John. Oh, all right, I'm not seeing any more hands. We still have the action before us. We have the, again, the format or structure of the database that is as uh, presented in the video and, and followed the prior direction of the council, whether or not uh, we want to approve that. And then the process for updating the SSC in their report identified what could be done, um, a, a process to develop the JOT form, and then the uh, new research projects could be entered that way. So any, anybody want to step out and uh, recommend the next step for this or? Corey. If it's appropriate, I'm, I'm happy to make a motion. We're ready, right. I think. Thank you. <laughs> I move that the council approve the new format for the research and data needs database. <laughs> and we can wait a minute for that to show up before I ask for the second. So that reads as you intended. It does, thank you. Thank you, is there a second? Thank you, Butch Smith uh, seconds that. Do you wanna to speak to the motion? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Misha for her excellent video. Um, and the excellent work updating the database. Um, I think this format will be useful for everyone who's interested in this, easier to use by stakeholders, um, easier for potential researchers to access and understand what the council is interested in and look forward to the prioritization process in the future. Thank you. Any questions for the maker of the motion? I'm seeing any hands, any discussion on the motion? Phil. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I certainly support the motion. I remember this um, topic of research and data needs and reports coming up in the CCC forum here a couple of years ago. And uh, the uh, there was a wide range of approaches that different councils used, and we uh, noted the uh, North Pacific Council and how they had put their document together, and and uh, it seemed to be really a much more streamlined and easier to use than some of the things that we had done in the past. And so I just think this is a, a, a great move forward for us in terms of how we're organizing uh, and thinking about research and data needs in that database and linking it to um, linking those projects to how we can improve our management. And uh, so I just, I think it's a big improvement. Support the motion, thanks. Thank you. Any other discussion? 
And not seeing any hands, so I will call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Abstentions. And the motion passes unanimously. So thank you, Corey. And with that, I'm gonna to turn to John on the second item since the input process for new getting new projects in there is, is still under development. Is there anything further the council needs to do there or do you have enough um, direction to proceed on that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. It would be helpful to just get explicit guidance um, to, uh, I, I would presume, follow the SSC's recommendation to create a JOT form and, and, and um, that seems like a pretty efficient way to consider new projects for the database. So, uh, you know, whether it requires a, a notion, a motion or a, or a head nod from everyone that, that that's a, an acceptable process going forward, it'd be helpful to get that guidance. All right, since that uh, we're looking for guidance, um, I'll, I'll look elsewhere for confirmation, but I assume we don't need a motion for that, but just uh, someone confirming or the council confirming to follow the SSC's recommendations on developing that uh, input format for the database and to continue developing uh, their ranking system. So. Is there agreement with that, uh, Heather? Yeah, I, I was just gonna thank you, Vice Chair, just formally acknowledge that I think the SSC laid out um, the steps they need to take and that was supported in the GAP report. And so I, I think that's the right way to go. Thank you. All right, Frank? And just agree uh, and then go just uh, maybe ask John the process for ranking projects. What is the plan? I agree with that as well. And what is the plan for that to happen? John. Okay, through the vice chair, uh, Mr. Lockhart. Um, we've already implemented the ranking system that the SSC had recommended last year and that the council uh, agreed with of those three categories, high urgent, high, and all others unranked. Um, what the SSC uh, intends to do is to um, provide a a bit more clarity and definition, um, perhaps through the JOT form or in the database to explain, um, to qualify what differentiates a high urgent from a high priority project. So, um, and you, you saw their, uh, their strong recommendation to not overuse those categories. Um, and so just to be a little more helpful for folks who are um, intending to prioritize uh, projects that are um, in the database, uh, they're going to provide a little explanation of, you know, that differentiation between high urgent and high um, projects relative to those that are unranked. Obviously, if they're in the database, they're all important, but um, they thought that would be a helpful bit of guidance for uh, advisory bodies, management teams, and the council itself. All right, thanks. <clears throat> any other comments? Um, not seeing any hands right now, so I'm gonna lean on John again, just to ask if you've got enough to proceed with this, um, if the council needs to take uh, any other action before we close. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I believe you've completed all the action. Uh, we have, um, you've agreed with the, the new format of the database. You've um, agreed with the SSC's recommendations and process for getting new projects in the database next year. Um, the only other action not contemplated under this agenda item, but something to think about in future workload planning is, is um, and not necessarily at this meeting either, is to start thinking about when you want to schedule council action for deciding priorities for new and existing projects next year. All right, thank you. With that, that closes this agenda item. So I am going to move the gavel back one space to my right. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Hassemer. You've done an excellent job. We are your first time on the gavel. Um, we'll now move to the next agenda item, C2, and I will pass the gavel to Vice Chair Brad Pettinger. All right. Thank you, Chair Grolnick. And um, see you, Jim is in his seat. So, uh, Jim, take us away. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, the uh, council action under this agenda item is to review the NIMS draft equity and environmental justice strategy and decide whether it would like to uh, provide comments. Um, at the June meeting, the council received a preliminary uh, rec uh, presentation on this policy from Sam Rauch. And at this meeting, you have uh, Abby Harley and uh, Abigail Harley and Stacy Miller uh, uh, online that will be giving a, a more a detailed presentation. Uh, this this team, along with uh, Taylor uh, Dibovich, uh, also uh, provided a presentation for all advisory bodies on August 19th. Uh, so the ABs have been uh, briefed on this, and. Uh, it, Coming from those uh, those AB reviews, you have one report uh, from the EAS that is in your briefing materials. Um, there is also one public comment for you to, uh, to take a look at from Ocean Conservancy. In anticipation of this uh, agenda item, we looked at uh, the other letters that have been written, or letters that have been written by other councils on this topic. Uh, so far, five of the eight councils have submitted letters, and I know at least one more uh, of the council either has recently submitted or plans to submit a letter. I'd just like to briefly go over some of the themes that we uh, see in those letters. Uh, first, uh, all, virtually all the councils have so far supported the three uh, EEJ goals and, and six corresponding objectives. In particular, excuse me, in particular, uh, they have emphasized objectives related to inclusive governments, conducting outreach and engagement equitably, and research and monitoring. Another theme is, uh, is an emphasized barrier, and that is a general uh, lack of awareness of who the underserved community, uh, communities are in a number of the council regions um, and the need for information to help councils identify and, and then subsequently reach out to them. Another theme is concern over the funding uh, and staffing uh, that would be required to uh, implement the uh, strategies at the council level and requests that uh, NIMS work with the councils in developing the regional implementation plans, which are uh, expected as the step that would follow the finalization of the national strategy. A few of the councils got uh, into a little bit more detail, um, and I thought I'd just highlight a few of the uh, comments uh, from New England Council. Uh, they mentioned that uh, they observed that uh, the outreach and engagement uh, that is looked for under EEJ uh, may be challenging uh, in uh, when there's strict management timelines that have to be followed. Uh, in particular, you know, one of the vehicles is doing translations of documents uh, and the time required to do those translations, particularly with technical documents, sometimes can be fairly extensive. Uh, another observation was that under um, the topic of inclusive government governance, there were a number of actions listed, but the, there were none of the actions listed related to uh, councils and that should be uh, uh, taken into account. Uh, West Pacific Fishery Management Council mentioned uh, that the EEJ uh, principles uh, maybe should be incorporated within the uh, technical guidance on the application of, of national standards. Uh, New England Council also uh, mentioned that they thought a few of the statements regarding uh, what's currently going on with respect to um, communities that were disproportionately impacted and, and the lack of uh, 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 proportional representative on councils and ABs, they, they questioned uh, uh, the data that were available to, uh, whether the data were available to, to reach those conclusions. So that, uh, that's kind of an overview of what the other councils have been uh, thinking about as they've uh, reviewed this policy. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that in addition to uh, deciding whether you want to make any comments yourself on this at this time, um, you also might want to think about uh, what happens in the next steps here. Uh, so after the uh, policy is finalized, then the idea is that these regional plans will be developed and uh, the question is, how will those, what will the council role in the development of those regional plans be? And do you need to agendize something for a future meeting um, to talk about that process, to talk about those regional processes and your participation in them? 
And uh, if so, would it be best to do that, uh, for example, in November or, or next uh, March or April? Uh, and you may um, understand NIMS is ready to have some discussion with you about that topic. Mr. Vice Chairman, that completes an overview. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, questions for Jim on his overview? Okay, seeing none, we'll, uh, we'll go to the, uh, the NIPS report. And um, I'm not sure which person, is going to be Abigail or Stacy or Taylor? Who do we have? Hi, uh, Ab Abigail's here. You got, can you all hear me? We do. Welcome, Abigail. Awesome. I wish I was there with you in person, but it's great to be here virtually. And thank you so much for having us. So I'm Abigail Harley. I'm an economist for the West Coast Regional Office. Uh, I'm also the chair of the national working group that put this draft strategy together. Uh, and then, yeah, also <laughs> Taylor Devevic and Stacey Miller have been helping me from the West Coast region. And um, we were with me when we presented to the advisory body a couple of weeks ago. So with that, we can go to the overview next slide. So this is why we're here and what we're going to share today. Some of this you saw from Sam, so I'll try to go through that fairly quickly um, and then focus a little more detail on what the content of the strategy is and what the next steps are. Uh, so I wanted to flag first and foremost that um, uh, our assistant administrator, Janet Coit, extended the comment period to the end of September. So um, everybody listening today still has a chance to send in their own feedback using the link on this slide or, you know, just Google <laughs> NIMS draft EEJ strategy in the uh, page to come up with the form. Uh, and we would love to hear from everybody. And, you know, uh, also we're of course, interested in ongoing feedback from all of our council and other partners after, after that date. Um, so Sam Rauch provided an overview of the draft E strategy to all of you during the June 2022 meeting. Uh, and so today I'm gonna focus a little bit on the development of the strategy, the content, and some things for your consideration. Like Jim said, we've gotten some great feedback um, around the country from, I think, pretty much every other fisheries management council. Uh, and we look forward to continuing partnerships with the councils to improve access and equity at the regional levels, um, as well as through the uh, council coordinating committee. So in the next slide, uh, there's just a quick reminder of kind of where we are in this process. Uh, so this has been a multi-year iterative process. We've had lots of opportunities for uh, community input and feedback. So in November 2021, we started with early input um, before we had really words on paper with federally and non-federally recognized tribes as well as people who lived in territories and other indigenous communities. Uh, and then since May, we've been in this pub other just broader public feedback. Um, we've done four national webinars and a slew of community meetings uh, all over the country with a, a special focus on our um, territory communities. And um, the public comment again it will end on September 30th. And then the national work group is looking to incorporate comments received over the fall. And we're really hoping to finalize sometime early 2023 so that uh, regions will be able to sort of take this national strategy and direction and make it their own at the regional level through some sort of regional implementation plan. Uh, headquarters is giving a overview of equity and environmental justice to new council members at their training in October. Uh, and that's something that we're hoping to continue uh, on an ongoing basis, annual basis. And then we're, I think we're also on the October CCC agenda. Uh, and then we're also going to present at the November state directors meeting. So we're lots of opportunities to work with our partners on this. Uh, on the next slide, there's some things to think about. So um, what underserved communities does the Pacific Fisheries Management Council work with? Uh, what considerations might be specific to the Pacific Fisheries Management Council and our fisheries, you know, sort of separate from what's going on in the national scene? Uh, and then are there draft aspects of, aspects of the draft strategy that stand out as being particularly important for um, the Pacific Coast communities? And then just generally, how can we be more inclusive throughout the fisheries decision-making process? So um, just things to think about as you reflect on what you read in the strategy or, or here today. Uh, so 
On the next slide, uh, there again, this is a reminder, hopefully, of what Sam talked about. We've uh, been talking about equity environmental justice as an agency for quite some time since the 90s. But we've sort of had a renewed focus with these two uh, new executive orders under this administration. Uh, on the next slide, there's a definition of equity. So here we're really aiming for the consistent, systematic, fair, just, impartial treatment of all individuals, including individuals who belong to underserved communities that have been denied such treatment. Uh, the next slide is the environmental justice. So again, we're looking for fair treatment, meaningful involvement of all people uh, and on environmental laws, regulations, policies, including but not limited to. Um, and I'll highlight here, equitable access to the decision-making process and equitable opportunity for disadvantaged communities. And the last one is, so what kind of communities are we talking about? So there's a long list of communities that have been systematically denied a full opportunity to participate in aspects of economic, social, and civic life. Uh, there's a lot of screening tools out there. I pulled this from, um, I think it was from the CDC, just a, a map of environmental justice index community rankings for um, some of our coastal communities here in Oregon, Northern California. So, um, there's, there's a lot of different uh, metrics by which we can assess whether or not communities um, might be not have access to full opportunities. Uh, okay, on the next slide, a little bit more specific, so NIMS mandates and things that we think about um, with regards to equity and environmental justice uh, with sort of a West Coast focus here. So we have um, the Magnuson-Stevens Act, and there's um, potential ties to equity, environmental justice, and national standards one, four, and eight. Uh, there's also references to marine education and training programs, which are a really important concept for expanding access to the decision-making process and helping people understand how that process works and how the science that supports that process works. Uh, and then there's also some references to our specific communities. Uh, in Appendix 1 of the document, I should say, we discuss all of our mandates uh, in, in some detail and uh, the role to expand out our consideration of equity and environmental justice in our work under those mandates. We have a lot of general, broad, open-ended language in things like the MSA that we can use as a basis for policy goals, like focusing efforts on expanding equity and environmental justice. So in particular, there's also places that call for developing new job opportunities, promoting technical assistance, education, training programs, research, uh, and assistance programs. So NIMS headquarters leadership is looking to utilize these general provisions as a basis for specifically supporting and encouraging equity and environmental justice in our mission work. Uh, and I'll just note too, so through MSA, ESA, MMPA, NEPA, there's, well, mostly, maybe not so much NEPA, but there's references to specific communities outside of our region, um, including the territories and Alaska Native communities. Uh, on the next slide, I think Sam again talked about this, but I'll just, it's a good refresher for everyone. So like, why, why are we focusing on this and, and why does it matter? And what are the issues that we're trying to solve here? And so one of the biggest barriers and this has come up in some of the council feedback we've gotten around the country is just an unawareness of underserved communities. So um, we have not fully identified underserved communities that are impacted by our work. We don't have a lot of demographic information about um, permit holders or uh, even, you know, people participating in uh, fishing shoreside. Um, so beyond, you know, beyond catcher vessels. So who's impacted by our work and this oversight affects who might be considered our stakeholders, um, what research and monitoring the agency conducts is tailored for and who uh, might be aware of or receive services. So without recognition of our underserved communities, their needs can't be documented or addressed. Uh, we recognize that there's structural barriers. So there might be laws, regulations, and policies that prevent equitable access to no fishery services. For example, criteria on the allocation of resources might be based on historical ownership, um, creating services for the largest number of people, generating the greatest net benefits, or prioritizing commercial segments of the fishery relative to others. Um, and that might exclude minority and territorial communities, uh, as well as non-commercial fisheries and food systems. So there might be barriers to accessing our services, uh, and this could be language differences or just difficulty coming to a meeting because of travel costs or venues or times. Um, I'm sure there's uh, people in this room or people in the room or people listening in who 
might have come to a council meeting to testify on an issue that's important to them and it gets moved to the next day or two days later. And it can be really challenging to participate in the process um, for some people at some time. So thinking through some of that um, service accessibility. The systems are complex. Um, federal services can inhibit inclusion of stakeholders, especially those who have not previously received such services. Um, benefit application systems might be difficult to navigate and require special knowledge. And I'm sure anyone who's ever applied for a federal grant um, can relate to that. We have gaps in expertise in our own workforce. So our ability to identify, characterize, and serve communities equitably requires prioritizing social science research as well as education outreach. And as an agency, we don't really have a ton of staff uh, that are working on that. Uh, we also don't have staff geographically located and with the cultural language literacy needed to engage in a lot of the communities that we serve. Uh, and then finally, gaps in representation. So um, all the communities we serve might not be well represented in our workforce, and that might lead to uh, an unintentional lack of awareness uh, and gaps in perspective for our workforce. So staff may unconsciously prioritize their own communities because of the familiarity or easy access or pre-existing communication paths. So what, what are we going to do about all these problems? So on the next slide, uh, our draft strategy here is a framework to incorporate equity environmental justice into daily activities. Uh, this requires a step-down implementation plan at the regional level, uh, we want to address the barriers that I just covered, and we want to promote equity in all that we do. And no fisheries in the, under this administration have a renewed focus on meaningful engagement with underserved communities. And we're really looking forward to continuing efforts and partnerships uh, to more directly involve underserved or underrepresented groups in our decision making process. So on the next slide, like Jim mentioned, we have three goals, um, and then uh, we have these objectives that are sort of the core of the strategy. So I want to get into a little bit more detail here, since I don't think Sam um, really gave much of an overview of this part, since his presentation was more high level. So we have uh, six objectives, and kind of the the one that's underpinning the other five is is creating an empowering environment. So we want to um, provide consistency in the development of our regional or programmatic plans. Um, and so these objectives are hopefully gonna underpin the, the different regional approaches. Uh, and we, under each of these in the, in the draft strategy, you'll find guiding questions. Uh, and I'll, I have a highlight you know, example question or two under each of the following slides where I get into more detail on the objectives. But if there's something you wanna read more about or you're looking for more information on, I really encourage you to go back to that draft strategy and uh, look more at these questions as, as sort of food for thought there. But for all of you today, uh, get, thinking about what feedback to offer on the strategy, like are these the right objectives? Are we missing anything? And are we asking the right questions as we develop move into re developing a you know Pacific Coast focused regional implementation plan. And yeah, again, check out the strategy. So um, on the next slide, we have the empowering environment. And this is a, a sort of an internal workforce focus one for NIMS. So uh, I won't get into quite as much detail here, but generally the idea is that we wanna provide institutional support like training and resources that are needed to implement uh, equity environmental justice approaches at NOAA Fisheries. So a big part of this is just having our internal leadership and management uh, continue to identify equity environmental justice as a priority and to encourage staff to um, take equity environmental justice into account throughout all the aspects of our work. So the next one, again, this is a little bit more internally focused. Um, we want to ensure that our NIMS policies promote equal opportunities for all and do not create unintended inequities or unequal burdens for underserved communities. And the way this might impact the council is uh, there are, uh, you know, quite a few NIMS policies that drive council review or council action or council reports. Uh, so things like um, catch share program reviews or allocation reviews as NIMS starts to think about ways that we can incorporate considerations of equity into those policy documents, um, they might sort of trickle down into council consideration. Uh, research and monitoring. So um, this, is, this is a big one, and this is something I think that 
inter impacts and intersects with the council quite a bit. So um, first of all, are we identifying the right underserved communities and are we addressing their needs? Uh, and are we adequately assessing the impacts of our management decisions uh, on the on underserved communities, or do we require more research or different types of research um, to do better assessment of impacts? So, one question here is: How can NOAA Fisheries expand the involvement of members of underserved communities in research and monitoring projects? And then, how will NOAA Fisheries more equitably allocate research and monitoring resources to identify and characterize underserved communities, uh, understand their needs? and guide management decisions that affect them. Uh, and so just acknowledging here, there may be, there may, there may likely be inequities in service, surveys, science, um, both between and within regions. So uh, thinking about expanding our social science research to better identify these communities, uh, as well as the impacts of our research and monitoring and other types of work on those communities. Under outreach and engagement, uh, this is another uh, great objective in the strategy. So we wanna really think about building long-term relationships with underserved communities to better understand their needs, um, incorporate them into the process and improve information sharing with stakeholders. So this could include student education programs, internships, uh, a lot of our communication projects, uh, products to share information and knowledge uh, and have sort of a two-way information sharing with stakeholders and partners. And that's gonna be crucial to our success on this strategy. So NOAA Fisheries can increase coordination and communication with underserved communities through early engagement, prioritizing cultural competency for our staff who are engaging with communities, uh, addressing communication needs like translating, um, and then building communication plans to adapt to emerging needs of the communities that we serve. So the next one, um, equitably distribute benefits. So we want to distribute benefits equitably among stakeholders by increasing access to opportunities for underserved communities. So we want to think through here what barriers do underserved communities face in accessing benefits and opportunities managed by NOAA fisheries. Uh, do you know fisheries benefits equitably ben reach or benefit underserved communities? Can we expand the equity in our delivery? And how can we better serve underserved communities with uh, the data and tools that we provide? So, you know, NOAA is a huge data agency. And so there's a lot of work, not just within fisheries, but across the line offices in terms of making those tools um, more accessible to and in better service of different types of communities. So, Example of, of a type of benefit is um, we're working to incorporate equity environmental justice considerations and criteria into our internal and external competitive funding opportunities. Uh, and then two, we're thinking through how we can better educate and um, do outreach to individuals from underserved communities in terms of helping them access those funding opportunities. Uh, we also have lots of other types of benefits we provide communities. We have direct investment, we have disaster assistance, we have grant opportunities for research, for habitat restoration, for aquaculture, uh, species recovery, and lots of other opportunities. Um, they can also be in the form of data and tools that we um, empower communities to make their own decisions or to better um, communicate to us as through our decision making process. And then um, we also want to think, think through, you know, some of our allocation processes to ensure that equitable distribution of funds and programs for the benefit of underserved communities. Um, and so key challenge here is to recognize and repair inequities to date and as well as identifying new opportunities. The last objective um, is inclusive governance. So uh, this is, I think, huge for the council. How can we enable meaningful involvement of underserved communities in the decision-making process? And do we have the right systems and processes in place uh, to enable that access? So, you know, the council process often leads to federal rulemaking and that's subject to a lot of requirements to ensure transparency um, and opportunities for public participation, like through the council process. Um, but we, I think it's important to think through ways that access might be more limited for some communities. Uh, and so NOAA Fisheries is hoping to increase the diversity of voice through um, public comments, empower community decision making and support cooperative management efforts wherever it's possible. Uh, NOAA works in partnership with councils and uh, advisory bodies 
uh, MAFAC, tribes, Alaska Natives, stakeholders, state and territorial, local government agencies, and lots of other partners to achieve our mission. Um, and we want to increase engagement and representation of underserved communities with, um, with, it, with our partners. Uh, and that's going to be success essential to fulfilling our mission successfully. Uh, there's two other, um, yeah, <laughs> thanks. The equity and environmental justice at the West Coast region. So kind of moving from the national focus strategy to what we're doing. Um, so thinking through uh, the West Coast region, uh, first of all, so yeah, I'm the co-chair of the national group. Stacey Miller is our official West Coast region rep to that group. and. Um, Stacy is, some of you might remember her from, well, Stacey's been around for a long time, but with the, um, I think most recently through fisheries with the Whiting um, Treaty, but she's our um, strategic planning coordinator at the West Coast region now, so she's in a great position to think through how we can, um, as a region, better incorporate equity, environmental justice into our prioritization and planning process. Uh, we have lots of leadership support and a lot of enthusiastic staff across the region. And um, this is something that we're coordinating with uh, both the Northwest and Southwest Fisheries Science Centers on because this is an agency-wide strategy as well as um, the Office of Law Enforcement and um, the like with our habitat restoration projects and, and partners as well. Uh, and hoping to sort of develop an ongoing partnership with Pacific Fisheries Management Council on this uh, effort. Once the equity environmental justice strategy is finalized again, we'll work on how what, what this is going to look like uh, for fisheries on the West Coast region, for NOAA fisheries on the West Coast region, um, and, and again, hoping to solicit priorities and input from the council as we go through that process. Uh, lastly, um, next steps so we'd love your feedback on the draft strategy did we miss anything are there things that could be improved or things we got wrong uh, we also welcome feedback on how the council would like to engage with NIMPS, uh, and the council might want to consider how how you want to engage in equity environmental justice moving forward um, you know both in partnership with NIMPS, but also on your own um, or, or you know with NIMPS at the council so um, as a note the council Coordinating Committee has its own EEJ working group, uh, as some of the other councils have, have decided to kind of start their own council level working groups. So that might be an approach the council could consider um, under move on a moving forward. There's also, um, yeah, these groups are sort of working to better identify the underserved communities they start, that are impacted by the work at a regional level. They're also thinking about how to improve equitable access to information and decision making. So thinking about, for example, translating council analytic documents into local languages where that's appropriate. Uh, thinking about whether or not everyone has a fair access to fishing benefits and opportunities. How could you improve that access? Um, and then who is included and how are they included when fisheries decisions are made? So going back to these questions for hopefully to prompt some discussion and feedback, um, you know, what, what are we thinking about when we think about Pacific, on the last slide, um, Pacific Fisheries Management Council communities and what considerations are specific to the Pacific Coast, um, you know, sort of separate from the, the national level, what aspects stand out as being particularly important, and then how could we generally be more inclusive throughout the decision making process? With that, I would love to answer questions or, yeah, thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Abby. Uh, questions for Abby on her presentation? Corey Ridings, Corey. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Abby and Stacy, for that presentation. Um, I think it was on your second to last slide, um, you posed the question, how does the council want to engage with NIMS on EEJ? Um, I, I think we're lucky to have you in our region and, act, and as a national co-chair as well. So um, other than what's in front of us today, I, I would like to turn that question back to you. Um, do you have suggestions about how the council can continue to engage with NIMS on this? Thank you. Uh, great. Oh, sorry, I'm out of practice. My Robert's result order. Thank you, <laughs> Ms. Ridings, and thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. So. Um, yeah, I think this this could go a lot of ways, um, but you know, generally, like the the council has 
a lot of ways to work with NIMS on sort of what its own priorities are. I do think it would be helpful potentially to consider having some sort of council working group of people. If there is a subgroup of people, either the council or in um, advisory bodies who are interested in this and interested in doing, thinking through how um, the council might want to adapt some of its processes or procedures or uh, its own outreach and engagement or decision-making process uh, that having some sort of subgroup might be helpful for that. Um, I think too, um, in terms of sort of coordinating from our with our um, tribal co-managers and, and state partners, uh, seeing the way that that process works like in the Marine Spatial Planning Committee, I think there's a lot of value to getting people together and sharing ideas and, and having NIMS be a part of that process or sharing outcomes from that process with NIMS, I think would be really val valuable and beneficial. Uh, that's just one idea. I'm sure there's there's others. Uh, I know the council's working on a white paper on sort of thinking through process improvements and, and trying to take equity into consideration as it does that process, I think would also be a valuable uh, step in something that would be helpful for NIMS in thinking through how we partner with the council and how we can improve access and what opportunities we can look for to support improve um, access for the council um, as a result of some of those considerations. Yeah, that's just off the top of my head. <laughs> uh, thanks for the question. Okay, thank you, Corey. Anyone else? Okay, okay, see you that. Thank you, Abigail. Um, next up will be um, Michelle Conrad in the, uh, the EAS report. Michelle. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Great, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Pettinger and uh, council members. I'll be reading from agenda item C2A, Supplemental EAS Report 1. The EAS reviewed and discussed the equity and environmental justice strategy prepared by NOAA Fisheries. The EAS applauds the overarching goals of the strategy to serve stakeholders equitably by engaging underserved communities in the science, conservation, and management of the nation's ocean resources and their habitat, and the iterative process used to produce this document. The EAS makes the following observations and recommendations. Number one, the Council will have opportunities for substantial engagement in the development of regional EEJ strategies and the EAS recommends that the Council make use of these opportunities. In particular, the Council can use the development of regional strategies to better identify and serve communities affected by Council actions, including tribes, coastal communities, fishing communities, and others connected with fishing activities who may remain less visible. For example, shoreside stakeholders whose living depends in whole or in part on commercial fisheries. Two, the issue of developing and maintaining trust among affected entities and individuals was prominent in our discussion. The EAS recognizes the critical importance of trusting relationships in addressing issues of EEJ and notes that the development of regional EEJ strategies can help to build that necessary trust. Number three, with respect to the strategy itself, the EAS notes that many of the metrics proposed by NOAA to evaluate success are measurable, but may not be meaningful. That is measures such as the number and percentage of NOAA staff trained, number of NOAA offices represented at regular meetings, or the number of regional or program EEJ working groups established reflect activity, but are not meaningful indicators of impact. We flag this as an issue for the council to consider as it establishes its own measures of success in addressing systemic inequities associated with council activities. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, questions for Michelle on the EAS report? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Thank you, Michelle. All right. I believe that takes us to uh, public comment. I believe we have a few cards in. 
We'll get that here shortly. Oh. Okay. I think here we go. And Michelle, I think you're uh, I think you're back up. Great. Thank you again, uh, Vice Chair Pettinger and Council Members. I am Michelle Conrad, and I am presenting these comments on equity and environmental justice issues on behalf of Ocean Conservancy. We have provided comments directly to NOAA Fisheries, which I attached to my sign up for testimony today. And we submitted a comment letter in your briefing book that is specific to ideas and recommendations for how the Council could engage in the federal process and uh, consider changes to the council process to implement the NOAA strategy at the regional level. First, we thank you for scheduling time on your agenda for this discussion and for the opportunity to provide these comments. We sincerely appreciate the thoughtful structure and content of the draft strategy, including the well-articulated description of EEJ barriers and we found the guiding questions to be relevant and useful leads for meaningful discussion and actions at the regional level, as well as nationally. Our national comments that are particularly relevant to the Pacific Council that I'd like to highlight are one, ensuring NOAA Fisheries recognizes and respects tribal sovereignty, upholds the federal trust responsibility and engages in co-management with Native American tribes. We recommend that NOAA rethink its past operations with respect to collaboration and improving relationships with tribes and include this in their uh, strategy going forward. Number two, identifying underserved communities and executing meaningful and equitable outreach to those communities at a level that is desired by them. We emphasize that the term underserved and the communities that want to be included likely varies by region. Some communities are probably not even aware of this EEJ strategy and that this process is occurring, and other communities may not want any involvement. We urge NOAA Fisheries and the Council to explore ways in existing services, such as working with grassroots organizations or contractors who represent the best interests of those affected communities and to ensure transparency to all parties through the process. And finally, providing leadership to the regional fishery management councils in considering the implications of this EEJ strategy at the management level. The consideration of trade-offs between management approaches, the weighing of public comment and community needs, the participatory structures of decision-making and the final actions determining the distribution of access benefits and equity outcomes are made at the regional management council level. Instilling and practicing equity and inclusion at the regional level will require deliberate work and may disrupt status quo operations, and the councils will likely need help, guidance, and resources to ensure that affected communities are truly given a chance to meaningfully engage in the process. Turning to our comments specific to the Pacific Council, we recognize that broad-scale cultural changes do not happen quickly and that long-standing processes such as the Council's can become institutionalized and difficult to change. We do not make these recommendations lightly and hope that the Council receives them in the spirit with which they are intended. To get started, we recommend the Council have a robust dialogue about the communities that the Council serves and identify those that may not have had opportunity or access to Council processes, services, or information. Identify the EEJ barriers that are applicable to the West Coast region and explore ways to equitably reach all who are impacted by Council actions, particularly those in underserved communities. Modify the Council's procedures to meaningfully integrate EEJ considerations into the Council's activities and discuss whether the Council needs additional training, tools, or other resources to incorporate EEJ into its work. 
We also recommend that the council work with NOAA Fisheries to develop and widely offer trainings to staff, council members, advisory bodies, and stakeholders on equity, inclusion, diversity, and environmental justice to ensure there is a shared understanding of these issues. We recommend the council systematically assess its policies, procedures, and actions for potential bias that could disadvantage underserved communities and identify and explore ways to reduce that bias, be more inclusive, and achieve equity. We also recommend the council identify a council liaison or a subcommittee to engage with the regional EEJ working group to facilitate the sharing of ideas lessons learned and best practices. For possible ways that the council could modify its process to be more inclusive and accessible, we offered some suggestions which could dovetail with the council's discussion of its process and efficiencies under agenda item C3. Our suggestions include, number one, reconsider how public comment is structured to make it easier for stakeholders to remotely engage in the council process. Number two, hold council meetings in coastal fishing communities by exploring venue options in coordination with tribal, local, or state governments, federal agencies, and NGOs, such as conference facilities, regional or field offices, museums or community centers uh, to hold meetings in those coastal communities. Number three, provide public comment and listening stations in those coastal communities. Again, through exploring venue options, consider providing offsite stations for the public to listen to council proceedings and provide comments remotely and consider coordinating with government and non-government entities for staffing or volunteer support at those offsite stations. Number four, attend community meetings or meetings of fishing organizations or NGOs to provide informational updates on council activities. We offer these suggestions to stimulate discussion while being mindful that the council's resources to expand its outreach, education, and communication efforts may be limited at this time. We anticipate that the implementation steps and the accompanying costs for these suggestions and other recommended actions will be developed and discussed in greater detail by the regional EEJ working group, which again, we recommend the council actively engage in. So I thank you again for the opportunity to provide comments on these important topics of equity and environmental justice. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, questions for Michelle on her testimony? Okay, seeing no hands. Thank you, Michelle. Next up is uh, Wayne Couto. Wayne, welcome. Good morning, uh, Chair, Vice Chairs, Council Members and staff. Wayne Cotto, I'm gonna be speaking on behalf of myself on this one. You know, everywhere we go, we hear about the fight for equality. We're all equal at birth, but then things change. We go to school, environment, family values, economics, demographics, you know, cultural friends. It changes us, right? I applaud NOAA's goal to eradicate discrimination in their programs and policies, as well as reduce the barriers to equity and to be inclusive of all communities. Underserved communities exist within all cultures. You can't just assume because you're a person of color, Latino, Asian, Pacific Islander, et cetera, that you're part of an underserved community. Until you understand the person's cultural, societal backgrounds, you can't put forth a plan to combat the in inequalities they may be experiencing because you can't control everything that's around them. For this purpose, or for this process, do you have the right people with diverse backgrounds and demographics to understand and represent the groups you're trying to help? Do you have the right tools, authority, time, funding, and the will to make the necessary changes for equity, inclusion, diversity, and environmental justice? How do you measure equity and equality? How do you measure success in this process? Our goals should be better outreach, education, and access to the process to bring more equitable inclusiveness that being said, I'm not sure what providing science and data to, uh, and more accessible or data and science to uh, being more accessible to the underserved communities. 
Um, just a note, I'm fairly involved in most of these processes and issues. And it's interesting that I was never notified of this whole process going on last year. What does that say about the outreach that's already in place and how you're going to get to the underserved communities going forward? Like other processes, it's best to find leaders and groups of the groups, you to represent their interests, than to think that you're going to engage in the masses that in this process. The average individual does not have the time, knowledge, or interest in getting involved in these meetings and processes. We have experience in this as the Fish and Game Commission tried to go through their coastal communities project in the last two years. Governments should collaborate with regional and, and interest specific groups like my group, CCA Cal, fishing clubs, NGOs, special interest clubs, and others to go out to those communities of concern as we all have the networks, the volunteers, the contacts, and have we, we've built them over time. We should be utilizing all of the new tools that are available at our disposal, social media, podcasts, radio shows, not just TV and print media. The community events for outreach are out there and we don't participate as an organization or an industry. We need to speak their language with their peers and with somebody they trust. We need to simplify and explain why this is important to them and why they need to get involved. What we do here is fisheries, uh, is fisheries management, habitat and ecosystems management to ensure productive and sustainable fisheries. We are protecting the resource for everyone. We shouldn't single out one group over another. The definition of equity is the freedom from bias and favoritism. There was a part of the document that started talking about additional harvest guidelines or allocations for underserved communities. That's kind of scared me. If fisheries management is equal for all, then calling out and catering to a, dis a distinct sector is not equal to all. We need to protect our access to the resources along our coastline for everyone. We need to protect CPFV and charter operations as they are really the access point to much of the underserved communities to the ocean resources. We need to control the cost of access to the resources or will be unavailable to the underserved communities to participate. We need to lower the barriers for accessing and understanding available services. This current process seems upside down. It seems like there's being changes developed before they know if they're gonna have any impacts to the communities. It seems that it'd be better to have representatives collaborating on these uh, inputs and changes. Sorry if I'm rambling a little bit, but th this topic is very broad and we've been talking about it at multiple levels of government and it, we could go on forever on this subject matter. So thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Wayne. Questions for Wayne on this testimony? Uh, Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Wayne, for those comments. Um, I appreciate that you provided some ideas for what council could do or even what we as, as a fisheries broader community can do. Uh, you mentioned, one thing that you mentioned was better communication and outreach. You noted speaking their language, example, their peers in their language and through people they trust. Do you have any more on that about how specifically this council could, in, could do that? Uh, Ms. Writings, the the problem that I find is government thinks that they have to do it all themselves, all levels of government, and they're not collaborating with, with themselves, and they're not collaborating with all the people in the communities. Again, CCA Cal is the representative for the recreational community, and we go out to all the fishing clubs, organizations, podcasts. We have those contacts, and we work on those uh, different levels within demographics geographic and, and the like. We're not the only one. No one size fits all ever, ever. You have to go out to all of these groups because they all have their own interests and subset. And that's how you're going to have better coverage. But you gotta go out with a standard message. You gotta go out with something that's simple that people can understand and translate. And I think that you'll be more effective. Thank you, Corey. Uh, Jerry Grohler. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Penninger. Um, Wayne, um, I'm sure you're aware that um, organizing anglers, whether they be commercial or recreational, is uh, 
famously a great challenge. And while you do have some segment that do belong to clubs and are susceptible to that kind of outreach, probably the majority and probably especially the underserved communities aren't hooked into those networks. So, you know, whether you're talking about shore anglers, peer anglers, uh, folks who, you know, economically are disadvantaged, so they're not, they don't have a boat to take out. How do you reach those segments of the underserved community? You got to go, Chair Gralnick, you have to go to their organization, their cultural groups. They all have them. They all hang out. They all have their own newspapers or periodicals they read. They all hang out at certain areas. You're right. We have a hard time within the fishing community today reaching shore anglers, peer fishermen, and certain cultures. They don't trust the government. They don't trust what's going on. They don't communicate through this. So you have to go and find those representatives that they will trust to talk to them. And you will find those within those communities usually. And that, that's what we're doing. We're, we're reaching out and trying to find those groups and representatives because we were trying to get more depth in our coverage. Okay. Thank you, Chair Rolick. Uh, further questions for Wayne? Bush Smith. Thank you, Mike. That was great testimony. Um, I, and I agree with what we a lot of say. I, I know up in Washington that uh, when we're shut down, we're all shut down equally. And, uh, and, uh, and I just, you know, I'm seeing a bunch of different diverse groups and, and I'm just wondering myself how, you know, they're misserved because, uh, you know, we, we don't set regulations up for different groups of people. We set it up for, you know, different sectors of the fishing, which can all participate equally and, and, uh, whatnot. So I'm, I'm too kind of, having a hard time wrapping my arm around, you know, if there's language barrier, I understand that, you know, we have a um, pretty good Hispanic community up in the state of Washington on the coast that, that, that work in different places and, and recreate. And I can understand where that might be. Um, you know, all the stuff doesn't always come out in different languages. And I understand that, but, but I, I, I just don't see the inequity between different cultures and different, uh, racial groups or, or, or others myself. So anyway, I'm just agreeing with what you said and, and trying to get my head around this particular issue myself. So thank you. Thank you much. Anyone else? Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. And just to let me know that we are past noon, but we're going to go through public comment before we break for lunch. So Jamie, please. <laughs> Good afternoon, officially. Uh, I am, again, Jamie Diamond, Stardust Sport Fishing Santa Barbara, but I myself am speaking as myself in this, just like Wayne was. And I am going to just say ditto to what he said, because that was a lot of what I was going to say. <laughs> um, and he did it really well. Um, I, I'd like to emphasize a few things. Um, this is a huge undertaking for this body. Um, and what that would look like, because there's more than it's, it, yeah, it, the, the process is huge of, of really getting to everybody because you represent the entire West coast and Idaho. And that's a lot of communities to reach out to. Um, and so Wayne, what Wayne was mentioning and, and Miss Writings hit on was, was getting boots on the ground, um, and having it trickle down from you to the to the region to the state to the region to the community, um, and building a structure similar to that. Um, I myself, I'm a school board trustee in my local community. I helped create the food bank in my town um, after the Montecito debris flow and for the pandemic. We were serving over 500 families every week during the pandemic for the first six months. Um, I was there with them, shouldering that burden of food insecurity with them. They listened to me when I talked to them about school for their kids. I earned their trust and they listened to me because I was there with them. Not because I told them what was best for them, not because I said, hey, you need to participate in this because we want to have more people that look like you to check off a box. So the motive behind this needs to be real and true, first of all. 
um, not just checking a box to say you did it. And if, and you need to determine the level at which you're, you're capable of doing it meaningfully. Otherwise it's not worth doing at all. Um, so uh, really part of what Wayne was saying, I'll, I'll say he didn't mention it, but, um, the local group in my area from CCA actually went out to the piers and they had a whole day to work with people who try to fish for sustenance and they gave them gear and they helped teach them more effective ways to fish. Okay. That's the level at which it needs to be. And so I am not, I don't know how that translates for a body like this, um, which is why this is so difficult because that's when you can, talk to them about why it is important to buy a fishing license, why it is important to obey the, the regulations and where to find that information and how to participate if you if you feel like there's something off. That's the level, literally boots on the ground, shoulder to shoulder is where you make that meaningful change. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Questions for Jamie on her testimony? Frank Lockhart. So um, thank you for that. that. I think that that was a really uh, a good comment on on this and maybe kind of referring back to uh, one of the things that Wayne said, is that what is success? And I think maybe what I'm hearing from you, I guess I'm asking if, if this is kind of maybe your first suggestion is that boots on the ground getting in front of people uh, where they are. Is that kind of one of the first components of success? You know, recognizing this is a huge undertaking, uh, but is that one of the critical things in your mind? I think that is a component of the success of the process. Um, I don't, like others have said, you can't force people to participate in something if they aren't interested or, or whatever. But so there's no way to say, oh, well, we had a hundred more people come to a council meeting. So we did it. It that's that it's, it's that you did what you could do the most meaningful way you could do it. And, and if the intention really is that yes, boots on the ground, people in the local communities, Fishermen, fishing communities are, are, are underserved communities. Um, they're, they're, they're disadvantaged communities. It, it, to be disadvantaged doesn't look a certain way. The first time I came to testify years ago, um, my family was, was on food assistance. And to make the decision to spend the gas money to, to drive to the meeting and to buy a nice presentable dress for that meeting was a huge sacrifice for my family for me to come and do that. Um, and that's a barrier. That's a very real barrier that many people face to participate. If you want, if you're looking for people to come to the meetings and participate. So there's different levels, like there's getting the information out and disseminating and being with them and explaining to them what's going on and, and, and how to do it. But then there's, if you want them to participate in the process, that's a whole nother level of hurdles of, of, I mean, the, the most obvious one is the financial burden. Thank you, Frank. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Jamie. All right. Well, we are past the lunch hour, so um, we're not too far, but so we're doing pretty good, I think. So uh, we'll break for um, hour and three minutes. We'll be back here at one fifteen. So over.
<laughs> okay, if we get our indoor seats here, we'll get started. Okay, I see the green paddle, so we're ready to take off here. So uh, we finish up with public comment on uh, C2, and um, I'll look to Jim maybe to um, clarify from what we do for the rest of this agenda item. So Jim? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, so right, you've had your presentations, uh, heard your EAS report, had public comments, so you're down to the council action. Uh, basically, you want to decide whether uh, you want to uh, provide comments on the uh, draft EEJ uh, strategy, uh, and then uh, so the content for those comments. Um, and then in addition to what's listed in your situation summary, you may also want to have a discussion about the uh, next steps you want to take with respect to uh, the development of the regional process, uh, whether and when you might want to add that to your uh, future meeting planning schedule. Very good. Thank you, Jim. And with that, I'll open the floor up for discussion. Oh, oh, Frank Lockhart. Frank. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, so um, I thought we had some good public comment and um, and uh, some of the, the EIS um, statement was also, uh, I think, well, um, well received and they did a good job uh, and a thorough job of kind of uh, thinking through this and where we are at this stage. And so um, a couple of uh, things that came up in those, those comments, I just wanted to ensure folks that equity and environmental justice is a priority for NIMS leadership and we're committed to implementing the strategy um, after it's final, finalized at the national and regional level. And I can say that from my, my own personal experience in the agency. The level of, of of engagement and kind of commitment um, is has been impressive to see, so I'm very um, happy about that. Uh, and then, addition, additionally, uh, it is that kind of this is a this is a, a kind of a, a broad um, effort as well. So the region, the restoration center, office of law enforcement, and the two science centers are looking forward to ongoing engagement with uh, tribal state. Uh, and state government partners, the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission, as well as the council in establishing who our communities are and how to best engage with and expand access to opportunities for those uh, communities. And uh, so we are looking forward to collaborating with the council on as you proceed on this effort, you know, in, in collaboration with the CCC as well. And um, we're interested to hear how your, your approach for support, supporting equity and environmental justice. And as I said, look forward to uh, continuing that collaboration. So I think with that, uh, just some general comments, uh, turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, I see Bob Dooley has his hand up and then we'll go to Michael Clark and then uh, Phil. So uh, Bob Dooley. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, I appreciate it. Um, I had a few comments on this, and just in the discussion of it, 
we heard a lot of top down what the council can do to include to be have more be more inclusive be more uh, in, in equity and environmental justice we've heard what the you know the agency is going to do and all that but i i don't look at this i think i think wayne and jamie had it had it right it's a bottom up if you want to get people included you have to it, it, you can go talk down to them all you want but you need to work work with them now you know i'm involved in mrep have been since the beginning in the west coast and that's what that's one of our priorities is to try to be to encourage inclusiveness some of the example of that is in the monterey area there's a vietnamese fishery uh, participants there that are virtually invisible to the council process we you know however it isn't simply going down and saying hey the council's here or this is what we do how do you engage them how do you get them into the community and i think there we we have some um we have some thoughts on that our our steering committee uh, west coast steering committee and and the, and the program in general is 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 working hard for that so if we're we're not thinking of it as um have a program for somebody that's different we're looking at how do you how do you bring them into the fold how do you include them and it isn't simply creating a program separate and apart it's bringing them in and if that takes if that takes uh translators and such but the biggest thing i mean i think 50 percent of what we do at least is 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 community and building relationships and understanding each other and you can't walk into this program from a science pro uh, basis or from a council regulatory basis and management cold. This is a really difficult process to navigate. And that's what MREP does. And the, the com important component about that, appreciate all the, uh, you know, all of the support that the agency and the council staff give that program all the way from enforcement, everybody, they, they, they put time into it to be presenters and help us. However, this is a by fishermen for fishermen. That's the basis of it. The federal government helps support it, but they don't want any part of managing it. They like what's going on, and I think I do too. That's why I'm so passionate. Um, you can't get people involved in this program, in this system, unless they feel like they're part of the group. And I think that's what we need to build. We need to build trust. We need to bring people in that can understand the program, can and get it from a base level. But what the council can do, the things I heard come across, I don't know that that top-down stuff's going to manage. Obviously, we have a part to play. We have information that we can supply, but we have to build those, build that trust and build those relationships from the ground up and and show that there's places to be now as far as you know places for everyone to participate in this process they're all like corey had mentioned there's the the um, economic barriers to, to participation those are there they're real but there are ways to do that but in to encourage more participation i don't know that we have an as active a role besides support to bringing this forward. And the reason I bring up MREP is because that's that's the link, in my opinion. Not all, not all the links, but it's a big link. And I think, you know, that's a tool that the council supports, both with staff, the council supports with, in, with uh, you know, financial uh, support. The agency supports with financial support and staff. The states do too. I think it's important that we we use those tools to reach out, and that's how we get built buy-in into this program and get people included. And yes, we, it's really easy for us to look around the table and and, and, the, and look at our public testimony and see that the people that are represented, the the more organized fisheries get the the vast amount of attention, and that can change, but. It, it doesn't change by us making it change. It changes by us including people. So I'll stop there. And I, I just wanted to add that to it because I didn't hear MREP at all being mentioned in any of the testimony 
in any of the reports. And I think that's one of our big tools in this in this process. Thank you, Bob. Um, Mike Clark, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay, Mr. Vice Chair? We hear you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, I just appreciate them sharing their strategy and all the, the comments and good discussion that have uh, been shared thus far. I just, I guess, wanted to uh, briefly summarize some of the uh, some of the Department of Interior's programs that are aimed at this uh, at this very important topic. Where uh, some of you may have uh, be familiar with the Justice Forty initiative. This is aims to deliver uh, roughly forty percent of the overall benefits of climate, clean energy, and related investments to uh, disadvantaged communities that are marginalized, overburdened, and, and underserved. Uh, also on on public land, we're working to uh, make. America's public lands more and waters more more accessible and inclusive uh, by ensuring that everyone, no matter their their background or zip code, can enjoy the benefits of green spaces in the outdoors. Programs like the Outdoor Recreational Legacy Partnership Program and our Urban National Wildlife Refuge programs uh, help increase equitable access to the outdoors, uh, particularly in in urban communities. Also, uh, just cleaning up legacy pollution caused by environmental hazards like abandoned mines, orphaned oil and gas wells have impacted a lot of communities throughout the nation. And the recent uh, infrastructure law made a historic $16 billion investment to plug some of these orphan wells and reclaim abandoned mine lands. Uh, and then also just fighting the, the climate crisis in general, the urgent action on, on, climate, uh, on climate change includes, you know, making a more equitable and sustainable future for, for every community and making sure that there's, you know, no longer disproportionate impacts to these disadvantaged communities. But thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Phil Anderson, Bill. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Just a, a few thoughts um, as I've listened to the presentation and the public comments and comments from around the table and trying to think about what we might might do here at the council level uh, to advance this strategy, um, not only because it's an imp strategy, but I, as far as I'm concerned, it's been a, a um, it's been a goal of the council for as long as I've been here um, that we've that we try to do our very best to reach out to the community, the fishing communities that we serve in all the different sectors. And it's a, it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a huge challenge to do. Um, and I'm sure there's things that we could do to improve upon what we've done in the past. Uh, there's, there's new tools available to us that we didn't have 20 years ago. And, uh, that that can assist us in in reaching people and and helping educate um, and providing opportunities for people uh, across the the coastal landscape that are involved in fisheries to participate in this process. I mean, I'm thinking we have over a thousand miles of of coastline, and and um, if my math's right, and uh, speckled with coastal communities all along the way with a variety of different fishing interests and sectors in each one and and their their similarities and there's and there's big differences um in the participants and how they fish and where they fish and and all of that um and and trying to figure out how you can how we can reach out um, and do a better job of making sure that people know we're here, know how to engage, feel comfortable to engage with us and provide us their thoughts as we make uh, all of the various decisions that we do. I think that, you know, the reference to the top down versus, versus bottom up is a, is a good one. I mean, I, this is, um, the initiative I, I would suggest is being driven by headquarters and being driven through their regions and the regions are in turn reaching out to the councils because we have a, you know, we have a role to play here and can help them achieve their strategy. Uh, but it's as much as our, it's as much ours as it is theirs in my mind in terms of what we're trying to achieve. There's a, 
there's a host of ideas around the table um, from the public as to how to how we can improve and and um, you know I, ideas are um, are relatively easy to come up with but difficult to implement it's it's easy to come up with some really good ideas but when it comes to actually putting them in in place uh, it takes resources it takes people to do and they don't just happen um, you can we can we can um, as, as we all know um, there's a couple of things I, I heard during our public testimony and I, I, I jotted them down there a little um, one was I think came from Jamie about um, find a level that you're capable of, of, of doing I mean pick something that you can actually do um, I, I think is another way of what she was saying and and uh, there was another one I I don't remember the what went around it, but do what you can do um, uh, was another one. So as we're as we're thinking about how to move forward from this point, I hope that we keep those things in mind. That we do. Um, can we put together kind of a, a a list of things that we're already doing, and then think about how we might augment those within our capability. Uh, to advance um, us getting to a broader um, set of people that we serve and that are participating in our fisheries and that are important to our coastal communities. You know, I heard about um, education is an important one. Uh, the bottom up piece about going out and, and trying to uh, get in contact and, and make sure they are aware of what we do and how to how to access our process. Um, we're, we're not, I don't think we're gonna build that um, around this table um, because I think it's gonna take some, um, sorry, small group to, to do some thinking about it and potentially bringing back some recommendations on what we could do as a council. Um, recognizing that, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, no fisheries um, have within, I suspect, have their own thoughts about what they can do within their agency um, to advance this initiative. Um, but I am wondering, um, with as with an, other things that have come our way from NIMS headquarters and expectations of us whether there whether there's any help any assistance that you that NIMS is, might be willing to give us uh, so that we can um, do some internal thinking or, uh, about the council and our process and how what things that we might be able to add to what we're already doing to help address and work toward the the goal of the strategy um, it's, you know, um, the, the, the term unfunded mandate comes to mind. And here you are presenting this strategy to us and also placing an expectation, or at least that's my interpretation, of us, of us owning this strategy and doing what we can do to advance the strategy. And again, I think it is something that has been a part of the council's mission and goal all along uh, to to reach out and get and be in touch with as many of the people that our decisions affect that we can uh, and and again there are i'm sure there's things that we can do to improve that but it's going to take some additional resources to do and so as the end of my little dialogue here is to frank are there any resources that NIMS might be willing to bring to bear to assist the council in moving this forward? Frank? So there is a recognition that in order to do at least some of these things, some of the things probably don't take a lot of resources to do. Um, uh, and, uh, but there is a recognition that 
uh, there are many things that have already kind of been identified as options that uh, additional resources would help uh, get them accomplished. So <clears throat> there are no resources identified as of yet, but they are in the process. So it is something that uh, NIMS is, is trying to get um, funding for to, to provide those resources. And I think that that is um, uh, how, how and to whom those resources go out to, I think is, is, is worthy of a, a discussion. And I think it's, it's recognized that not all the resources just go to NIMS, that it would have to go out to our partners that we're collaborating with. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and, and great comments by the previous speakers. Um, you know, I, I too was um, involved deeply with MREP, had to step back for a little bit, uh, but but still support that group. I think that is, uh, well, I see, a, I see a bunch of great ideas floating in the air on what we ought to do, but but I find it difficult sometimes for government to do that. And, and I think that's, you know, where MREP, through the support, maybe, uh, and you guys get, know has given great support, um, but may, maybe more support where they can have, you know, more sessions than just the twice a year. Um, because I know if you drag someone to this process, it's pretty well lost in the woods um, process in, unless you have some idea what you're going into. And, um, you know, Jamie Diamond, you know, she was an MREP graduate and uh and there's others that are in the process now that probably wouldn't have been necessarily in this process uh you know one one character's tuna tom god, god bless tuna tom i you know he adds a little bit of levity and life to the to the process and and we're what we about tuna tom and but i i think that um you know we washington oregon noah we we all have lists of people that we could be giving to NREP. We don't have that. We mean, it's just we we do a picking process and vetting process, and all right, they I don't anymore, but they do. Um, and, and to try to get a cross section of 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 people. But I, I think that uh, um, one idea of you know the departments and and Noah, you know, we've all had in contact with people that want to get involved or asking questions or you know if guy jotted those names down and and turned them over MREP, then that they would have a, you know, that'd be another way to, to do it, simpler way, um, you know, kind of a um, uh, a lead in, but but of course that would take more resources and support from the MREP program. So, I, you know, I, I just, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm just having a hard time how we make all these gears mesh. <laughs> um, there's a lot of great ideas in, in the presentation, but, but how we make those all mesh and, and, and maybe it's impossible to make them all mesh. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe we, you know, cut the list shorter and, and, and start there. Um, and certainly being from a, a coastal community, I, I know it's being left out of the, out of the process. The whole Washington coast was left out of the engine exchange program. Um, you know, other communities that were by bigger um, masses of people were, you know, some of them were on their, third and fourth engine change but the washington coast we still some of us are still using world war ii technology and uh and so you know that was that was really a disadvantage to the to the people of coastal washington and and and, and for most part except for one time you know the, the coast of oregon they, and and so um you know those, those, those certainly could help the fishermen of the you know to get some support not that NOAA is involved in that but get some support on that program for 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 communities that can't participate um, because of the the population rules, but but any, anyway, I just um, don't mean to be rambling on, but I think MREP is a great partner, can be a great partner in in bringing people to the table, and uh, you know we we certainly uh, welcome you know more participants and diversity of participants and and. Uh, um, you know, I, I know when I um, was chair of the SAS, I mean, we, we welcomed everybody and glad they came, whether who we are, we disagreed or not. I mean, and that's what this process has been. And, and uh, 
you know, if there's some language barriers or some simple like that in, in getting to different um, groups of people, then, then that's, you know, what we should do. But I, I just, this, this boy, this is a big bite of the apple all at one time. But, but anyway, I, I, I think if we take smaller bites, it probably could, can probably work, you know, with some partnerships. So thank you, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair. Thank you much. Further, oh, Frank? I thought I'd add just a couple more things here. So um, Phil said something that I just wanted to, you know, support strongly what he said. You know, I, I uh, have gone to a, a few of the state directors meetings over the years, and I think pretty much at every one of those, this was discussed in some way or another, either, you know, we're talking about people, uh, you know, getting out to the communities. You know, I, one of my favorite moments actually was, I, I forget the guy's name, but he was making a point and he spoke in, I think it was Creole to everyone. And he was making the point, well, if you want to get out to these communities, you have to be there and speak their language, you know, and it, and it really made the point really well. So I, I think the states have a, a probably, Maybe I shouldn't say this as the next representative, but probably have a better record of, of exploring this already. So we, we need to work with the states on that. So, and a couple other comments that people have made. And, um, you know, equity doesn't necessarily mean equal. Everyone gets the same thing. You know, we had went through uh, an exercise with the Cat Share program where a big question that we as the council and NIMS had to answer was, you know, is, is this fair and equitable? You know, and so we had that conversation and we started off that conversation, not necessarily knowing everything that we needed to know in order to make that final decision. And that kind of leads into my final point that Butch just talked about. Yes, this is big. Uh, and I think the more, the more, the important thing for us to do is to start down that road, start working on it, working with our partners um, at the state and local tribal uh, and other, uh, other, everywhere else in the local communities, um, and uh, start down that road of trying to find the things that we need to do, and then maybe I should say final, finally, finally, uh, I really appreciate Bob bringing up MREP because I do think that will be a key thing for us, at least on this West Coast. Um, that we did it, it is we we started this conversation in july or August, i can't remember when it was but it was fairly recently where we had a pretty good conversation about this how do we do that and so i think that can be a good tool for us as well but maybe i'll close uh, as i started this is a priority for nymph's leadership so this is something that um the current leadership is feels strongly about about it and has made it known. And it is also something that excites a lot of the, the staff in the West Coast region. So it is something that we're committed to continuing uh, pay, to pay attention to. So thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, Bob? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Really good comments by everyone, I, by the way. I, I agree with Phil. Funding is a big issue that I mean, we know, we all know that. And, to me, this whole thing is really managing expectations. If you if you have a have a plan, we can't fix this overnight. It's like eating an elephant. You know, the best way to do that one bite at a time, and that's you got to get started. But have realistic goals, realistic things that you can expect to see progress on. And I think that all of the stuff that's been mentioned around here is part of it. Um, I think identifying leaders and it, it, even leaders that don't understand that they're leaders in, in various communities to actually engage. And, you know, of course, I always look at MREP, that's great, <laughs> kind of as, a, as, a, as an entrance thing to get them involved, but not just get them involved in, in the process, but get them involved in the community to, to understand that when they come into the room, they know people because they were there and they got to meet them. So. I think you got to start small to get, I mean, there's, there's a reason that they weren't, they, when I say they, it's a huge carpet of they, it's, it's a mosaic of they, it's not just ethnic communities, it's underserved, smaller communities, small, small boat entity fishermen that 
have no representation or have no interest in it, tell you the truth. But getting them involved and bringing them into the family to understand that there is a reason to be involved, that this is their business. But you start small and it blossoms from there. And I think, like I said, managing expectations, having a having a, an idea of which way we're going to go. And I think I've said this until everybody's tired of hearing it. But if you don't, you know, if you don't know where you're going, any road's going to get you there. So we we need to have a process. But getting back to Phil's, this council is pretty impacted. I mean, we're we're running out of running out of places to put things. And uh, and and so I think that needs to be contemplated too. Of how much effort, how much time can this be given in the council process, given what we have and what we have on a plate already? So, I think it's important. I think we need to figure out how to get there. But I think you also need to, you know, manage your expectations and have have measurable goals that that get you there. We're not going to get there overnight. It's taken hundreds of years to get where we are. It's not going to change. We're not going to change this overnight. Corey. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I want to start by thanking NIMS again for developing the draft policy and engaging with the council, um, as well as extending its public comment deadline. I hope that results in even more people being able to contribute. I uh, wanted to note the importance of equitable and just management to this council and its commitment to all people. I, I think it's fair to say we want more people engaged with fishing and fisheries management in our coasts and our oceans and not less. Um, while this council may operate today with an open door to anyone, regardless of who they are, there is also a deep history of exclusion that exists. Many groups of people have been systematically, violently, and intentionally denied access to resources and participation in governance at all levels, including fisheries. This is obviously multifaceted and the council is not gonna solve it, but we should recognize this history. Because of this history, it behooves us to make this a priority and keep working to make it right. Um, I heard Noah talk about trainings and other educational opportunities for employees. Um, and I, I would like to think that the council and its advisory bodies could take advantage of that too. Uh, I had the privilege of going through an EJ training as part of my new member orientation. Uh, it was helpful, and I encourage this ongoing learning opportunity for all members of the council family when it's when it's offered. Uh, I think I'm reading what I've already heard, um, but we would like NIMS to work closely with the council as the regional implementation plans are developed. Um, the council is the main venue for people to interact with their government on fishery issues. So NIMP should work closely with the council in an ongoing manner. Equity and justice are complex issues that require a societal level iterative conversation that will not be solved by a single strategy or moment in time. And the council, at least I would appreciate an ongoing engagement in the implementation plan developments, its own implementation and the continual improvement of subsequent documents that might come from that. I'd like to echo the importance of outreach. We've heard quite a bit about that. Uh, do not expect underserved communities to come to you or to us. We need to go to them. We heard this from all three of our public commenters, and this goes for the NIMP strategy and the plans, as well as for this how this council operates. I'll again echo what Jamie Dimon said. This is going to take a long time. And what Frank said, Re, this is just starting down a road. This isn't something that happens overnight or with a single management action. As the EAS mentioned, developing and maintaining trust and building relationships and to a degree changing the culture of how we manage both as a council and at NIMS is critical. I think we need to let communities lead on that note. In any context, listening to a new voice is frequently challenging as there can be different vocabulary, different languages, different body language, different appearances, and fewer shared norms and references. Responding to community engagement on their terms is critical for inclusion and long-term relationships between groups, such as those between fishing communities and the council. Space must be created to allow mutual understanding, collaboration, problem solving, and compromise. Finally, I'll note that this issue is often uncomfortable, and that's okay. Words like equity and justice mean something a little bit different to everyone, but it's the importance of starting the conversation, having dialogue is what needs to begin, be sustained, and provided the space 
to exist and grow. I'd like to thank Bob for his comments on MRAP. Uh, that program is clearly excellent and could be a model for similar programs or growth of that program. I think the way it's included people has been fantastic um, and it'd be great to do an even better job of it. Um, um, so once again, thanks NIMPS, really appreciate this and hope to see it move forward. Thank you, Corey. Further discussion? Krista? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I um, obviously have spoken on this before on other topics. This is um, something that is near and dear to me, and I am appreciative of uh, NIMS for bringing this forward. And the conversation we've had around the table today, uh, along with the thought that is going into it, a lot of the concerns that I have um, were echoed by the public comment this morning. Um, and I was so appreciative to hear the response to that comment um, from members of the council and um, just the thought that is going into all of this. Uh, I have had concerns about top down um, and the challenge really based upon my experience working in human rights um, and specifically on worker voice, which is very similar. How do you get people in the system who we're not hearing from um, to have better representation is very, very similar. Um, and I, I think the fact that we're willing to acknowledge and think about how to get people more engaged is a first step. Um, similar to hearing about, hey, maybe we need to start small. I'm not certain we need to start with the smallest item, but I do think that we need to think about where <clears throat> outreach and engagement wins could be, such as reconnecting with the people who testified today um, to find out who they think would be good candidates to do additional outreach for. Um, that, that could be an opportunity for us. Moving forward on this topic, um, I would like to commend the MREP program. I went through it. Uh, we hear a lot of talk about it's for fishermen and by fishermen. And I, I know having come out of the fishing community, my assumption was, hey, there are a lot of people that come out of, I'm going to pick on the NGO community. My apologies, Ms. Writing. Um, there are a lot of people that come out of the NGO community who they come from big organizations and they have the funding. Uh, sitting up here, I now know that there are a lot of NGOs that are small that do not have the funding um, and who may not feel uh, that it is likely that they would be able to be a part of the MRA program because they are not a fisherman. So I, I agree with the comment earlier about possibly expanding just based upon that experience. Um, and then the last thing I would be a little remiss to, to not comment on uh, when we're thinking about inclusion is we talk a lot about our coastal communities, uh, Clatsop County and the Lower Columbia, which I have been based out of for 30 years. D includes more than just coastal communities. So, so when we're thinking about this, we do need to also think about our river communities, um, particularly for salmon. So with that, I, I am encouraged uh, that we are taking this on or likely to take this on. Um, and I'm encouraged that we're not trying to jump in full throttle um, because I, I do think that this is long-term and will take uh, some serious thought and commitment to, to make a positive step forward um, that is meaningful. Thank you, Krista. Uh, Chair Grolich. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Pettinger. I, I think that the, the point needs to emphasize the bottom up. I also think we need to be aware that a lot of these underserved communities are also economically disadvantaged. And it's a luxury to be able to spend the time to, to participate in this process. Uh, and uh, folks in those communities don't have that luxury. So um, we have to find other ways to engage with them that doesn't require them to travel or spend days at a council meeting. 
I do, I do think that we have lowered the threshold for participation uh, with, with, by allowing online public comment. I think that's been important. Um, but, you know, another thing we could do, and of course, it's just a matter of having the resources, which we as a council are financially strapped right now. But if we had the resources, we could, we can't locate a council meeting in a, in a smaller coastal community. But we can have a hearing, for example, like we do salmon hearings already in, in, um, in coastal communities. So there are things we can do to lower the threshold for participation by underserved communities. But I don't think we should have the illusion that folks who find themselves in underserved communities are suddenly gonna be able to have the time to participate like all of us are. So um, we have work to do. It'll take small steps, but I do think with resources, Frank, we there are some things we could we we could do uh, to start the down the road to in, improving the participation uh, and access to underserved communities. Thank you, Jared Rolnick. Uh, Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Throughout this discussion, I've kind of been taking a couple of notes about things that I think we're already doing very well and maybe recent um, improvements that we've made to um, bring about additional participation or new participation into the process. Um, certainly echo uh, Bob's remarks on MREP, but um, I also want to make sure we don't forget about our advisors and the quality of our advisors and the critical role that they play engaging their constituencies. And I'm thinking back to how resilient they were in our annual salmon processes these past few years through COVID and how incredible the participation was in our annual salmon setting process. Um, I'm thinking about, um, our request to them to tell us what format, for example, for the uh, Sam, the annual um, council salmon hearings uh, worked best for them and their constituencies. Um, first, under you know COVID era restrictions, but then even afterward, putting the question to them: Hey, what works best? How do we get the best turnout? Is it putting a, a physical in-person meeting in one port along the coast in each state, or is it something else? And I've been really encouraged with um, the quality, the variety, and the diversity of the input that we've received. And it, I am certain, is due uh, in large part to the efforts of our advisory body members. And I'll just highlight, I mean, I believe we received over, well over 200 public comments in our annual salmon setting process. And I think we've seen those come to us in uh, written format. We obviously take oral testimony during our meetings, our, our full council meetings, but then um, the online hearings, at least this uh, past year, I, I, I believe we had 50, 60, 70 speakers um, many of which clearly turned out because um, the leaders of the groups um, that they are involved in encouraged them to either submit comment or to provide uh, verbal testimony supporting one or another alternative or um, a mix and match of alternatives. Uh, we also heard comments that were just very simple and brief, like I like alternative one and um, you're kind of guessing that those folks, um, you know, they're they're taking the time to invest somewhat um, and have been encouraged to, to speak their voice. And we certainly appreciate hearing from them. And I think we um, we we gain a lot um, by looking at the, both the volume and the quality and the 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 extent or the detail in the comments. And so. Um, I just, I want to highlight that positive point. Um, I also want to talk for a minute about um, the state of California and how incredibly important the council process is in terms of offering a, um, a process 
um, a platform, a, a place to go where there is an established process where folks can engage that, um, you know, allows participation on advisory bodies, allows people to come speak to advisory bodies, and of course uh, allows um, quite intensive um, engagement in all of our public processes and around the council table. Um, the state of California does not have a comparable kind of parallel structure. Our, our Fish and Game Commission doesn't have um, a set of advisory bodies at its hand to advise them or a process um, that really allows um, for ongoing um, input on fisheries matters. So um, I think we're serving a very valuable purpose is what I'm getting at here. And while um, of course we can always do more, um, I just wanna acknowledge that uh, I really feel like we, um, we do a pretty good job. Thanks. Thank you, Marcy. Heather. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I I've just appreciated this discussion today. I appreciated it when we it got teed up in June when Sam was here, and um, I'm not going to repeat all the great things I heard today, but maybe just highlight a couple of them that I jotted down too, and I've revised my notes a little bit as as the conversation has gone on. But there's there's a lot of commonality to what we're saying, and I I really appreciate the idea that um, building one way to um, take the bite of the elephant. And I thought of that too, as you know, one bite at a time uh, is building on what, what we already do. And, and Marcy had the um, analogy of the salmon hearings, but what I was thinking about is the work that the States did when we um, explored barrel trauma and descending device mortality, we went home, we went to our fishing clubs and we went to them and said, Hey, there's this new science and, you know, you are the, the users and they rallied right around that and, and without any rules implementing or requiring them to do it, they, they were the boots on the ground. And I, I definitely appreciate that. We've heard that from all the public comment today. Um, and I think there's other places where this is just, we can just allow this to be part of our conversation. We're talking about, our process efficiencies at this meeting and this conversation can infiltrate that idea. Um, I love it when Bob talks about MREP. I've never been part of it, but it just, I love the enthusiasm around it and uh, thinking about expanding that and seeing that program grow and, get, and reach out to more people is just, I think a really an exciting way to contemplate how to, to expand on this um, environmental justice idea. Um, and with, with money and support, and that kind of goes into our process efficiencies too, and, and funding to help us do this and, and start doing more of, of what we already do and thinking about it on a broader scale. Um, and maybe, um, from there, one final thought was the idea of some, some smaller working group, um, NIMS council, just to make sure that, you know, we're continuing that coordination and process and working through that. So, thanks. Thank you, Heather, <laughs> for the comments. Okay, well, we've had a really good conversation about this, I believe. I um, especially liked the, uh, what uh, Phil initially, uh, uh, initially uh, talked about getting a list of what we're doing already to inform, I guess it's a great start. I, I did like Frank's discussion, bringing in and talking about with the, the uh, fish and game departments because they're certainly a big part of this council. But I think it might help to maybe better, if we have a better understanding of the universe we're talking about, because we're talking about MREPs for, fish, fish, for, you know, for fishermen by fishermen. But when I think about underserved communities, are we talking about people who aren't even fishing yet? And we're talking about the fish and game departments. I know. I know ODFW is doing some outreach to try to get people recruited into the fishery and into hunting and you know into the outdoors. And so I think when we have a list of what we're doing to present to National Fisheries Service, it'd be great to get some input from the fishing game departments on 
what the efforts was going on there because that's that's part of the big picture. And then maybe my, I might have a question, maybe it's for Frank, maybe when he's talking about underserved communities, is that existing fishermen who aren't participating or are we, are we talking about the people who who aren't but will be? I think it might better inform our response to the agency. Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, well, for NIMS, it's beyond fishing. So the co definition of communities is not just in the realm of, of fishing. Uh, so um, this is one of the things that, uh, you know, the, the presentation uh, from um, uh, Abigail Harley uh, talked about is getting help from the experts out there, the, the people we collaborate, collaborate with on helping to identify those communities. I think it is an open question. Uh, but I think in, in my mind um, that it is probably both. You know, it is the, the people that are fishing but maybe don't know how to participate or, you know, don't even, um, uh, don't, don't feel comfortable participating. You know, I um, hate to use MREP all the time, but, you know, going to MREP, uh, I learned a couple of things. There's people there that you can talk to them one-on-one -on -one, and they can talk your head off. If you get them in a group of more than three people, they can't, they have a really hard time talking, you know? So, uh, you know, there's, there's those kind of dynamics that we need to, to be aware of. So, so I guess if the, to answer your question more directly, I think it is an open question about what communities we're talking about, but you know, your specific question on those that are fishing, but don't participate versus, you know, those that aren't fishing. I, I, I think it's probably both, you know, helping identify th those kind of folks that may want to participate is important too. Thank you. Okay. Jim, I'll look to you and I think we had a great discussion here. So um, how are we doing? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, yeah, this has been a, a great discussion. A lot of a lot of good comments. Uh, you know, I've heard that the uh, public engagement has always been a, a council mission, something that's been important to the council. Uh, the council would like uh, you know NIMS to work with the council on implementation, uh, but this is as much of a council concern as it is a NIMS concern. Uh, there's concern about the resources needed uh, for implementation. A lot of discussion about planning for success and choosing a pace of, and actions uh, that. Uh, uh, that will lead to success and this will be a long-term effort a lot of talk about MREP and that is that being a, a way to do uh, do some work here talk about the list of uh, what we the council is already doing and then using that list to look at uh, where we can do improvements uh, looking for opportunities for uh, training and education uh, just as NIMS is looking for that for uh, council uh, family uh, the importance to outreach and going to the underserved committees. And the, at the very end here, we talked about the possibility of a, of a, a small working group. Uh, that said, there wasn't any uh, real discussion about uh, a strong feeling of a need to write a letter uh, to NIMS uh, about the EEJ policy. So I don't know if you want to write a letter of just general support or if that's not something we, you feel that you need to engage in at this point. And then the uh, other question is, um, what next? Do we come back to this in uh, uh, you know November or next March? And and uh, in terms of interaction with the NIMS process, is there a particular meeting that uh, would be good for us to uh, have this on the council agenda so we could hear about the regional implementation and and uh, see how things are coming together there? Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, I'll turn to Executive Director Merrick Burton here for uh, some guidance or some thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, Mr. Seeger and I are on a similar wavelength, which is good since we work together. <laughs> so I, I do think there are a couple of possible steps forward here uh, for your consideration. One is the question that Jim just raised, which is uh, whether we should write a letter similar to what other councils have done on the national strategy. And as Jim was touching on some of the things that he heard, I was checking off some of the same things I heard. And as Ms. Hall indicated, there was a lot of commonality. and so. I think we could crib from this discussion and draft a letter, use our QR process and get that along to, to NOAA in not too much, much time. We then have the council coordinating committee in October. This is also on the agenda there. We could carry this council's message to that uh, body and engage in the discussion uh, in that way. 
Then we have the regional strategy, um, which is a uh, sort of, I think of it as a second phase for lack of a better word. And I also anticipate that that is going to be bringing it down a level and starting to talk more about how the rubber hits the road. And that is where the idea of a uh, working group might come into play. Uh, I, I think we're not quite ready to determine whether we establish a working group at this point or not, but what would I think be fruitful is for council staff and NOAA staff to hash that out a little bit more and come back at a later time with what that would look like. Um, maybe some options in there about what that might look like. So that would be uh, some guidance for you all about how we could move forward. Hopefully that's helpful. Okay, Phil. The one other addition I would propose is that um, if if council staff were able to put together a list of things that we're currently doing to for outreach and to um, we we've, we've done some new things in the in the COVID era um, that I think have enhanced our the accessibility of the public to us and and there are some other things that Mar Marcy mentioned in terms of public hearings and those kinds of things. So it, it, it would be good to kind of have a, seems to me it would be good to have a baseline from which to work that if we get, when we get to the point of thinking how we might augment what we're doing to help accomplish the, the objective here that uh, we, we had that to start with. So I don't know if that's a reasonable request, but it would be an addition I would put on the table for consideration. Okay, thank you, Phil. Anyone else? Okay. So, wait, wait. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. So, I, I think where we're at now is looking for affirmation if the the steps that I outlined are the ones that this body would like to take. Um, some affirmation along those lines would be. Uh, welcome and uh, appreciated. If there are other things that we've missed, that would be welcome also. Okay. So I guess with what Merrick's lined out, um, anybody have any disagreement with that? Okay. That's uh, okay. Jim? Uh, I just want to check in to make sure I kind of understand what the thought is here with respect to coming back. Uh, Mr. Burton, I think you outlined that uh, our staffs would work together with the NIMP staff and then I suppose we would figure out when the next time is to come back to the council and uh, at the November meeting report back to the council and say, hey, we want to put this on whatever agenda that comes. Is that, is that how we're working that? Yes, Mr. Seeger, that's what I have in mind. Okay. So Jim, are we, are we done? Mr. Vice Chairman, I think that takes care of everything. Thank you for, like uh, has been commented, this is a great discussion. It really has, and I thank everyone for their uh, contributions. And with that, I will hand the gavel to our our chairman, Vice Chair Hessemer. It's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we're going to move into salmon management item D one methodology review, and for that, I believe we have Robin Elke online to give us an introduction. Start us off there. Robin, are you out there? I am out here. Good afternoon. So this is Robin Elke. We're going to speak to agenda item D1, the salmon methodology review, the final topic selection, and update on model improvements. Every year, the SSC and the STT complete a methodology review to make sure that all the information they're using to help manage the salmon fisheries is using the best available science. Uh, we do this during uh, this September and November timeframe so that by the time we get to March and are doing all of our preseason planning, we have everything in order and um, everything has been well vetted. In addition, uh, under the under the methodology review, when we go through this process, there is a, it can be used as a foreign forum to help update the stock conservation objective proposals. 
which can be updated without an FMP amendment as long as there's a comprehensive technical review. And just focusing on what's at hand today, at the April 2022 meeting, the council did adopt some priority candidates for the salmon methodology review. There were five topics. I'm not going to go through them all. Um, you are probably all familiar. And I know that in the SSC and the STT reports, they have spelt them out. But nonetheless, there were five topics that were candidates. And you're going to hear uh, from the teams on what, where they are in being ready to consider those candidates if they're ready to move forward. In addition, back in April, um, the council put on this agenda item a review of the Klamath Ocean Harvest Model. Uh, that topic was first discussed, like I said, back in April, and then the STT did report in June um, describing some of the potential adjustments that may help improve the forecast. And the STT is uh, here also with an updated report. So the council action under this agenda item, we don't need a motion. We just need to um, have a discuss, discussion on the five topics and identify which ones will move forward and then have a discussion on the Klamath Ocean Harvest Model topic that the STT will be uh, given you information on. So we have three advisory body reports altogether, one from the SSC and one from the STT, both of those regarding the methodology review. And then we also have the STT report too, which has to do with the Klamath Ocean Harvest model. And I don't see anybody signed up right now for public comment, but that takes care of my overview. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Does anybody have any questions for Robin? Not seeing any. Before we get into the advisory body um, reports here, I, I just want to apologize. I forgot to mention the changes that occurred at the table for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. We have Kyle Addix, who is participating virtually and just remind folks also that we have Michael Clark from the Fish and Wildlife Service and Douglas, Doug Vincent Lang from Alaska Department of Fish and Game also attending virtually. So uh, we'll move. Oh, and I'm sorry. And Susan Bishop is in the NIMP seat. Sorry, Susan. And so that'll take us to the advisory body reports and we will start with the SSC report. And I believe we have Jason Schaffler online to do that. Jason, can you start that report? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I am Jason Schaffler and I am here representing the SSC and I will be reading the Scientific and Statistical Committee report on salmon methodology review, final topic selection and update on model improvements. Dr. Michael O'Farrell with the Salmon Technical Team and Mr. John Carey, also with the STT, briefed the Scientific and Statistical Committee on five proposed topics for the 2022 Salmon Methodology Review scheduled for October 12 and 13 of 2022. The five topics listed in the situation summary are anticipated to be ready for review and the SSC supports reviewing all five. The topics and parties responsible for providing documentation are, number one, technical review of the updates associated with the round 7.1.1 of the fishery regulation assessment model base period as they relate to modeled abundances of Chinook salmon stocks used in determining the southern resident killer whale Chinook salmon abundance threshold. This review will be informed by a document that summarizes the changes to FRAM that impact Southern Resident Killer Whale Chinook Salmon Abundance Threshold and will be led by the Model Evaluation Work Group with support from Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, and National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Number two is technical review of the updates to Chinook salmon ocean distribution models that derive from two publications by Shelton et al. and are used to apportion the modeled abundances 
of Chinook salmon stocks among ocean regions. This review will be informed by an additional document that summarizes changes between the 2019 and 2021 models that impact modeled Chinook, Chinook stock apportionment. And this document will be prepared by Northwest Fisheries Science Center. The third topic is discussion of whether the Sacramento index forecast should be expressed as a mean or median. This review will evaluate a document that discusses expected type and magnitude of errors and management performance associated with expressing this point estimate as a mean or median. This document will be prepared by the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. The fourth topic is review of the basis behind the Sacramento River Fall Chinook Conservation Objective. This review will be based on a document that reviews the literature used to develop the Sacramento River Fall Chinook Conservation Objective, and the SSC recommends that it should incorporate information from more recent studies as appropriate. Document preparation will be led by the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. The final topic for selection is FRAM technical detail documentation. This review will consist of an update of the online-based documentation of the FRAM model reviewed in previous cycles and will be led by the MU with support from WDFW, NWIFC, and NOAA. Materials submitted for review should be technically sound, comprehensive, clearly documented, and identified by author, Materials to be reviewed should be submitted no later than two weeks prior to the review. If this deadline cannot be met, it is the responsibility of the author to contact Robin Elke, the SSC Salmon Subcommittee Chair, and the STT Chair prior to the deadline. So appropriate arrangements, rescheduling, and cancellations can be made in a timely and cost-effective manner. The SSC plans to review reports on these topics at the November 2022 Council meeting. And that concludes my report, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Jason. Are there any questions for Jason on the SSC report? Look around for hands and I don't see any online either. So thank you. I think that concludes the SSC report. And we'll move on to the salmon technical team. There are two reports, and Michael Farrell is O'Farrell is listed for both of those. So, Mike, if you're online, you can uh, start. We'll start with uh, the STT report one. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I will be referring to agenda item D1A, supplemental STT report one. Uh, STT report on salmon methodology review, final topic selection, and update on model improvements. At the April 2022 uh, council meeting, five topics were selected as candidates for review at the October 2022 methodology review. First was the technical review of the updates associated with round 7.1.1 of the FRAM uh, base period as they relate to the modeled abundances of Chinook salmon stocks used in determining the southern resident killer whale Chinook salmon abundance threshold. This was assigned to the MU STT with support from WDFW, Northwest Indi Indian Fisheries Commission, and uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service. Number two, technical review of the updates to the Chinook salmon ocean distribution models that derive from two peer-reviewed publications, both the uh, by Shelton, Shelton and all 2019 and 2021, and are used to apportion the modeled abundance of Chinook salmon stocks among ocean region, regions. This is assigned to the uh, SSC with support from Northwest Fishery Science Center and Southwest Fishery Science Center. Number three, discussion of whether the Sacramento index forecast should be expressed as a mean or median assigned to the STT and SSC. Four, review the basis of the Sacramento River Fall Chinook Conservation Objective. This is assigned to the SSC with support from California Department of Fish and Wildlife and National Marine Fisheries Service. Number five, FRAM technical detail documentation assigned to the MU. The STT discussed each of these potential topics with the SSC on Wednesday, September 7th. Topics one and two represent a joint STT SSC technical review of components of the Southern Resident Killer Whale Chinook Salmon Abundance Threshold. 
The technical review would be focused on summarizing changes in the FRAM base period and stock distribution estimates as outlined in the uh, fishery management plan. The STT anticipates that summaries describing changes to the FRAM base period and the Chinook salmon distribution parameters will be available prior to the October methodology review meeting uh, with the responsible parties there being the MU for the base period work and uh, the Northwest Fisheries Science Center for the uh, uh, salmon distribution parameters. While not necessarily part of the annual methodology review, the STT will be prepared to participate in a technical review of these topics with the SSC Salmon Subcommittee at the October meeting. For item three, technical work related to expressing the Sacramento index as a median or a mean has been developed by the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. It is anticipated that documentation will be completed in time for discussion at the methodology review meeting. For item four, a review of the literature underpinning the Sacramento River Fall Chinook Conservation Objective has been in development by a representative of the Southwest Fisheries Science Center, and it is anticipated that this will be ready for discussion at the methodology review meeting. For item five, the STT understands that additional FRAM technical detail documentation is under development and will be ready in time for an update at the methodology review meeting. And that concludes the STT statement. Thank you, Mike. Are there questions for Mike on STT report one? And I don't see any hands. So Mike, please, uh, you can continue with the second STT report. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I have to do a little shuffling on my desktop here, so bear with me, please. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I think I'm ready to go now. Um, I will be referring to, but not reading, agenda item D1A, Supplemental STT Report 2. This is STT Report, uh, update on investigation of effort forecast produced for areas south of Cape Falcon using the Klamath Ocean Harvest Model. Um, so the STT continues to investigate ways to improve effort forecast accuracy made by a submodel within the Klamath Ocean Harvest Model, or KOHM. Uh, we provided a statement on this topic at the June Council meeting where we noted patterns of effort forecast performance and described future work that would be focused on using more contemporary data to improve forecast accuracy. Since June, uh, the STT has met twice in conjunction with the MU to further develop this work. The report uh, that I mentioned before, Supplemental STT Report 2, documents the work done thus far on this item, and I'm just going to give a brief summary of its contents. The report starts by describing patterns of commercial fishery participation in California and Oregon. These are in figures one and two. In general, the fishery participation has declined in, in recent years, uh, approximately 2015 to present, so have some of the lowest levels of fishery participation in the time series. Reduction in commercial fishery participation is most notable in Oregon, and you can see this best in figure three. We then examine the pattern in effort forecast errors for commercial and recreational fisheries. Uh, you can see this in figures four and five. Examination of these plots suggests that there, have been, there has been a propensity to over forecast commercial fishery effort in some areas, particularly central Oregon and Fort Bragg. However, there have also been instances of uh, recent under forecasting of effort in San Francisco. For the recreational fishery, we also note recent instances of over-forecasting effort in Central Oregon and Fort Bragg. We then evaluated whether using more contemporary effort per day open data could improve forecast accuracy. The status quo data range used to forecast effort in the uh, Klamath Ocean Harvest model is from 1998 through the year prior to the management year. We consider two alternative data range scenarios that are more contemporary than that. First one is 2011 forward, and the second one is 2015 forward. To evaluate these three alternatives, we projected effort by month area and fishery in a management year, given the data available at the time, as is done in practice. 
We then compare effort projections to postseason estimates for management years 2019 through 2021 and evaluate the performance of these three data range scenarios. Performance was evaluated using mean percent error and secondarily mean raw error. Figures six and seven dis display the mean percent error results for the commercial and recreational fisheries respectively. Mean raw error results are displayed in figures eight and nine. To summarize the core results for the commercial fishery, the Northern Oregon, Central Oregon, and Fort Bragg effort forecasts were improved most uh, using the most contemporary data range, which again is 2015 to the most recent year with data available. In contrast, the status quo data range of 1998 forward uh, resulted in the best effort forecasting performance in San Francisco and Monterey. This pattern of results is generally similar uh, for the recreational fishery. Based on this, these reports, uh, re these results, the STT offers preliminary recommendations. First, for the commercial fishery, uh, for forecasting effort in commercial fisheries, employ a 2015 forward data range for all managed management areas, except for San Francisco and Monterey, for which the data range would remain the status quo of 1998 forward. And for recreational fisheries, uh, employ the same, a 2015 four data range for all management areas, except for San Francisco and Monterey, for which the data range would remain the status quo of 1998 forward. Uh, the team requests additional time to further consider these recommendations um, with anticipating uh, final recommendations be pr being presented at the November council meeting. And as an aside, um, one item that we've talked about that was not included in this report is um, what would effort forecasts look like and what would catch uh, projections look like in the past year, for instance, um, under the three different um, scenarios described here. And that work is um, going to be happening soon and will be, um, will be um, presented to the council, um, hopefully, at, if we are able to meet in uh, November. And that concludes uh, my summary of the uh, STT report on the effort forecast component of the KOHM. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mike. Are there any questions from Mike on STT report two? Uh, we have a couple hands up. So first, uh, Kyle Addix. Kyle, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, Dr. O'Farrell. Um, this is a subject that I spent a lot of time thinking about, as did others during the preseason process this year, especially the April meeting, and really appreciate all the work that STT um, did to dive into it. We were all scratching our heads a little, trying to understand some differences in stock impacts in the preseason modeling, particularly for Lower Columbia, Thule, Chinook. Um, knowing part of it was due to changes that were made to the FRAM model, FRAM model but just trying to understand, um, did, it, did the rest of it make sense? You kind of answered, got it, the question I have at the end there by telling us what you were gonna be looking at but before the November meeting as you try to finalize these re recommendations, but recognizing all the work that's already gone into it, do you, do you think there are other, any, do you, do you think there are any other big ideas um, you might look at, or is this likely to be the, the recommendation just with doing some ground crew thing with, with what it would have meant in a recent year? Uh, thank you, Mr. Addix. Um, yes, um, I mean, the, the, uh, I guess the thrust of our work thus far has just been trying to do a better job of forecasting effort itself and seeing if these more contemporary data ranges would would improve our effort forecasting ability. Um, we did look into a uh, very kind of a cursory look at whether we we include stock abundance forecasts if that could improve our effort forecasting. And, um, and preliminarily, we, we didn't see a, a lot of um, promise there. And so we've um, sort of, we left that yeah, we did we mentioned it in the report but we have not done um, more work on that component um, we have not um, looked into in great detail uh, changes in methodology when it comes to effort forecasting 
Um, we have looked into changes in the data ranges, and that's we've been pretty limited to that um, uh, just because there's uh, well, it's it's the easiest change to make, and it it also we haven't necessarily had a problem in the past with the the basic. Uh, the basic approaches that we've been using, but we have noticed that you know the, the, the data range that we were using is uh, is quite a long data range, and things have changed in both commercial and recreational fisheries since then. So the focus has been on the data side and not necessarily the methodology side, uh, uh, at least for now. I hope that addressed your question. It did. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kyle. Next, uh, Doug Vincent Lang. Go ahead. Um, doctor, I, this is Doug Lang from Alaska. So a question I have is, as you're running through your analysis of the salmon modeling down there, are you doing any sensitivity analyses to figure out how sensitive those models are to changes in inputs? I, I understand that you're, you're looking at the data inputs, but have you at all given any consideration to to try to model how sensitive the, the these outputs are in your model to changes and, and get some estimate around the error associated with those model outputs? Thanks for the question. Um, I would say that we do some sensitivity analyses or uh, we, we um, get an idea of how sensitive our projections are with this model and other models. Um, based on some changes that we've made in the past. For instance, there's another component of the KOHM uh, that is the um, contact rates per unit of effort. So per unit of effort, how many encounters are you having? And we have recently changed um, data ranges that we use to um, make projections uh, for that component of the model. And we've seen, uh, you know, we have a sense of how sensitive the model is to changes such as that. Um, and I think that um, the work that I alluded to that will be coming in the near future here, um, what we're really interested in is um, catch at, uh, um, projections and and uh, impact pro projections and uh, statement projections uh, that come out of this. And so when um, we're going to be taking it to that next level um, following this. So right now our, our focus has just been on the effort part without um, looking um, too deeply into the, you know, the downstream sort of effects of uh, the rest of the model components added in. Yeah, just as a follow-up, so I, I would think that, that running some kind of sensitivity analysis would help you focus your work on defining what best you could do to improve the performance of the model. So for instance, would you be better off having more fish marked or would you be better off having better collection programs or would you be better off having better est estimated escapement? You know, some kind of sensitivity analysis to figure out just how sensitive that model is to each one of those variables. I think I would want to look at the one that it's most sensitive to is potentially is the best way to fix or, or make the models better. So, that's all, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Doug. I, I see your hand is still up. Did you have another question or does that conclude that? No, I'm not familiar with this format. Sorry, I gotta oh. get, get it down here. Lower hand there. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Other questions for Mike then on STT report two? Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, appreciate the report. Just, I think it was on your your last few um, words uh, in response to the prior question, but I'm hoping you can remind us. Um, I'm thinking back to this cycle and the discussion about model adjustments to KOHM um in light of our overperformance um on age four uh Klamath adults. Um can you remind me, did we at the end of the day make model adjustments in 2022 or did we only 
change the target maximum impact rate cap from the 16% to the 10%? That's the first question. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Remco. Thank you for the question. Um, we did make a um, input change in 2022. The change that was made was to shorten the data range used to forecast the contact rates per unit of effort. And what we're talking about here is the uh, another part of the KOHM, which is the effort per day open. And so essentially the effort per day open uh, is multi or the effort forecasts are multiplied by the contact rates per unit effort. And that's, you know, you know, a lot of the engine of the KOHM when it comes to predicting uh, catch and impacts. So to more directly answer your question, yes, we made a change to one component of the um, KOHM in 2022, um, but this, whatever change that may or may not come from this um, investigation of effort forecasting would be a separate change. Yes, Marcy. Great, thank you. Uh, that's very helpful. Um, okay, next question. Um, I appreciate your explaining the various sub models that are within the KOHM. I, I can't say that I know all of them, so it's it's great to hear you put them all together and and offer perspective um, on that. Thinking about um, the NIMS report that we received, I believe it was in. April uh, regarding um, the revision to um, the biop and the review of the KOHM and its performance. Um, is it correct to say that this work both on the effort component and the um, contact rate component will be feeding into that analysis that uh, I believe is on ongoing at this time? I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer the question about that process. Um, I would say that, you know, our focus is on trying to improve our, um, you know, correspondence between preseason forecasts and postseason estimates. And then, um, you know, we're, we're looking at two and two adjustments to the model in, in two years. Um, and so, I mean, I mean, the council is is aware of this, um, from my understanding, and so it insists too. So, but I'm not sure that I um, can really say with any authority about the um, reconsultation process that's going on right now. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll I'll ask Susan to address that at some point during the discussion. Doesn't have to be right now. Um, just looking for a bit of an update on the the work with regard to the reconsultation, um, just making sure things are progressing on the, the timeline. I was curious um, in my question to Dr. Roe Farrell, um, if this recent work that he's been doing over summer, examining the effort component, as well as the work that was done early in 2022 to examine the contact rate and the adjustments made back in March. Um, just wondering if those analyses will assist the reconsultation process or if we're talking about different analyses that will be going on in that work. Thank you. I don't know if we want to save that for discussion, finish the questions for Mike on the report and then come back to that or give Susan time to ponder that question a little bit. So any other questions then for Mike, John? Uh, yeah, mostly a comment, maybe one question, both for Dr. O'Farrell, but I, re I just wanted to state that uh, I appreciate his work and the work of the STT on this write-up. I, I greatly appreciate these kind of documents. Um, I also enjoyed that the more contemporary data set, you know, had 
appears to be a good choice. Uh, I've been a big advocate of the need to update our our data sets, but this exercise also pointed out that that might not be the best tool for all fisheries. So I really uh, like the uh, STT recommendation and uh, appreciate the ability to use different time series. Uh, I guess my question is, uh, how much, is there a way to quantify or qualify the amount of time that went into this exercise? Because um, they're very valuable, but I know the workload is an issue. So could you speak to that, Dr. O'Farrell? Uh, yes, I can, I can do that. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, this, uh, this work has taken quite a bit of uh, my time um, since April. Um, uh, I think that uh, if we were to do it again in the not too distant future, it would take a lot less time because uh, the machinery is, is essentially built to um, make a change like this uh, or at least to evaluate a potential change like this. Um, we hadn't done any formal um, evaluation of data ranges for the effort forecasting for quite some time. And the last update that occurred um, was it was maybe like a less analysis went into it. I would I would say. So uh, this is something that um, I think that you know we will be able to um, do in the future if necessary um, a little more efficiently than um, than this process has taken uh, this year. Thank you. Does that answer your question, John? Yes, thank you. Okay. Phil. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Dr. O'Farrell. I don't know that my question is going to make any sense, so if it doesn't, just ignore it. Um, I'm, I'm looking at, at um, topics one and two, um, and I'm you know, reflecting on the fact that topic one is going to be, uh, was assigned to the MU and the STT was support from WDFW and the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission and NIMPS. And then uh, topic two is assigned uh, to the SSC with support from Science Center and both Northwest and Southwest. And, and then when I look further in, in the report where it talks about topics one and two, um, I'm trying to figure, we have these, whatever I'm counting, five different, six diff, potential, six different entities that are gonna be participating in both of these technical reviews, three in one, three in another. And it seems to me that they're at the end the end of the day, so to speak, that we're going to have to look at the results of both of those and then determine whether or not we need to make any changes uh, in our um, in our thresholds, perhaps, um, that we've determined uh, to protect uh, southern resident killer whales. Um, so I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how, how those, those two topics and those two reviews get integrated if if in fact my assumption is correct that they are going to have to be integrated at some point so if that didn't make any sense then you can just say sorry phil i can't help you with that well uh thanks for the question mr anderson i can i could try to take a stab at this and see if it uh, satisfactory. Um, my understanding of this is that um, whenever there is a change to um, fram base period or the distribution parameters, the FMP requires a technical review between the STT and the, the SSC um, before a change in the in the thre threshold is um, is undertaken, and so. There have been updates um, to the base period, fram base period and then and, and the uh, distribution models that were used initially um, in the in the 
derivation of the um, threshold. And now since those have been updated, we're here to perform a technical review. And depending on the, on the outcome of that technical review, then I think that there is a possibility of a change in the threshold that would re result from that. And so um, that's sort of, that's my limited understanding. I think that this is the first time we've done this, of course. Um, that's my limited understanding of the, um, what we're um, trying to convey here. So I hope that at least came close to addressing your question. Yes, Phil, go ahead. Yeah, um, thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, and um, thanks, Dr. O'Farrell. Yeah, that 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 um, helped a lot, helped a lot. So, in terms of determining whether a change is needed in the threshold or not, is that would we um, could we uh, in, should we anticipate that the answer to that question would be forthcoming in the reports that come out of the technical review of these? of these two and would that likely surface in November? Yes, I, um, I'm not completely sure. I, I could envision that uh, a report that comes out from this technical review would say something like um, the changes that we've uh, reviewed are technically sound or not. And then what happens after that um, I can't, I, I can't say that I know exactly how the, the process that occurs after that. And there may be other people who could be, or certainly are more informed about that than I am. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Further questions for Dr. O'Farrell? Oh, I'm sorry, Robin. And um, Robin, can you hold off for just a minute? Uh, Douglas Vincent Lang has his hand up also. Douglas, would you go ahead? Yeah, yeah Phil, Phil kind of sparked a question in my mind that I was going to ask earlier, and that is, especially if the thresholds for the southern resident killer whales change, that has broader implications than, than just fisheries in the, that are under the jurisdiction of the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Will there be an opportunity to have other um, review by other parties that may be potentially affected by that before the decisions are made to finalize those model outputs? For instance, a change in that threshold level could have a significant impact on Alaska fisheries, and we're just trying to figure out whether whether there'd be an opportunity to provide some review of that through either the treaty process or through other processes. I'm not sure if that question was directed toward me, um, but uh, I, I'm not sure, that I, I'm certain actually that I'm not the right person to answer that. So I, um, but there may okay. be other folks. Maybe it's just, uh, maybe it's not a question, maybe it's just, it, a suggestion that as you proceed through that um, analysis that has potential implications broader than just the the fisheries under the jurisdiction of the Pacific um, Council that you might consider the the need to have some some broader review of that since it impacts other fisheries along the coast. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Susan Bishop, do you want to respond to that? <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I would just make the observation that this is not a change in the approach. So this is the the approach that we used to set the threshold was outlined in all the work that the ad hoc work group did, and it's captured in the FMP language. The FMP language acknowledges, just like we do for all of other work that the council does, if there is new and better science that comes along, we adapt our models, etc., to incorporate that new science. So the language in the FMP allows the council to make periodic adjustments in response to better information. Um, the current language asks the SSC, the STT, and the council collectively to review this particular information and make a decision, I think probably in November, as to sort of uh, the scientific groups, the STT and the SSC, um, whether they consider this information best available science. Um, and then the council would make a decision about the adjustment, the uh, 
adjustment of the of the threshold in incorporating that new information. Um, in response to one of the questions that was asked, one of the things that could be done, um, similar to what we did, I believe in, I can't believe now, if remember now if it was March or April, but the STT could present a report or provide a presentation as to what the combination of the information resulted in with regard to the threshold in November, assuming that they may, uh, made the conclusion that the adjustments or that the information that's being presented, the new information does represent best available science. Just one suggestion on a way forward. Okay. Is that helpful? Thank you. Um, Doug D Douglas, does that answer your question there? Well, I, I think it does, but those for southern resident killer whales tie to a lot of different fisheries and a lot of different decisions that are made at different levels. So to the extent that those threshold levels would change based on the best available science, there, there would be interest by other parties in, in being involved in, in that how that methodology is is improved or constructed. So, no, but thank you, Susan, that did to help. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we, we still have Dr. O'Farrell here um, clarifying or any other questions for him on these reports before we get into public comment and discussion. And Robin Elke, you had your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I think Susan Bishop articulated what I was going to say in that the, with the work that the STT and the SSC is uh, proposing to do through the methodology review that's relative to the killer well threshold, that's just the first step that is outlined in the FMP on what needs to be done. And it will be for the council to decide what that threshold, what to do with that information, I suppose. So I wouldn't expect the any of the reports to have any recommendations, just yes, the information's technically sound and here's what's changed and this appears to be the best available science at this time. All right, thank you. And that's something we can bring up again during discussion if we need to explore that further. So one last look around here and call for other questions. Otherwise, uh, we can relieve Dr. O'Farrell of his task right now. And I'm not seeing any hands. So that completes the advisory body reports. Uh, when we started this, we had no signups for public comment. I just wanna confirm we still have no public comments. So that concludes all our reporting and we can move on then to council discussion and action. So our Action items are listed there. Again, um, as Robin stated, typically this is not done through motion, but uh, affirmation by the council that items are ready to go for the methodology review in October. And um, which of those items go forward? We have five. And then any improvements for the Klamath Ocean Harvest Model. So I'll open up the floor, uh, look for any hands here on uh, discussion or comments from the council. And I see Kyle Addicts has his hand up, so please go ahead, Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I'll just say briefly, I support the, the three items that really have the relevance north of Falcon 1, 2, and 5 on the list. I know that um, WDFW staff are prepared to, to make the contributions they need to make to push these forward through methodology review. I think 1 and 2, um, we knew back in April that we were going to have to tackle and um, update the science as the FMP says we should do on that killer whale threshold. Um, I would be interested in seeing if we could um, ask the, the STT and SSC not only to, to go back and confirm whether or not the, the new models are best available science, but it would make sense to me if, if they say yes, to ask them to go ahead and tell us what the new threshold would be, not that the council will have to act on that right away, but it seems like that's an easy step. Um, once they get through the reviews and one and two to go ahead and tell us, okay, this is what the updated threshold might be. Um, so I'll leave it at that, but again, supportive of the, the items that have relevance to North of Falcon. All right, thank you. Other 
comes Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll be happy to pick up uh, the South of Falcon piece here, and that would be items three and four. Um, certainly support um, the inclusion of these two items on the work list. Um, Want to speak for a second to the item four, which is the uh, review of the basis behind the SAC fall conservation objective, and it's primarily a literature review um, of the work that was um, relied upon in establishing the current conservation objective. There's been some additional discussion about other literature that is um, newer um, that might be more useful um, and informative in the future. Um, should there be um, a fresh look taken at uh, a conservation objective for SAC fall. Um, the SSC statement speaks to a recommendation of incorporating the information from the more recent studies as appropriate. Um, I believe that literature search has already, you know, largely been done anyway. So I just to be clear, I think we, we certainly support um, a comprehensive literature review um, that does include both um, the past science that was relied upon in establishing the current objective, but also that might inform us uh, should we take um, the next step in, in looking at um, what might be a, a new or refreshed or more appropriate uh, conservation objective in the future. But I want to caveat uh, my support for that by just noting that um, the, the task at hand uh, for the methods review is the literature review. And that's the discrete bite that I understood we'd be taking uh, at this point in time. So um, discussing the literature, looking at the literature um, as part of the methods review, I think is what we had tasked them with. And I'm expecting that's how things will go um, at the methods review. So um, anyway, I support uh, the discussions that have taken place on this topic and um, looking forward to uh, the reports back. Thanks. Thank you, Marcy. And I, I do want to step back a minute there. There was a question you had um, during Dr. O'Farrell's presentation to NIMS that, that seemed more appropriate. Um, did you want to address that now, Susan? relative to the biop, Marcy, please. Yes, thank you. I was, I'm looking at the council action items on the screen and that I think falls more under item three. Okay. So I don't know if we were working sequentially through we'll, it, but. Let's uh, take care items one and two first then, thank you. Any other um, comments or discussion regarding the methodology review. We've heard support for moving all five items forward and that they are ready to move forward. Before we finish up items one and two, Marcy, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair. I just, I wanna thank the, the STT um, and the SSC for this list. And it's, it's so nice and refreshing to read that all of these topics are ripe and they're all doable. Um, I think in past years, there's been a lot of uncertainty about what's gonna be ready, um, kind of get get on, you know, we take we talk about preliminary topic selection, I think back in uh, June or April and then summer happens and um, we kind of have a, a much smaller list by the time we get to September. So I just wanna commend uh, the work that has gone on in the background to um, be able to get to the point where all of these items uh, appear to be ready to go. So thanks. Thank you for that comment. Yes, as we heard, there are a number of uh, bodies or entities involved in these reviews. So before we finish up items one and two on our list, um, let me, um, oh, Kyle, I see your hand is up there. Please. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, sorry to drag this out, but a, a thought crossed my mind. Um, we're, we're undertaking one and two because of changes to our, our fishery model frame, as well as to the, the distribution model that was used as part of developing that killer whale threshold. 
we made a lot of changes to Fram. We did a major upgrade to the base period, updating it to more recent years, and then have had a number of iterations since then as we refine the bugs that were discovered with that big upgrade. I don't anticipate um, changes to Fram as frequent in the near future as we've seen in the past years. I'm less clear on the, the distribution model and when we might see additional changes to that and when it might need, mean that the council needs to take that, this up again through first the methodology review and then updating a threshold. And that's not a question necessarily, but if anybody else has any insight into when we might need to um, update anything for models in the future, it might be good to discuss. Okay, thank you, Kyle. Any response to that or anything else on, on the methodology review, Susan? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, we are aware that the Northwest Fishery Science Center uh, is doing some additional work on the distribution of spring Chinook that could affect the, um, at some point, the threshold. But I mean, to me, that is consistent with what the FMP envisions. And so as most of us know, there's been a lot of new information that's come out in recent years on killer whales. Um, so that isn't unusual. Um, the council at some point may want to have some discussion about the frequency in which we evaluate inf information that's coming out um, and uh, how we might uh, integrate that into the process. But um, I am aware that that analysis is going on, but I don't see that as different than um, any new information that might come out. And my understanding is that that analysis may be available um, around the first of the year, but it's unclear at this point. As you, as you all know, it's uh, quite a heavy lift. All right, thank you. Further comments on the methodology review? Otherwise, I will ask Robin on that piece. If you have all the info that you need to proceed with the methodology review in October, and there were some other uh, comments or that you might keep as notes um, regarding future topics or actions. But for this, do you have enough to proceed with the methodology review? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I do have enough information in that all five items uh, would be moved forward. Um, but I did hear during this discussion um, on how the information that is within items one and two uh, might be expanded. Um, I think there was a mention from Mr. Addicts about assigning the STT and the SSC to actually provide what a new threshold might be um, given this new information. And I just want to clarify if that is the expectation or not. Uh, right now, I, it, it was not, um, I, I did not uh, consider that to be an expectation. And so I, I would need to know so that I could help direct the teams. All right, I'm gonna turn back to Kyle then and ask him if that was an expectation uh, he he was wanting to see from that review. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I don't think I necessarily said it was an expectation, but wanted to get the uh, the suggestion out there that it might not be too hard a step to take and might put us in a at a better place as we move into preseason planning next year if we went ahead and took that step. So, um, and I don't know if other council members have similar feelings, but it seems like it would be a a relatively easy. Um, step to take that that would be beneficial um, and if if it is a more work than I'm thinking it is um, I'm, I'm happy to stand corrected but that, that's how I was looking at it all right thank you Phil um, well just a little bit of discussion on on that point um, I mean I I don't think it would be a good idea to wait until March to discover we have a new threshold. So if we have the information to make that determination as once these reviews are complete, um, I mean, I just don't know what the thinking is here in terms of the timing of changing thresholds, but changing thresholds in the 
March, April time frame is not ideal from my perspective. I don't know what was anticipated in terms of using this analysis for that purpose. Susan, did you want to respond? Thank you, Mr. Anderson, for the question. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, my understanding is that, that the analysis that's being done um, and the effect on the distributional model won't be available until after the first of the year. So very close to the start of our preseason planning process. Um, I am assuming that, and I could stand corrected, um, it might be worth council staff checking in with the SSC and the S, uh, STT with regard to that assumption, but that's what I understand from the authors of the analysis. Um, it, so that would be a new piece of information and it would, it seems to me, it might need to go through the same uh, vetting process that we went through with the um, fall Chinook change in distribution. Um, I don't believe that the SSC or the STT has, has um, because the analysis is available, hasn't had a chance to weigh in on the spring assessment. Phil? Uh, I'm just trying to understand what the expectation is here. I mean, are you, are you are you saying that we might find a new threshold in your guidance letter the first week of March? Go ahead, Susan. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. No, I'm not suggesting that. What I'm suggesting is that the new information would need to go through the same process, which took several months as the fall distribution information would, would um, did to assure us that it's the best available uh, science. And so it would not be available and we would not have had the input from the STT and the SSC as well as council discussion by March on that particular piece of information. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, thank you. Kyle, uh, your hand is up, please go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and I hope I didn't cause a bunch of confusion here. I was thinking that as the SDT and SSC do the methodology review on the current version of FRAM and the newest current version of the Chinook distribution model, that they would come back and tell us what the threshold was based on that. The sort of additional future step of another updated um, Chinook distribution model with springs I was thinking that was something that would go into the methodology review possibly next year. So we would be talking about the, the models that are in existence um, through methodology review, through getting a new threshold value if they are determined to be the best available science. And we'd be going from there dealing with another up, potential update to the ocean distribution model further into the future. Um, and maybe I'm misunderstanding what the current plan is, but that's how I was thinking of it. Okay, thank you, Kyle. So let me look around the table and ask if there's agreement also, Robin, if she understood that. Uh, what it sounds like to me is, uh, I hate to, to use the phrase, but if there's an easy button as this goes through the methodology review to use the current models to see if there is an update to the threshold model, they would bring that to us. But if there isn't that easy button, it, it's not necessary to come back to us. Is, is that what we're looking for? Susan? I'm not, I'm assuming that the question, everyone's looking at me, so it was a question that uh, we're looking for an answer. Uh, I'm not sure that I would, I would characterize it as an easy button. I would just say that we need to be consistent with the process that's in the FMP and in the biological opinion. And that would require, I believe, more time than what we will have after the analysis is completed. Um, from what I understand, that information won't be available till after the first of the year, and that would not allow the process outlined in the FMP to be completed in time for the preseason salmon okay. planning process. Thank yes. you. So, Phil. 
I'm sorry to have to ask this, but I'm confused. Um, so we have these two pieces in our methodology review, issue one and issue two. Um, that are in the pipeline. We're gonna get the analysis. We're gonna get the technical review. We're gonna get the results of that in November. Then thrown into the mix in this discussion was the potential of having something on Spring Chinook come out in January or sometime after the first of the year. And I totally understand how that would then go through some additional review before it would potentially be used to modify the threshold. So, um, but to me, that's, to me, that was separate from what we are looking at now in issues one and two. It didn't have anything to do with the analysis of the distribution of spring chinook. So why I'm confused by all that is I, I get that part and it's separate, it's on a separate track, separate process. But relative to these reviews that are going on right now that could result in a change in the threshold as I understand it, would that change in the, would that potential change in the threshold, when would that occur? Would that occur in effect 2023 or is, which is what I thought I may be mistaken. And that is a question for you, Susan. Please. Thank you, Mr. Anderson, for the question to the vice chair. That would occur in 2023. So my understanding of the process is that the SSC and STT are reviewing the information under methodol or methodology review or could review it, depending on the council decision methodology review for number one and number two. That will be brought back to the council in November for decision. The outcome of that would be applied next year in 2023. That confirms what I thought. It was the spring Chinook piece that was being thrown in the midst of all that discussion that's on a different timeline and process that began to make me wonder what we were doing under one and two. So thanks for that clarification. All right, further discussion on that or Robin, I, I will turn back to you. Um, sorry, I, I may have missed a hand. Did somebody else online? Kyle, please. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Now that I think we've got all that sorted out, at least in my head, I think I would like to request that, assuming that um, through the technical reviews of both of the models, the, the conclusion is reached that those are the best available science to use to recalculate the threshold for fisheries in 2023, that we ask the STT to just go ahead and do that calculation and tell us what that threshold is based on that latest best available science. All right, thank you. Head nods around the table. I'm seeing support for that to go forward. So Robin, did you catch that piece to add in them on the threshold values? Yes, I did. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Vice Chair, message received. So um, we got all five items moving forward. And as part of that included in the STT statement, they'll do their best to um, uh, determine what a updated threshold may be given the new information. Um, I, they haven't uh, ran through that analysis before. We all know it's first time out of the gate. And we all know that Unfortunately, November isn't that far off, but knowing the STT, I bet they can do it. But um, with that, yes, we have everything we need under this portion of agenda item D1, items one and two. 
All right, thank you. Then let's finish this out with a discussion of the Klamath Ocean Harvest Model and looking for any hands, Marcy. Yes, um, just to reiterate the question that I posed earlier to Dr. O'Farrell, um, I'm, I imagine you heard that exchange, but I'm, I'm looking for um, maybe just a brief update from NIMS on whether the work that was undertaken in this uh, STT report too, which we heard was quite extensive, took quite a bit of time um, on behalf of Dr. O'Farrell as well as the STT, I heard that, you know, they had more than multiple meetings to accomplish uh, this work. I'm just wondering, will it feed into the reconsultation? Um, and uh, along with the um, adjustment made in March to the contact rates, um, the reason for the question is, of, of course, we, we know that we've been notified that a reconsultation is in progress. Um, I understood that um, the, the same folks would likely be involved um, in working on the models and that the, the update to, or the reconsultation would be limited to a model review, model reviews, um, considering of adjustments to models, et cetera. So that, that was the scope that was presented to us uh, back in March, I believe, was that it was a, a technical review of the model and not beyond that. So um, we are expecting that we're not going to hear the outcome of that until March, which is going to be unfortunate, but I'm just wondering if you can give us in any idea of how that work is going, if this uh, extra work that was conducted this summer um, that we have here today um, will, has, has helped you make progress, I guess is the way to, to couch it. Susan. Um, thank you, Mr. Yoremko, for the question um, to the chair, vice chair. Um, the biological opinion uh, will be on the um, council action for the California Coastal Chinook, which is a proposed um, conservation objective of no more than a 16% age four harvest rate on Klamath Chinook. So the question that we need to assess is whether or not that uh, objective is um, uh, uh, would cause jeopardy or not. Um, other, as you know, well know, the information is still very limited. So many of the same reasons that we chose that proxy to begin with are still in place. There's not a lot of additional information uh, about that ESU. Um, we will incorporate in our assessment of that whatever the best available science is and using the best available science, or best available tools. So part of that will be the KOHM model and it will be um, the best uh, version of that model. We'll still need to go back and talk to uh, Dr. O'Farrell and other folks that are technical experts on that, but that would be our intent. Um, the difficulty that we have had in recent years has not been so much the objective itself. It, it, it has been um, I, our, our ability to uh, manage the fisheries to stay within it, which is what caused the reinitiation last year. Um, so I know we are spending a lot of time on that, and this this was an, this uh, work that the STT did was one element of that. Okay, thank you. Other, Marcy, go ahead. And then thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Just to reconfirm, though, we we don't expect that work, the reconsultation work, to be complete until March. Is that correct? So we will be getting presumably the guidance um, in the March letter, and that will be our first indication of what the new threshold might be. Is that correct? Thank you, Ms. Uramko. I think there are sort of two questions that we will need to talk about going into the 2023 season. So one is what the biological opinion concludes about the conservation objective. And then the second question is, um, 
what additional uh, issues might we might might we need to discuss with regards to how the fisheries will be managed to stay with under that that cons uh, conservation objective? And I see those as potentially two different questions. Um, both of them will come to play in our guidance letter for next year. Um, our intent is to talk with the parties early and often. So we've already engaged in conversations with um, uh, CDF and W about next year, and we will continue those conversations from now uh, through March. We are trying our best to complete the consultation um, if we're if we can before the end of the year. Um, but there's poss certainly the possibility that that don't, won't happen before um, very close to our planning for next year. Thank you. Any follow up, Marcy? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Are, are we in discussion? Yes. Okay. Um, just to respond, um, thank you, um, Susan. Your your understanding um, is the same as mine and has been consistent uh, since we begun this discussion. Um, I appreciate um, the efforts to communicate um, routinely as we have been uh, throughout the summer um, on the situation and the developments and, you know, whatever you can share in terms of how um, NIFS is formulating um, the recommendations, the earlier we have to plan and to think about how um, we will be incorporating those changes into the 2023 preseason process, the earlier the better. Um, thinking about the situation, um, it's, we know that, um, we have had some significant overages and we appreciate the, the fresh look at, at the model and its performance and how we do better. Um, just want to thank the the out the stt for the recommendations they've made in the report to us i think they do um, advance the thinking um and certainly confirm um what um what we have been using um as base periods for san francisco and monterey are probably the best we can do um with the information we have right now um so I just want to uh, say that, you know, we appreciate the, the dialogue continuing. Um, and I like hearing that you expect to conclude the work by the end of the year, because uh, certainly I wouldn't want to get to March and hear that we have to embark on a brand new, uh, say, management strategy for um, Klamath stocks um, and try to build a series of um, management plans or actions um, in short order um, with only a you know between March and April. So the sooner we can we can talk and um, think through some things. Um, you know, of course, with our goal being where we don't want to disrupt fisheries. We want to be transparent and do the best we can to uh, ensure that our process is inclusive and thorough uh, and transparent, um, hopefully before we get to March. So uh, anyway, just appreciate this discussion here today. And um, I know you're working hard in the background. So thanks for the update. Susan. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I would uh, also like to express my um, appreciation for California's engagement and all the help that the staff has provided. This is a very difficult situation. Um, it has not been for lack of trying on a lot of fronts. Um, we worked very hard last season to make adjustments to the model, a lot of analysis in a very short time period, great, uh, a lot of collaboration with the fishermen. Um, with the state, um, with the council staff. So this is a tough problem, and I appreciate the engagement that we have had and I commit to being as, as transparent in terms of when we have the information as we can. Okay, thank you. 
So I'm gonna look around once more um, for any hands or comments. The KOHM will work in progress. We got an update today. It will be come before us or come back to us at a future meeting. So Robin, is there anything else we need there? No, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I think you've covered that as well. You'll hear again, like you said, from the STT in November on the same topic. All right, thank you. I believe that closes out this agenda item and I will gladly return the gavel to our chairman. All right, thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair Hassemer. Um, before we move on to halibut, which are our last two agenda items for the day, uh, we're gonna take a break. We've been at this for a while, but we're also running a bit behind schedule. We have a reception this evening. So uh, we'll be back at 3.45.
Okay, why don't we find our way to our seats and we'll get started with halibut. All right, we're on agenda item E1, Pacific Halibut Management, and I'll turn to Staff Officer Robin Elke to get it started. Robin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is agenda item E1, uh, talking about the 2023 catch hearing plan and annual regulations. So under Council Operating Procedure COP9, uh, the Council meets each September to talk about the any proposed changes in the halibut catch sharing plan and annual regulations for area 2A. Uh, the council has attachments one and two uh, for them, which uh, has the current catch sharing plan and a visual representation of the 2022 area 2A catch sharing plan as well and how those are allocated among the different groups. Um, the proposed changes that we discuss typically are most often related to the sports fishery season structures. So under this agenda item, you'll have two reports, one from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and another from Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. We also have a supplemental report from NIMPS that just outlines the harvest to date for the 2022 Area 2A halibut fisheries. And from your advisory body, you have a supplemental report from the GAP. Um, right now, doesn't look like anybody signed up for public comment. Uh, for your action under this item, uh, we would ask the council to adopt for public review any of the proposed changes to the halibut catch sharing plan for 2023 and the annual fishery regulations as well. And with that, that concludes my agenda item overview. All right, thank you, Robin, very much. Um, let's see if there are any questions of Robin on the overview. And if there are not, we'll turn to our reports. All right, I'll go down my list here. We'll, we'll start with Jessica Watson. Welcome to the table. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to summarize ODFW's supplemental report. ODFW considered public input received during the public meetings in Oregon coastal ports and provides the following information for consideration for the council in determining which alternatives to adopt for further public review for the 2023 fishery. For allowing long leader gear fishing on the same trip with all depth halibut and sablefish, Pacific cod and other flatfish uh, was added to the groundfish regulations adopted by the council and anticipated to be implemented by uh, National Marine Fisheries Service beginning in 2023. Therefore, it needs to be implemented into the halibut regulations in order to be available for the 2023. So we provide the following alternatives for review. Status quo, the long leader gear fishing can be combined with all depth halibut or anglers can keep sablefish, Pacific cod and other flatfish with all depth halibut. Alternative one is allow long leader gear fishing and retention of sablefish, Pacific cod, and other flatfish with all depth halibut on the same trip. And our rationale for this alternative is that the retention of most species of ground fish is prohibited when participating in the all depth halibut fisheries to reduce the potential for interactions with and impacts to yellow eye rockfish. Since the long leader gear is specifically designed to avoid yellow eye rockfish, and has been demonstrated successful in that goal, allowing it when fishing for all depth halibut would add little if any additional risk to yellow eye rockfish. This alternative allows anglers additional fishing opportunities while they are offshore. And currently if an angler incidentally catches and retains sablefish, Pacific cod and other flatfish, they cannot then go long leader fishing on the same trip. They have to choose one or the other. The original intent of this request was to provide additional opportunity rather than alternate opportunity. So the projected impacts to yellow eye rockfish were included in the 2023-2024 biennial groundfish harvest specifications and management measures analysis and all sources of mortality for Oregon recreational fisheries, including this opportunity are projected to be well within Oregon recreational harvest guidelines for yellow eye rockfish. And additional impacts to salmon are also projected to be minor. With regards to proposed alternatives for central Oregon coast all depth opening dates, 
In recent years, with the Area 2A allocation of approximately 1.5 million pounds, the Central o Oregon Coast subarea spring all depth season has not fully attained the season's allocation of approximately 169,000 pounds, rolling over pounds into summer season. To allow additional opportunity, anglers requested the season begin early when the allocation is high. So the alternatives, which may be combined, include status quo, the Central Oregon Coast sub-area spring all-depth spring season opens the second Thursday in May, and alternative one, if the Central Oregon Coast sub-area spring all-depth allocation is greater than 100,000 pounds, the season will open May 1st. And our rationale here is the spring all-depth season would open May 1st, approximately 10 to 12 days earlier than the traditional second Thursday in May opening. ODFW would still meet with anglers after the IPHC annual meeting, which announces the quota and determine how many days per week it would be open, which weeks would be open, and if any should be skipped due to large morning low tides, which has been done in the past. With the approximate 1.5 million pound area to allocation the last four years, the resulting fishing fishery allocations the spring all depth season has left 50 to 100,000 pounds unharvested. At the recent allocation and effort levels combined with harvest rates, opening May 1st would have been accommodated without exceeding the spring allocation, even being open seven days per week in May and June, as in 2022. ODFW is recommending a trigger at 100,000 pounds for the spring all depth season so that at lower allocation levels, the season would retain the current second Thursday in May opening spreading opportunity out through May, June, and potentially July. With regards to Central Oregon Coast subarea daily bag limit, based on the progress of the fishery in recent years, anglers have requested the option to have two fish bag limit for all or part of the spring all depth season. So we provide the following alternatives, status quo, at the conclusion of the spring all depth season, IPHC, NIMPS, the council and ODFW will consult to determine whether increasing the bag limit to two fish is warranted with the intent of taking the subarea allocation by September 30th. Alternative one is if the central coast sub area allocation, all depth and nearshore combined is 200,000 pounds or greater, the daily bag limit may be increased to two fish per day based on consultation between ODFW, NIMPS, IPHC and the council with the intent of taking the entire sub area allocation by September 30th. And our rationale here is that during the public meetings, anglers expressed interest in front loading the season with additional opportunities rather than having that um, increase occur at the tail end of the season. Modifying the bag limit earlier in the season would provide this additional opportunity for anglers to harvest this allocation and increasing the bag limit to two fish per day in May or June could increase effort and catches enough to take the entire spring allocation as well as a portion of the summer and or near shore allocation. The bag limit has not been uh, two fish during May or June in over 20 years. Therefore, it is highly uncertain what the increased bag limit would, would do to angler behavior and catch rates. So ODFW will need and will track yellow eye rockfish bycatch and mortality carefully to ensure that it does not become too high and potentially impact the recreational groundfish fishery. With regards to the Central Oregon Coast all depth open days for the last several years, anglers expressed a desire to have the all depth fishery open seven days per week. ODFW received a lot of positive feedback about the fishery being open seven days per week in May and June of 2022 and expressed a desire for it to continue and possibly expand. The recreational bottom fish fishery has been open to all depth in May, June, September and October in 2022. The alternatives that we are proposing um, can also be combined with status quo. If the Central Oregon Coast sub area spring all depth allocation is greater than 100,000 pounds, the season may open up to seven days per week starting the second Thursday in May through June 30th, then open every Thursday through Saturday, except weeks that can be skipped to avoid adverse tides and if it fall and if after the first summer all depth opening, the first Thursday through Saturday in August. It is estimated there will be 60,000 pounds or more remaining on the central coast combined near shore and all depth quotas remaining. The all depth fishery may open up to seven days per week beginning September 1. Alternative one is if the central Oregon coast sub area spring all depth allocation is greater than 100,000 pounds, 
The season may open up to seven days per week during months when the bottom fish fishery is not depth restricted. During months, the bottom fish fishery is depth restricted. It would be open Thursday through Saturday. And if it, if, and if it is estimated, there will be 60,000 pounds or more remaining on the central coast combined near shore and all depth quotas after August 1st. The all depth fishery may be open to seven days per week during months where the bottom fish fishery is not depth restricted. And our rationale here is that the all depth months for 2023 will be um, set at the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission here in December of 2022. And since bottom fish and halibut are allowed on the same trip, when both are open to all depth fishing, opening the central coast all depth halibut fishery seven days per week during months when the bottom fish fishery is open to all depth would provide more all depth halibut fishing without reducing anglers opportunity to retain instantly caught incidentally caught halibut when bottom fish fishing as it would as it would when bottom fish is not open at all depths so it would reduce some complexity in the the regulations this proposal does not include the columbia river sub area due to co-management with washington and trying to align openings in the sub area with other open washington sub areas the southern Oregon sub area is already open all depths seven days per week with bottom fish retention allowed in areas open to bottom fish at the recent allocation effort levels combined with harvest rates, being open seven days per week for a longer period of time uh, would have been accommodated without exceeding the spring allocation. And ODFW is recommending that trigger of 100,000 pounds for the five spring all depth season. So at lower allocation levels, the season would retain the current three day opening spreading opportunity out through May, June and potentially July. For the summer all depth season, ODFW would consult with NIMS and the IPH and IPHC in July to determine how much quota remains in the central Oregon coast sub area, all depth and near shore combined and other Oregon sub areas, how fisheries have progressed to date and bycatch impacts on key species such as yellow eye. Based on this consultation, it could be announced before August 1st whether the fishery would be open seven days per week. This schedule should allow anglers, charter operators and fishing related businesses to prepare for the additional opportunity. With regards to the draft catch share plan language. ODFW does not have proposed changes to the language in the catch share plan for the above items at this time. And as the alternatives are finalized, ODFW will draft the appropriate language revisions to the catch share plan in consultation with staff at the NIMS West Coast region and council. ODFW staff would also like to work with NIMS and council staff to ensure language in the catch share plan continues to allow for flexible in-season management of the recreational halibut fisheries in response in a responsive and timely manner. As the catch share plan language is developed, we support the development of provisions that can streamline the process and reduce delays or other challenges in the federal rulemaking process and timeline. And with that, I conclude my report and we'll take questions. All right, thank you very much, Jessica. Are there any questions of Jessica? Marcy Uremko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Um, I'm looking at the Central Coast Daily Bag Limit section, and I just want to make sure I'm understanding exactly what Alternative 1 uh, provides. Um, it sounds like it would allow for an increase to a two-fish limit uh, as early as May. Um, does that mean you're proposing to start the season could be proposing to start the season at a two fish bag limit. And can you remind me about the other sub areas if you have a two fish daily limit? Thanks. Thank you for that question, Marcy. Uh, yeah, so there would be the potential to allow for a two fish bag limit under that alternative to start the season if there was enough allocation is my understanding. So two fish would apply to um the central sub area as well as the south sub area but not columbia river because that's co-managed with washington so that would remain a one fish bag limit Thank you. further questions on the odf and w report all right uh, let me check online here thank you jessica we'll now go to the wdfw report uh, lorna wargo Um, Heather's got it. Okay, I'm sorry, I have a different name here. 
Go ahead, Heather. Thanks, Chair. I was just going to say that I'll summarize our report. Sure. Um, so this is agenda item B1A, our WDFW report. Um, we met with our recreational <coughs> halibut um, stakeholders on uh, August 9th to discuss changes to the cat sharing plan for 2023. Um, the first part of our report summarizes the 2022 halibut season and provides some context for our recommended changes. Um, the recreation, recreational halibut season in 2022 mirrored the general approach taken to set the season structure in Washington sub areas in recent seasons. Changes to the cat sharing plan for 2022 focused on the need to increase flexibility to maximize fishing opportunity and achieve the Washington sport allocation across all sub areas, including allowing opening uh, coastal and Puget Sound sub areas up to five days per week in August and September. This season saw mostly a return to pre-pandemic operations coastwide with all of our coastal ports open uh, for the first time since 2020. However, other factors such as severe inclement weather, particularly on the coast, signif significantly affected fishing effort. Bar closures coincided with days open for halibut for some ports. Notably, all coastal ports experienced multiple delays, including preseason fixed dates and dates added in season in May and June, in which no effort was observed. Columbia River, um, six days, South Coast, which is Marine Area 2, four days, North Coast, Marine Areas 3 and 4, three days, and uh, Puget Sound, which is Marine Areas 5 through 10, recorded effort on all days open, averaging approximately 1,100 anglers per week compared to about 1,800 anglers per week in 2021. Reduced effort was also attributed to high fuel costs, the Washington uh, statewide average June gasoline prices was $5.48 compared to less than $3.80 for the same month in 2021, and prices were higher than averages in coastal counties. Recognizing a substantial amount of quota would likely remain by the end of May, WDFW conferred with NIMS to consider adding dates to the June schedule for coastal marine areas with info input from stakeholders, WDFW announced on June 3rd, two additional days for the Columbia River um, and South Coast sub areas, and three additional days for the North Coast sub area, basing catch projections on productive fishing days in May. However, due to continued poor weather, the extra fishing time did not result in substantial catch. Statewide quota attainment was about 22% at the end of May and about 56% at the end of June. Continuing the expansion of opportunity in the Puget Sound sub area, rain areas 6 through 10 opened in early April in 2022 compared to mid-April in 2021 and a full month earlier than recent seasons and maintained a three-day per week season structure which had been expanded from two days per week starting in 2020. The earlier 2022 season start date was scheduled with some trepidation because the consequence of opening in early April was uncertain. However, at least under this year's circumstances, it served to bolster catch and did not preclude later opportunity. Following the closure of the halibut fishery at the end of June, WDFW again conferred with NIMS and met with stakeholders to consider how to structure a late summer fishery. Per the catch sharing plan, additional opportunity could be scheduled for August and September. And consistent with flexibility in the catch sharing plan, adherence to sub area quotas was relaxed, which meant scheduling could aim for full utilization of Washington's quota while also providing opportunity across all sub areas. With these dual objectives and consideration for regulatory and fishery monitoring constraints in mid July, WDFW announced six additional fishing days for the Columbia River and South Coast sub areas and a five day per week opener beginning August 11th through September 5th, shifting to seven days per week from September 6th through September 30th in the North Coast sub, sub area. And a seven day per week opener for Puget Sound beginning August 11th through September 30th. All openers um, are contingent on sufficient remaining statewide 
quota. The flexibility to share uh, sub area quotas uh, undertaken in response to conditions stemming from the pandemic supports angler access to the full Washington sport halibut allocation and will likely continue to be an extremely valuable tool into the future. So with that information, uh, proposed changes to the catch sharing plan uh, for 20, this should say 2023, um, were discussed at our meeting on August 9th. Um, and really we heard broad support for continuing the general season structure ad adopted in 2020 um, for the North Coast, South Coast and Columbia River sub areas with a common theme of increasing the opportunity to catch more of the sport allocation earlier in the season by increasing the number of days per week that the fishery can be open. So for the Puget Sound sub area, which is the only sub area with um, options, uh, the status quo um, is always an option that the two changes here, option one would revise the catch sharing plan language to allow openings of up to five days per week during April, May, and June, and up to seven days per week if there's sufficient quota to allow additional openings in August and September. Option two for the Puget Sound sub area would um, allow season openings up to seven days per week in the early season, which is April, May, and June, and up to seven days per week if there's enough quota uh, to allow additional openings in August and September. The rationale here is, is just um, providing access to the Puget, to stakeholders in the Puget Sound sub area. Um, so there's less quota remaining at the end of August and September. Um, looking for um, uh, more of the fishery to occur earlier in the year. Um, these options would allow discussions uh, during the um, public review period uh, on the trade-offs with opening earlier in April and more days per week and interest in ensuring that the fishery in the Puget Sound sub area is open through Memorial Day, which has been a common discussion point in the past. Uh, for the North Coast, the South Coast, in the Columbia River area, there are no uh, changes to the catch sharing plan that are proposed uh, for these sub areas, but I would note that um, for the South Coast sub area, part of our discussion was um, the status quo uh, season structure allows for the flexibility to open uh, three days per week in April, May, and June, and there was support for um, looking at that as we get more into the details of setting our seasons prior to season dates prior to the November council meeting. So the flexibility is already in the cat sharing plan, but there was a discussion about utilizing that um, more and for very similar reasons as for the Puget Sound and, and getting more of the season um, early in the year and having less of it reserved for August and September. Um, for all of the Washington sub areas, uh, there's a section in here that just is uh, speaking to in-season management flexibility. This has been incredibly important to us since the pandemic. Uh, we've worked with National Marine Fisheries Service in the recent years to implement the flexible management pr provisions that are provided in the catch sharing plan. Uh, this flexibility has really yielded substantial benefits and uh, we appreciate NIMS efforts to uh, revise federal regulations in season this year and allow for additional fishing days. We'll continue to work with NIMS to identify potential changes to the catch sharing plan that would streamline NIMS's regulatory process and enhance the flexibility uh, for in season management in a way that provides sufficient notice and transparency to the public. Uh, during our stakeholder meetings, we also talked our about our halibut annual bag limit, uh, which is a four fish annual limit. It's not a provision of the cat sharing plan. Uh, stakeholders were somewhat divided on this topic with some in support, others preferring status quo and some suggesting an option where additional fish could be added to the annual limit during the late season when the quota attainment is low. 
stakeholders in support pointed to improving the ability to attain the quota, particularly in areas like the Puget Sound where the, the quota has been left unharvested in recent years. And those preferring status quo expressed concerns with returning to conditions where the early season quota is taken very quickly. Um, and that a four fish limit uh, annually allows for more access to more fishery participants. Uh, those supporting increasing the annual limit later in the season commented that the approach allows for um, a flexible approach to increasing the limit. Uh, as for next steps, uh, we ha will have another stakeholder meeting on October 4th uh, to discuss alternatives for the 2023 season and further um, and to ident identify specific recommended dates for 2023, uh, which we will we'll share with the Council in November. Um, including specific changes to the cat sharing la language uh, needed to accommodate the final recommendation. I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Heather. Are there any questions of Heather on the WDFNW report? All right, thank you very much. Um, there's an IMPS report, or Frank, do you have a question? Okay, so there is an IMPS report. I know there's, we've got to speak to it at all. If I could speak for less than two minutes, I would appreciate that. Please. Okay, so traditionally we have not spoken to that report. It's just a list of uh, uh, a report on the, the fisheries in, in 2022. However, I would like to say, uh, and it was mentioned in the, the, the state reports, that uh, we do appreciate their willingness to work with us on the in-season action. It, it has been a lot more than in past years, and it's been great to work with them, and we look forward to working, uh, continuing to work on that with the states. So I think I be my two-minute goal there. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Marcy Aramco. Just to note uh, for the record that CDFW didn't supply a report under this agenda item as we don't have any uh, proposed changes for the 2023 catch sharing plan for California sub area. Um, but just a quick note that we did uh, attain our project that we attained our quota uh, August 7th and took action in consultation with NIMS council and IPHC staff to close the fishery at that time. And we'll probably provide the council with a, a more full report of our uh, landings uh, totals um, at, in the November uh, briefing book. Thank you. Any questions on the California report? All right. Thank you. We have uh, one advisory body report, uh, the gap. I see Bob Alverson is here. So welcome, Bob. Step on up to the table. Mr. Chairman, from uh, agenda item E1A, Supplemental Gap Report 1, September 2022, Groundfish Advisory Subpanel Report on 2023 Catch Sharing Plan and Annual Regulations. The Groundfish Advisory Subpanel received an overview of the 2023 Pacific Halibut uh, sh sharing, Catch Sharing Plan from Mr. Brett Wadoff. Pacific Fishery Management Council staff during the GAP's August 25th, 2022 work session and re revisited the issue at the start of the September GAP meeting. The GAP generally agrees with the reports from Washington and Oregon under this agenda item. The states have proposed several recreational fishery change alternatives, which the GAP believes will give the public some choices and flexibility. The GAP appreciates the state's exploring changes that would allow the recreational fisheries more oper operational flexibility, but does not express a preference for any of the choices at this time. Washington recreational fishermen on the GAP noted that s several days of inclement weather in May prevented them from accessing the quotas proposed in November. Therefore, GAP members agree with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife rationale and proposal that could provide up to three days per week of halibut fishing in May for the coastal sub areas. Charter boat operators prefer more time for halibut fishing in May as most 
businesses will transition to salmon and albacore as summer approaches. Changes to the catch share plan are not necessarily to do this, but the gap supports consideration of potential flexibility this would provide to fishermen. The gap notes Washington Park and Fish and Wildlife proposes two options for changes to the Puget Sound sub area, but the gap does not have a press preference for one or the other at this time. Oregon representatives on the gap expressed interest in finding ways to optimize fishing access and opportunities, particularly earlier in the season as a means to more fully attain their quota. For example, the gap encourages Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to utilize their inshore spring and summer quotas to develop an all depth halibut season open from May 1st through October 31st. California GAP members stated that California reached its halibut quota allocation before the end of the summer fishing season in 2022. The GAP recognizes that California representatives are interested in future consideration of an allocation increase for California. That concludes our comments, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions on the GAP report? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Bob. Good to see you. Um, looking at the second to last paragraph uh, about encouraging ODFW to utilize the inshore spring and summer quotas to develop an all depth halibut season open from May 1st through October 31st. Um, I believe that's six months of full fishing. Was, was there a, a thought by the gap members that there was available quota to be able to design a season structure like that? Through the chair, uh, uh, Ms. Rensko, the, um, the gap representatives from Oregon were interested in um, opportunities for each week. It wouldn't necessarily be every day the way I interpreted the dis discussion. So, um, but they wanted a, a longer t time frame of opportunity throughout the season. Thank you, that All right, clarifies. any further, any, no follow-up? Okay, any further questions on the GAP report? All right, thanks very much, Bob. Well, Bill Anderson. Come on back, Bob, uh, sorry. Well, I, I was gonna ask you a question. Oh, you were gonna ask me a question. Well, well, I don't fish was, for well, halibut. Well, but he was still there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as we all know, Bob's been on one of the three commissioners on the halibut commission. And um, I, this isn't the exact right time and I could ask to have him come back up, but I wanted to ask if we could have him make just a couple comments about the commission's process associated with um, allocations, potential changes in allocations um, coming up in 2023 and beyond. And also if he had any information on any of the preliminary results of the set line survey. The reason I bring that up is that this is as well, Many of you know we're we're entering into a a year of potential change. Uh, you know we've enjoyed these four years of 1.65 CEY and a 1.5 or thereabouts FCEY area 2A, and that's up for renegotiation. Uh, so as we think about 2023 and our catch share plan and those kinds of things, we're we're not in as stable of an environment relative to what our quota might be as we have been. And uh, so I thought it was in, might be useful to ask Bob to comment on those things in his role as a IPHC commissioner. Well, let's see, Bob, do you have any comments on that? Uh, through the chair, um, I can make some comments on that. Um, the um, commission has a work uh, meeting next week. It's the 14th, 15th that we will get uh, raw data from the uh, the surveys. It's not always e easy to know 
Um, what those that raw data is suggesting, particularly in region two, which includes uh, 2C, 2B, and 2A, because there's offsets for dogfish and other other activity on the, on the set line survey. Um, I don't have any new information uh, from the fleet or or otherwise on on region two uh, surveys, uh, but. Um, initial reports and uh, commercial reports are down about 15 to 19 percent in 3A, which is the Kodiak district. Um, 3B is, is slightly down from last year. It was way up uh, last year. And then areas further to the west, um, the Aleutians and, uh, and the central Bering Sea are significantly down. So um, I'm throwing a dart that there will be a, a reduction in the total TCY of some level going into the uh, annual meeting. Um, with regards to allocations, the uh, commissioners on the 16th of, uh, next week have set up a time for the Canadians and uh, U.S. commissioners to have an initial discussion. Um, we had a, a preliminary discussion in August. Canadians and the U.S. commissioners would like to put together an agreement that lasts and for, goes beyond the four-year agreement we previously had. Um, so there's um, an intent to, to develop something that is, is structurally more functional for existing and future commissioners and for the public to understand when they come into the meeting what uh, the allocations are and, and the structure will be at uh, perhaps different levels of TEC, EY. Um, John Curlin just came on in the spring for uh, NIMPS. Uh, he's the director of National Marine Fisheries Service in Juneau. And um, so we were probably set back a little bit uh, catching everybody up on information with the, the new people involved there. I think uh, John has an intent to, to have um, um, meetings between um, next week and mid-October with uh, two, two A in general and with the tribes. Uh, we owe the tribes a, a consultation uh, a discussion um, based on their treaty. And uh, we have an October um, discussion point um, with the Canadians. And then our interim meeting will be the last three days of November. And the 29th or the 30th is set for another discussion for allocations uh, of the allocation discussion with Canada. Um, and then if need be, we have uh, some December time and January time frame set up if we can't come uh, to closure by uh, November. So that's kind of an update. Um, I encourage the um, tribes and um, um, and the 2A participants uh, to be as uh, involved as they have been in the past. I think that's been very helpful to their cause. Uh, up until this point, uh, I think uh, the 2A agreement, I think it's 1.6 something million, I can't remember, 6.5, um, um, has been kind of uh, baked into the, the discussions we've had with the Canadians for the last uh, year coming up to this point. So I think that's a have an inside track on that, but when uh, harvest levels start to decline, things kind of go south for everybody at times. So just we may have to play defense from two ways position. So those are my comments, Mr. Chairman, and uh, probably have more to say after next week. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Bob. All right. We have no public comment, so this will take us to our council action, which is uh, to which is up on the screen there to adopt for public review. So uh, I know that uh, there may be a motion or two ready, but let's see if there is any discussion before we get into any motions. Heather Hall. Thank you, Chair Groundlick. I I just want to start out by saying, um, and this was. I think captured a bit in our, our WDFW report, but um, since the pandemic, our, our recreational fishery has not looked the same. We've, we've really relied on this in-season flexibility, um, but 
but going back before the pandemic, um, we had fisheries that lasted three days or four days. It was incredible how quickly we went through our allocation. So the discussions with our stakeholders have been different and, and fun, but a lot of that is due to um, we've had port closures and some ports that have had a lot of fishing effort um, following the pandemic. This year, we were surprised with this incredibly um, poor weather that was just ongoing um, and high fuel prices. And so just want to um, say that that's a lot of how we're looking at um, our next, our, our changes for 2023, not wanting to make huge changes, um, look at this flexibility, but also wait for some stability to come back or see how things have really changed. And so that's just a bit of overarching um, of, of where we are. But I would say the past few years have not seemed normal for our fishery. And um, I'll leave room for other discussion, but I do have a motion when the time's right. All right, thank you, Heather. Is there further discussion? Well, I'm not seeing any hands. So um, Heather, if you have a motion, please uh, feel free to offer it. All right. I think Sandra has got it and can. I move that the council adopt the proposed season structure alternatives and changes to the cat sharing plan as described in agenda item E1, supplemental WDFW report one for public review. All right, thank you, Heather. And the language on the screen is accurate and complete. Yes, it is. I'll look, look for a second. Seconded by Phil Anderson. Please speak to your motion. Thank you. I, I think I've covered most of it. Uh, this is range of alternatives. I think we've got a good um, base of, of alternatives out there for our meeting in October and enough to um, bring back with recommended season dates for the next council meeting in November. All right, thank you, Heather. Are there any questions for Heather on the motion? I'm not seeing any hands, so we'll call the question. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you for the motion. Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have another motion. Please. So, I'll wait. I move the council adopt for public review the changes to the Pacific Halibut catch sharing plan for 2023 proposed in E1A ODFW report one. All right, uh, thank you for that. Is the language on the screen accurate and complete? It is. And I'll look for a second. Seconded by Heather Hall. Uh, please speak to your motion. Thank you very much. I provided the rationale regarding these changes in the ODFW report, and I will just again note that most of these proposed alternatives are intended to provide some increased opportunity and or flexibility for the recreational halibut anglers in Oregon, and we look forward to further review and feedback on these proposals in preparation for council decision in November. All right, thank you. Are there any questions for the maker of the motion? Not seeing any hands, I'll call the question. All those in favor, pardon me, Marcy, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, no questions, just um, a point to say I support the motion, I support the report, I support uh, putting these alternatives out for public review. I'm interested in hearing uh, from the public on the alternatives, particularly on the bag limit proposal. Um, we had a brief exchange there. I, I, I I guess I'm interested in hearing the thinking about um, an alternative that begins a season with a two fish bag limit. I, I had understood at least in the recent past, the use of uh, increasing a bag limit to two fish um, as an in-season flexible mechanism that allowed for 
um, better attainment of uh, the various allocations. So um, that's kind of how I've always seen that um, that tool um, certainly support its use for that purpose, but just um, curious about um, the thinking behind starting a season with the bag limit that high. Thank you. Jessica. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Marcy. Um, in our public meetings, we definitely heard from anglers now uh, the interest in having more opportunities early on in the season rather than later due to inclement weather and other things going on. So that is the rationale behind that of the two bag limit is to increase the opportunity and flexibility to allow for that allocation with the understanding that it may then be used up earlier. Any further discussion on the motion? All right, now I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. <clears throat> Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Jessica, for the motion. Let me see around the table if there is any further motions to be offered or any further discussion. Uh, not seeing any hands, I'll turn to Robin and see how we're doing on this agenda item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We've had good discussions and we have the proposed changes from both Oregon and Washington and the council has adopted those for public review. So I think you've covered everything under this agenda item. All right, we're not gonna miss a beat here. We're gonna go right into E2, uh, which is the commercial side of things. And uh, Robin, please give us uh, an overview. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is agenda item E2, the commercial directed fishery regulations for 2023. So similar to what we do for uh, the catch sharing plan and the sport fisheries, we are doing the same for the directed commercial fishery. Uh, we'll uh, make proposed regulation changes here in September and return in November uh, to make final recommendations. Uh, this year uh, would be the first year that the council would be making recommendations for change to NEMPS rather than IPHC. Um, as you all are aware, we're going through the management tra transfer process and it is near complete. Um, so under this agenda item, again, the council would adopt for public review the proposed season structure for 2023. And we have a report from NIMPS on the status of the management authority transfer. Uh, that is NIMPS report one. Um, I don't think they're necessarily going to speak to it, but obviously they can if they like. Um, and we also have a report from the GAP and the enforcement consultants. Um, right now, it doesn't look like anybody signed up for public comment. And again, uh, the council's action is to adopt proposed regulations uh, for 2023 uh, changes for uh, public review. And that concludes my overview. Okay, thank you, Robin. We had the stealth passing of the baton here while you're giving that update. So um, uh, with that, is there questions for Robin on her overview? Okay, and not seeing any, we'll uh, go to the National Fisheries Service and uh, Frank Lockhart. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I won't speak in detail to uh, the report, which is basically just the uh, proposed rule. Um, just will say that uh, the proposed rule was out. There was a comment period. We received one comment and um, comment period is now closed. Right now we anticipate going through the process of reviewing the comment. And we do believe that we will have uh, a final decision on a final rule um, this fall. So um, uh, if there's any questions, uh, we can probably answer that. <laughs> but I'll just leave it there. Okay, thank you, Frank. Questions for Frank on his uh, on the NIMS report? Um, Jessica? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Frank. I have some specific questions for the regulations, um, specifically with regards to um, the deadlines and for the application deadlines for the commercial fisheries um, are stated to be 15 days to two months earlier than have been in place for many years for licensing with IPHC. 
So I was just curious if NIMS can give us some indication on um, how you see these deadlines rolling out information to um, participants on changes in these deadlines. Well, we will uh, do anything we can, hopefully, in working through the council process. You know, we, we will, uh, in, in the best of all worlds, we'll have um, a final rule out. Uh, I must admit I don't have the dates of the November council meeting in my head, but I believe if, if we're lucky, we'll be out before then. If And uh, we would, uh, we have several um, listserv out there for, for groundfish and, and uh, we also have several great people like Bob that we can work through uh, uh, to get the word out. We will use any and all of the options available to us. And in particular, would hope that, that we would work with the states and your outreach um, uh, method, methodology to get that out there uh, as well. Uh, in addition, we have talked to IPHC. They obviously have a process that they have used to get out their um, uh, deadlines. And so we, we have already talked to them and they're willing to provide their, their contact lists for us as well. So, but if you have any suggested additional things for us to do, we're very open to that. And I open that to other council members as well. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Jessica, further questions for Frank? Okay. Uh, with that, uh, thank you, Frank. We'll go to the uh, GAB report and uh, Harrison Heibach. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll be reading the Supplemental GAP Report 1, Agenda Item E2A. Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel Report on Commercial Directed Fishery Regulations for 2023. The GAP received an overview of this agenda item from Mr. Brett Weedoff, Pacific Fishery Management Council Staff Officer, and reviewed the documents under this agenda item. Similar to our September 2021 GAP Report, number one, Regarding the directed commercial fishery, the GAP appreciates the effort as noted in the situation summary to maintain the general season structure with season openings and vessel limits consistent with the International Pacific Halibut Commission, develop protocols for the non-tribal directed commercial fishery as the management transfer from IPHC to the National Marine Fisheries Service progresses. The GAP acknowledges Difficulties surrounding two-week separation between season openers exist. However, it is important to note that fishermen and buyers have become accustomed to this schedule over many years, and it is vital to the success of the fishery that the period between openers remain as short as possible. The gap remains ready to work with the council and other advisory bodies to find creative solutions to this issue. To be clear, participants in the directed commercial fishery appreciate the three-day openers that run from 8 a.m. Tuesday to 6 p.m. Thursday. This provides fishermen the ability to get ice on Monday and affords them flexibility to sell halibut directly to the public over the weekend. The three-day openings also improve the safety for fishermen by providing a day or two of flexibility to account for weather changes. Adhering to this structure will continue to provide economic benefit to fishermen and coastal communities while maintaining a higher level of safety. Okay, thank you, Harrison. Questions uh, for the gap, uh, Frank? Um, I'm just wondering if if uh, you could expand, what is it about the two week separation that is important? What, what did the discussion reveal? Why is that so important? Well, getting the season, oh, through Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Frank. Um, with this fishery, there's a lot of work that really goes into this fishery. So starting in May is very helpful. Um, fish tend to, roughly the fish tend to be there uh, in May and getting started in May is also encouraging before, uh, if, if there's too many seasons, if it extends too farther in, a lot of fishermen wanna switch over to salmon fishery and also tuna albacore. So trying to keep them at those two week intervals is ideal. We don't want them any sooner than two weeks because of how much work and effort goes into getting the gear ready. Um, 
but two weeks seems to be pretty ideal. And that's mainly the reason. Okay, thank you, Frank. Uh, further questions for uh, the gap? Okay, thank you, Harrison. Next up would be the um, EC report and uh, Greg Bush. Greg? Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair. This is uh, Greg Bush with the enforcement consultants. I'll be reading agenda item E2A, supplemental EC report one. Enforcement consultants report on commercial directed fisheries regulations for 2023. Enforcement consultants have reviewed the material associated with agenda item E2, commercial directed fishery regulations for 2023, and had the following comments. Regarding E2A, Supplemental NIMS Report 1, the EC appreciates the initial regulations National Marine Fisheries Service published concerning the management of the Pacific halibut fishery, including the provisions on permitting and documentation of vessel length. The EC remains concerned with enforcement's long-term ability to effectively enforce the series of three-day fisheries due to resource constraints. I would believe our efforts through the use of pulse operations and spot checks have been adequate to date to promote a high level of compliance in the fishery as documented in our 2021 IPHC enforcement report. The EC has identified an issue related to the gear included in the fishing definition used in Pacific halibut fisheries regulations in 50 CFR 300.61 that may cause confusion. The EC recommends that within 50 CFR 300.61, hook and line gear be used in place of set line gear um, hook and line gear is currently defined within West Coast Ground Fish Regulations 50 CFR 660.11 and is listed as an authorized commercial gear for the Pacific Halibut Fisheries within 50 CFR 600.725. Note authorized recreational gear is listed as hook and line and spear. Set line gear is only defined within the Pacific Halibut Fisheries Regulations. The EC continues to recommend consideration for the following. Vessel monitoring system, EC recommends adding a requirement for vessels participating in any non-tribal commercial halibut sector to carry VMS. This will greatly facilitate enforcement, particularly when operating near ground fish conservation areas. Logbooks, the EC recommends removing the logbook exemption for incidental Pacific halibut fishing during the commercial salmon troll fishery. 72 hour pre-season closure and hold inspection, EC recommends retaining the 72 hour pre-season closure and hold inspections, and seabird avoidance. The EC recommends seabird avoidance gear be required when participating in the non-tribal directed commercial area 2A halibut fishery, regardless of whether a vessel retains ground fish or not. This concludes the EC statement. Okay, thank you, Greg. Uh, questions on the EC report? Okay, not seeing any. Oh, sorry. Uh, Marcy Yurimko. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, EC, for your report and for reminding us of a few of the topics of interest with regard to uh, additional management uh, of the directed commercial fishery. Um, so I appreciate the bullet list at the end of the report. My, my question is actually for National Marine Fishery Service, maybe more so than the EC, and I guess I'm just hoping maybe you might elaborate for us on the potential um, now that um, we're moving forward with rulemaking and permitting and um, NIMS oversight of the fishery, um, at what point you might uh, consider um, the council adding um, one or more of these items to our workload uh, and agenda planning for future meetings. I'm just wondering if, you know, what the bandwidth is, what the, what the potential is for um, putting these on, say the year to glance. Um, thank you for the question. Um, and, you know, uh, also I appreciate, you know, when we started down the road of switching from IPHC to NIMS management of the directed fishery, you know, we had, the desire to make as few changes as possible up, up front, you know, and I think we've we've done a pretty good job of that. Um, but we did acknowledge that there might be changes after that. So I think next year we do anticipate 
um, well, for lack of a better term, growing pains that we will, that staff will need to kind of deal with, uh, you know, some of potentially some of the, as you mentioned, the permitting issues and also in season management and also um, uh, uh, dealing with the, the data in a timely manner and things like that. So, um, you know, I don't, I think it depends on potentially how much work is involved with any of these these items, so um, I, 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 you know, I, I guess I, I would hesitate to require the same staff that are putting in this new system in place to be uh, involved heavily in developing these new things. So I think you know. Uh, sometime after the the season so maybe next uh, fall we're starting it up i mean if uh, i feel a little i haven't had a chance to talk with staff about this but i would say no earlier than next fall uh, if we're to answer right now thank you i was i was just looking for a spitball answer and that's what we got so appreciate it very good thank you marcy Okay, any other questions? Uh, well, we have um, Greg on the line. Uh, Heather? Thank you, Vice Chair. I, I don't know when the right time for this question is too, but it does um, have to do with the EC report and just their recommend, recommended change to 50 CFR 300.61 and uh, whether or not uh, a motion to that um, would be helpful, or do you see any problems with that, or is there a better way to address their um, recommendation here? Maybe a little bit of help on that. I don't want to go down the wrong path. I, um, I guess what we have not had a chance to talk with our enforcement consultants about this and uh, on the specifics, and and I think you know um, a motion or our guidance from the council perhaps asking us to look into it and report back in November, I think would be a good first step. Uh, and we would be happy to do that. Um, and so I guess that would be my, my preference right now. Thank you, Heather. Okay. Um, questions for the EC. All right. Thank you, Greg. Um, and with that, I believe that takes us to public comment. And I don't think we had any cards earlier. And I'm getting the, the negative on any cards being there now. So that will take us to council action. And so uh, open the floor for council discussion. So, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, you know, we undertook this, um, I don't know how many years ago, but three, I think, or so, at the urging of the Halibut Commission. This isn't something we sought necessarily to do. Um, they've been, the Halibut Commission had been doing it for a long time, and and um, they um, had, I guess I would say they um, had a bit of a change in their focus and their mission and their direction as it relates to managing our directed fishery. So I know it's been a lot of work, uh, particularly for National Marine Fisheries Service to, to get us to this point and just appreciate uh, all the work that did go into it to get us here. Um, I, I am very, um, mindful of what the EC is telling us in their report about the difficulty of, you know, given the resources that they have and the way the fishery is conducted uh, and, and the difficulty they are expressing to us about enforcing a series of three-day fisheries um, due to some of those constraints. And um, in Coupled with that, as we all know, they've made some recommendations to us uh, that would help them. And um, while I am appreciative of the workload associated with those, 
maybe in particular, maybe if you took tried to take them all at once. Uh, there are a couple of those that seem to me to be uh, particularly important based on what they're telling us about their ability to enforce the regulations associated with this fishery. So, um, number one, the, the, the change that they're recommending on the definition um, of hook and line gear be used in place of set line gear if you need direction to or guidance from this council, Frank, to, to look into that. I'm s suggesting that we do just that, ask you to do that. Um, I would also appreciate um, the enforcement consultants if there are in this list of four bullets, if there are higher, if there, if there are higher priorities associated with their ability to enforce the regs with one or the other of those four, if there's some sort of put in those in priority, maybe give us a sense of what those priorities might are when, when in your next report, uh, presumably in November, so that um, given the, you know, the workload that's associated with doing one or more of those is an issue that we prioritize the ones that make the biggest difference, make their job uh, not the easiest, but to be the most effective in enforcing the reg. So I would make that request of the enforcement consultants to, to uh, if they do have any priorities over those four, to let us know what they are so uh, we can build that into our thinking. So those are my comments. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Phil. Further discussion? Jessica? Thank you. I think I just want to say that we heard from the gap the importance of that two week notification in reference to additional openings. And I would say ODFW has similar concerns of the proposed rule language of as soon as practical, practicable in regards to announcing those additional openings. So I would encourage NIMS to maintain the current notification process given the stated importance to the fishermen and the ports and buyers. Thank you, Jessica. Anyone else? Motion? Heather Hall. Bless her. Thank you. Sandra, do you have the motion? Okay, thank you. I move that there are no changes to the directed halibut fishery structure for 2023. That is the 2023 season would be a series of three day openings beginning at 8 a.m. on the fourth Tuesday in June, ending at 6 p.m. on the Thursday that week. Additional three day openings would occur every other week Tuesday through Thursday until the directed fishery allocation is obtained. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Heather. Is the language on the screen accurate? Yes, it is. Okay. Second. Seconded by Jessica Watson. Thank you, Jessica. Please speak to your motion. Yes, we uh, didn't hear any changes proposed uh, for public review to the structure for the directed halibut season. This just acknowledges uh, what that status quo season would be. Uh, I know a couple of years ago, we worked with directed fishery participants to come up with this, this structure and it's, it's been working as we heard from the gap. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Discussion on the motion. Okay, um, then I'll call for the question. All, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passed unanimously. Okay. So, Robin, I'll look to you as far as how we're doing. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I think we have completed our work under agenda item E2. We have a proposed season structure for the upcoming year of 2023. And yeah, I think you did it. We can check off that box. Okay, very good. And uh, I think with that, I'm gonna pass the gavel back to Chair Grolick. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. Uh, excellent job on that agenda item. We were behind schedule and now we're about three or four minutes ahead of schedule. So that's well done. So that concludes our business for the day. But before we break, I'll turn to Executive Director Merrick Burden for any announcements. I know there's at least one. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'll also commend your good effort uh, this afternoon and uh, getting back on schedule. Uh, very good work today. Uh, this evening, we do have the chairman's reception beginning at 530 directly out. I'm all turned around. Where am I? Out that way. Um, before you get to the pool, that area, uh, beginning at 530. Uh, that's the end of my announcement, Mr. Chairman. All right. Well, I um, look forward to seeing all of you at the reception and then again tomorrow bright and early. Have a good evening. <laughs>